Section 1 of Sunbeams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sunbeams by George W. Peck. The Dude and His Pajamas. As much as people talk about the dude and laugh at him and make fun of him, all must admit that we adopt fashions that he introduces after it has been demonstrated that they are a good thing. He is the pioneer in new fashions, and he stands the brunt of the battle of getting them before the public, and takes his medicine without a wry face, contented, apparently, at being the one who has been on the advance firing line. He successfully pioneered the tan shoe to popularity, the golf stockings, and short trousers, until many who laughed at him have adopted them and swear that they are all right. He has had more trouble in introducing pajamas than anything he has ever undertaken, but he is gradually getting there on pajamas, and to the observing man it is evident that the old-fashioned nightshirt has about reached its end. Pajamas consist of a light pair of loose trousers and a loose jacket that may be put on like a coat, instead of being put on over the head like a nightshirt, thus humiliating a man terribly. If the pajama had been introduced by the President of the United States, it would soon have become popular, but the President cannot be depended upon to introduce new fashions. The dude was the first to wear pajamas and he was made the butt of jokes, until one night there was a railroad accident, and all the passengers in a Pullman car had to turn out in a field in their night clothes. Every last man with an old-fashioned nightshirt wished that he were dead when he tumbled out of the car, the tail of his nightshirt dragging on the ground and catching on the rail fence he had to climb over, and he was a sight while the dude in his pajamas stepped down to the ground, almost dressed for a party, lit a cigarette, and offered to help the ladies as unconcerned as possible, while the nightshirt gentlemen were hiding against haystacks and fence corners for fear the ladies would see them. That was the first object lesson of the benefit of pajamas, and since that time there have been many others, until the pajama has friends in all walks of life, and men are wearing them who formerly scoffed at them. Who it was that invented the long nightshirt for men will probably never be known, but if he is ever identified it will go hard with him. Cases are frequent where a man is placed at a great disadvantage in a nightshirt, but where he would be perfectly at home in pajamas and able to assert himself. When burglars get in a house, the man in the nightshirt though we have a revolver in his hand, is handicapped, because burglars will laugh at him, and knowing that he cuts a sorry figure, he loses his nerve and gets behind something to hide his nightdress. Men have been known to prowl around the house with a nightshirt and a revolver when burglars were due, and frighten the women of the household into fits, besides amusing the burglars whereas if they had pajamas on, they could go anywhere in the house and be respected, and have nerve enough to drive the burglars away, and become heroes in the eyes of those of the family he had saved from robbery, and perhaps worse. Another place where the man in the nightshirt does not look his best is when a fire breaks out, and he has to crawl out a window and go down a ladder with the fireman, or slide down a post of the veranda. He would almost prefer to burn to death and be done with it than face a crowd that is always present at a fire and try to climb down anything in a nightshirt, knowing that it is dead sure to catch onto something and display his limbs to a scared crowd and make himself the laughing stock of the populace. There comes a time in the life of every man of the house when he has to get up in the night and go down to the kitchen and let the cat that has been howling as though in agonies out the kitchen door to meet an engagement and fill a date with neighboring cats that have sounded the alarm on the back fence. A man loses respect even for himself when he walks down the back stairs in his bare feet and nightshirt, 
sends the dustpan rolling downstairs ahead of him, steps on a lump of chestnut coal on the floor, and hops on one foot to the door and kicks the cat out into the night. He feels that the cat, standing there in the kitchen with her back up, is frightened at his bare legs with long hair sticking out coldly from the goose pimples, and his nightshirt blowing out behind when the door opens, and he feels that with pajamas he would present a better appearance even to a feline walking delegate. The pajama will save a man from dishonor in case of fire, save his self-respect, and keep the fireman from laughing when he comes down the ladder in a garment never intended to appear in public, or on the rostrum, or the fire ladder. No man of a sensitive nature ought longer to cling to that delusion, the old-fashioned nightshirt, which will never stay buttoned in a crisis or stay down when it ought to by all the laws of nature. So the sun hails the dude and the pajama and thanks him in behalf of men who know a good thing when they see it. THE BOERS AND THE FILIPINOS When the British run up against the Boers in the Transvaal, it will not be much such a war as that we are having in the Philippines. We are fighting a lot of Negroes who do not know any more about firing a gun than a woman does about throwing a stone. They see our troops moving, and they have one gun to about three or four Negroes, and the first one takes the gun, points it toward where the Yankees are, shuts his eyes, and pulls. There is an earthquake, the bullet goes off somewhere in the country, the man behind the gun is kicked end over end and knocked senseless, and after pouring water on him, the others shake the dice to see which one has the next shot, and the one who throws double sixes loads up the gun and has his inning and gets his kick and rolls over in the grass while the bullet goes off toward Australia and the Yankees keep on coming. Then the third fellow tries his hand, perhaps resting the gun across the bodies of his companions. He pulls and has his jaw kicked around the back of his neck, and there they are. They act like boys going out with a gun, plugging woodpeckers and quarreling as to whose turn it is to shoot, until the woodpecker gets disgusted and goes in his hole to raise a family of young woodpeckers. The first fellow that was knocked silly finally comes to, and he shoots the gun, holding the butt against his stomach to save his jaw and shoulder, and his stomach is knocked so flat that it will not hold a kernel of rice unless it is soaked in bilge water, but his bullet accidentally hits a soldier and that raises a row. The Yankees have got near enough to fight, and they kill a lot of these amateur soldiers, and finally give a yell and charge them. When one fellow takes the gun and runs for tall timber, another carries the dice box, and a third carries the cartridges, and the chances are the Yankees will pot the whole lot of them and capture the gun. But the British have got a different proposition when they go against Kruger. It will be like fighting a German Schutzenfest, where every man can hit a bullseye, or he has to explain why he missed it. Boys ten years old are good shots, and if any boer can shoot better than another, they all get mad at themselves and practice at a mark until they can tie the champion, if not beat him. Almost every man has whiskers like a brush fence to hide behind, and they can shoot as well lying down and resting the gun between their toes as any old way. They don't bunch up so the enemy can take a pot shot at them with a gatling gun, but they scatter and hide behind something, and don't hurry about shooting, but wait until they have drawn a bead on the white forehead of the enemy, and then hold on and smoke smokeless tobacco until the wind gauge shows that all signs are right when they pull, and there is a sure enough funeral on the other side. Every man has his cartridges counted out to him, and if he does not show a corpse for every empty shell, he has to have an argument with Kruger, and explain to the old man why he can't learn to shoot straight, and maybe he is arrested for treason. It is almost treason for a boar to miss when he shoots at anything. The crowd would ostracize a man quicker for missing a man in battle than for stealing a cow, 
and the only cases of suicide are caused by a man failing continually to hit what he shoots at. A 200-pound boar with whiskers like a bale of hay can lay down behind a wooden shoe and hide himself so completely that an enemy will not see him, and all the time he will be sending soft-nosed bullets where they will do the most harm. They can carry a piece of dried beef or summer sausage in their vest pocket to feed them a week, and can climb up the side of a mountain like a goat, and as for sleeping, they drop right down anywhere and never snore at a mark, and never take cold, and never have a doctor. They don't need any wagon to carry food or camp equipage, and can fight on the run or any old way. The Boers do not size up with other soldiers on drill, and couldn't form a line for dress parade without having a chalk mark on the ground, and they never have learned any of the intricate movements, and officers do not shout commands in stentorian voices. When they get into camp, an officer says, Well, boys, go and eat yourselves. When it is time to turn in, no bugle sounds taps, but somebody begins to pull off his boots, and that is the signal to retire. In the morning, daylight wakes them up, and when the boots are on, they are ready. When they are placed in position to fight, there are no orders to charge, but an officer says, Now you can shoot, if you see ahead already, and the slaughter begins. Oh, the Boers are no Filipinos, but a regular Schutzenfest. The Soldier with Iron Spoon and Branding Iron There is liable to be some litigation after the Filipino War is over, in which the United States will be sued for damages, and international complications may arise that will cost our government a good deal of money. It is all an account of the company cook of a Colorado regiment, a man named Smith. His company was on the firing line, and it was the cook's duty to take dinner out to the boys. He got a couple of camp kettles of baked beans red-hot off the fire and went wading out to the front and finally arrived on dry ground behind the soldiers who were engaged in firing on the Negroes. The cook didn't want his beans to get cold while waiting for the skirmish to be over, so he found a fire that was being used to heat a branding iron to brand some mules, and he put his kettles over the fire and watched the skirmish. He was unarmed and was not expected to fight, but when he saw the little negroes making so much trouble for his company, he was mad and cried to borrow a gun, but could not get one. An officer said they were going to charge the trenches pretty soon, and then after driving the negroes away, they would come back to dinner. The idea of a charge was too much for the cook, an old regular army man, and he was nervous. Finally, the Colorado boys, who had been lying down and firing, raised up and gave a yell and started for the trenches. This was too much for the cook. He seized the iron spoon out of the red-hot beans in one hand, and the red-hot branding iron out of the fire in the other, and away he went toward the trenches. Being a good runner, he passed the soldiers, and before he knew it, he was right in the midst of the scared, running, bare-legged negroes, and when they saw him, they were paralyzed with fear and superstition. He would rush up behind a Filipino, hit him on the back of the head with the iron spoon covered with beans, and when he went down, the cook would take the branding iron and brand an unmistakable U.S. on the broadest part of the person of the black man and rush for another. When one was branded, he would think it was all over with him, and he would lay there on the ground and say his, Now I lay me, in Spanish, or yell bloody murder and place his hand back of him where the branding iron had wounded him, or else he would run faster and get into the jungle. Five of them were captured with a U.S. branded on them, so it will never disappear, and it is said at least a dozen got away with the same marks on them. When the charge was over, the cook went back to his kettles of beans as though nothing unusual had happened, pounded the spoon on a tin pan, and the boys returned, winded from their long run, but hungry and happy, and as the cook dished out the beans on tin plates, the boys laughed at the iron spoon episode. Several of the prisoners were brought up to take dinner with the boys, 
but it was noticed that some of them would not sit down in the mud and be sociable, and investigation showed that all those who would not sit down were branded, and by all rules of civilized warfare belonged to the United States. They were told the brand on them was a badge of honor, that only brave soldiers were entitled to, and that all brave American soldiers were so branded. When told this, the little Filipinos, who had tried to cover up the brands with their breech clouts, were so proud of the marks that they showed them to everybody. Now, when they come to find out the true state of things, they will no doubt begin action in the courts against the government for damages, and charge that such warfare is uncivilized. Some day, when we get Filipino congressmen at Washington, the Turkish bath or the swimming tank may reveal the fact that our statesmen from the Far East are wearing evidences of belonging to the United States, sure enough. It is possible that our soldiers will be armed with branding irons in the future. The Colorado Company cook is proud of his work, and he says he will go into a charge at the drop of the hat if he has nothing but an umbrella to fight with. End of section one. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Section two of Sunbeams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sunbeams by George W. Peck. Admiral, is my hat on straight? Admiral Dewey, in relinquishing the command of the Asiatic Squadron, and in fact the whole navy of his country, and taking command of a smack, or letting a smack take command of him, to speak more truthfully, comes down from the hero to the common everyday man. From this out he cannot shout orders through a megaphone and see those orders executed by bustling, hustling crews, but he has got to say, Will you please do so-and-so? No more can he have a list of things prepared and tell a quartermaster to go and buy them and pay for them out of the war chest. He has got to go and see the woman buy them, and he has got to draw his weasel skin like any other man and watch that he gets the right change back. A week ago he was owned by the nation, body and soul, and any man would have laid down his life for the hero. Today he is owned and controlled, and receives his orders, from a sweet little woman not bigger than a pint of cider, and he likes it better. Three weeks ago, in New York, he rode through the streets, and all the world looked on with admiration, and looked upon him with awe. Yesterday he went shopping with the dear little woman, carried bundles of things he couldn't tell the names of, and while his owner was looking at things that he was not allowed to see until she wore them at her wedding, in the department of the store that men are not allowed to enter unless blindfolded. He sat upon a revolving stool, with sweet laughing girls behind the counters, all around him commenting on what the little old man with the twinkling eyes was waiting for. He walked up and down the store like a floor walker, instead of like an admiral walking the quarter-deck of the victorious Olympia. And when the little woman came out of the sanctum of fluffy underwear, with a union suit of ribbed silk under her arm, he said, Let me carry it, dear. And when it was handed him, he took hold of it by the ankle, with his thumb and finger, just like a man, and the legs and body spread out all over the floor. Everybody blushed, and she said, Oh, how awkward all you men are! Something even the German Admiral Diedrich would not have dared to say to him without danger of being blown out of the water. The change has come to the admiral, and now he will cease to study the geography of the Philippine archipelago, and will begin the study of names of articles of women's wearing apparel. He can no longer touch a button and cause a ship to go to the right or to the left, to port or to starboard, but he will have to get acquainted with the location of hooks and eyes, and he will find that the dressmakers put them on in the most unexpected places. When he was on earth before, hooks and eyes came in flocks, either up and down in front, or down and up in the back. But now they are away over on the shoulder, or underneath the arms, 
and it will take a range finder to locate them and get them hooked up right or unhooked as the case may be. Instead of looking into the distance to see if the black smoke comes from a friendly ship or an enemy, he must look only for the little craft that smiles and shows the beautiful teeth and asks if her hat is on straight, and he has got to decide that hat question at a glance, and not stop to survey the surroundings and figure it out with a slate and pencil. Dewey will find that responsibilities of housekeeping will multiply, and before he has discharged a kicking cook or an inebriated coachman, many times he will wish he was back on his ship. When the wedding comes, he will have more trouble than he ever dreamed of, for he is sure to step on the train and tear the lace with his old sea legs unaccustomed to the land, and he will leave the ring in his other vest, and when they begin to throw rice and old shoes, he will use language, poor fellow. How mad he will be when he gets to Boston or wherever he goes on his wedding trip to find that the sailors and ushers and best men have painted his trunk white and put ribbons all over it, and he thought nobody would know he was on his wedding trip. And when all is over, and he brings the bride back to the new home, and that Japanese dog barks a welcome to him, and growls at the woman he has brought back to share his love with the dog, he must not be surprised if a number two shoe with a patent leather toe kicks that dog on the crupper bone and telescopes the animal up short, for women do not like dogs any too well with fleas on them. But our hero has got to get used to these things that he has been a stranger to so long, and he must act brave when burglars get into the house, though he may be scared out of his boots. All Dewey has got to do is to be patient and let nature take its course. He must not be admiral too much at first, but be contented just to be first mate, and if he behaves well and learns his lessons of matrimony early, this Ohio girl will surely promote him to the lofty and sublime position of good husband, which is a tide in civil life equal to that of admiral in the navy, though the salary and perquisites are not so large, and he can't sail around alone so much without a consort. Gave the Prisoner Rope Some years ago, a newspaper man was appointed chief of police in an inland city. He didn't know anything about the police business, but felt that he could arrest a small man who was very drunk, if occasion should demand, and as the salary was pretty good, he accepted the office. The first evening, as he sat in the little police office, talking with one of his assistants, a drunken prisoner was brought in, struggling and kicking and threatening to kill the whole police force, and when he was put in a cell, he said he would commit suicide before morning. The other policeman told the new chief that the prisoner would have to be watched all night or he would kill himself. They said he was a regular customer, being drunk every week or so, and that several times he had torn up the bedclothes and fixed for hanging himself, and once or twice had to be cut down after he had become almost insensible, and they had to give him whiskey to bring him to. They said some thought he played his suicide act on them just to get sympathy and whiskey, but that it had been the custom to have a man sit up and watch the prisoner to save his life, and to save the bedclothes. The new chief knew the drunken fellow as a loafer, and didn't believe he had sand enough to kill himself, and for a little while he thought of some plan that might cure the fellow of drinking, and of the especially bad habit of trying to kill himself. The chief went to a store and bought about eight feet of rope and a staple. He went down into the cell room and asked the man if he was going to kill himself that night, and he said he was. Then the chief went in the cell drove the staple in the beam above, made a slip noose in the rope, and fastened the other end to the staple. "'What are you doing, chief?' said the prisoner, as he sat on his bunk and watched the preparations. "'I'll tell you what I am doing,' said the editor-chief. "'You have destroyed sheets and blankets enough in this jail trying to commit suicide, and it must be trying on your nerves to fail so often. Sheets and blankets do not make a very good rope anyway. Now, under this police department, we are going to study to please our customers, and I am told you are one of our regulars. 
I shall remove the sheets and blankets and provide you with a rope, with a noose in it, that I will warrant will choke the daylights out of you in a holy minute. All you have got to do is to get on the chair, put your head in the noose, kick the chair out from under you, and there you are, ready to croak. See? Now, if one of these policemen disturbs you, or cuts you down and spoils that rope, I will discharge him. I will now put out the lights and leave you here. If you want a minister, say so. This cell will not be open till tomorrow morning, and nobody will come within hearing distance of you, but tomorrow morning I will have a twelve-shilling coffin here and a man to plant you. Who do you want to have your valuables? Now good night, and may you have a pleasant evening. And the chief went out of the cell, leaving a very sober drunkard sitting on his bunk thinking and looking at the noose. The next morning the chief went downstairs and yelled back to bring that coffin down in front of cell three, when a voice came from the cell saying, Chief, I ain't dead. Never mind the coffin. The chief looked into the cell, which was beginning to be light a little, saw a white face at the grated door, and the noose still unused. Why didn't you hang yourself as you promised? You could be arrested for that. Ah, you were too dumbed kind said the prisoner. The only thing I was afraid of was that if I went to sleep, that blamed noose would get over my head without any help. Chief, I didn't sleep a wink all night, and I have made a fool of myself for ten years, and I will never drink another drop as long as I live. The man quit drinking, and is a successful businessman today. So, give him rope. THE TRUST AND THE DRUMMER the organization of trusts has thrown thousands of traveling men out of employment. When a trust is formed, it calls in the traveling men and discharges them, and notifies the trade that goods are being sold at such a price, and if they want any, they better get in the order mighty quick and send the cash. Traveling men who have spent the greater part of their business lives building up trade for a concern and who, a few years ago, were looking forward to being partners in the business, go to their old employers and ask to be retained, and the old employer is sorry, but his hands are tied, as the business is now owned by Eastern or European Capital, with headquarters in New Jersey, and he is mighty lucky if they let him stay, to say nothing of his old boys that were so jolly and happy for years when they were building up the business. There is more grief today among the old traveling men that the people used to love to see strike a town than anywhere outside a tornado-stricken city. They are paralyzed to think that by a stroke of a pen in the hand of a man in the East that their livelihood and their whole future can be taken from them. The men who are left on the road are not happy at all, and do not act natural, as they fear the next letter they get from the house will contain an order to come home. The hotels all over the country that for a quarter of a century have lived by the aid of the old travelers who hardly had any other home than hotels are failing and look empty and forlorn. And for what is all this misery? It is that a few men with money to burn shall control every business in the country and make more money. It is that promoters of trusts shall get rich and that foreign capital shall own the ground walked on the machine that works in the factory, the transportation that moves the product, and the soul of the man who used to sell it, and the consumer who consumes it at a mighty high price. There is a danger in this trust business that few appreciate. It will simply ruin the country if persisted in, and make paupers of nine men that the tenth man, whom nobody knows, may be too rich to live in this country and pay taxes. When a trust magnate becomes so rich that he is found out by the assessor, he begins to kick at his taxes, and finally seeks some place where the assessor is a weakling or a knave, and spends the balance of his life blowing in money for his own pleasure, pulling wool over the eyes of half-witted assessors, and letting people who are too honorable to dodge taxes look at him in his pride and glory, and pay the taxes themselves. There will come a time when the trust magnate who pauperizes his neighbors and the rich tax dodger who shirks his duty will find no place on the earth except Monte Carlo where he will be welcome, and there he will have to gamble away the money he has taken from the poor 
in order to be recognized by the society that will congregate there. But if the trusts are wiped out in a few years, and legitimate competition established, happiness will again be a condition and not a theory, and the smile of the traveling man will be seen again, and his hearty laugh heard throughout the land. End of section two. Recording by Melora. Section three of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Dad Was Scared. A lady friend in the East who was writing stories for a Philadelphia paper having heard that once when the editor of the sun was governor of the state he showed great coolness in a case where a crazy man entered the executive office and demanded money writes to get the particulars of the story but for fear the impression will get out that the governor was actually cool under the trying circumstances it is considered best to publish his reply to her in full which is as follows. Milwaukee, June 20th, 1899. My dear M., you ask me if I can recall the circumstance of the crazy man entering the executive office and demanding money of me, and the cool manner in which I stood him off. If I live to be as old as the late Mr. Methuselah, who, I am told, was an old resident of Philadelphia, and lived on Market Street, I shall never forget that morning that the crazy man came in on his collecting expedition. Five years have passed me since that morning, and yet I can hardly go to sleep at night without seeing his cold, glittering eyes looking into mine, and I can hear the hair push up through my nightcap, and as I finally go to sleep, the hairs curl down outside the nightcap, so it has to be taken off like a porous plaster in the morning. But I was not cool. Don't ever let anyone make you believe I was cool until he had gone away. It was the day after Carter Harrison had been murdered by a crazy man, and the papers were full of stories about the seeming desire of the demented people to do injury to those who held prominent positions, and governors and things were a little nervous. About eleven o'clock a wild-looking man came into my room where I was alone, the door always being open, the secretary and messenger having desks in an adjoining room. The man came up to the end of the table with his hands on his hip pockets, leaned over so his face was within six inches of mine, and his eyes glittered like those of a rattlesnake about to strike, and he said, I want five thousand dollars out of the first national bank right away or I'll kill you. And he stood there as if frozen stiff and rigid and never turned his eyes away from mine. In a second the situation dawned on me and I could almost hear the water dripping from my body to the carpet below my chair, from the perspiration, I suppose. I had played poker some before I went into politics years ago in the army, and I thought I had schooled myself so that my opponent could not tell whether I had a bobtail flush or four aces by looking at my face, and I looked the crazy man right in the eye before I knew it. I said, all right, boss, sit right down, make a six thousand. He backed up to a chair and sat down without removing his eyes from mine. There was a revolver in a drawer at my right a drawer that I had had the carpenter put in that morning, and I thought I could reach it and kill the man before he could kill me. But I had never killed many people, and I thought if I killed him just for asking for a little money, it would be brought up against me at the next election. I remember how a thousand things of that kind passed through my mind in a second, how I thought maybe he was striking me for a campaign assessment, and how I thought it was mighty high then I thought of poor Carter Harrison, and whether I could get away to attend his funeral, or whether my funeral might not be held the day after. All these thoughts did not take ten seconds, 
and I was looking at him, and he at me. I turned my eyes to look at my hand on the table, to see if it trembled, and I wondered if a man could go on transacting important business if his heart stopped beating, and I tried to breathe naturally, as though I was only standing off a man who came in with an ordinary bill. Then the man said, Hurry up, and I said, I will send a man over to the bank with you, and he said, All right. I put my right hand out on the table to ring the electric bell for the messenger, and I noticed the hand was very white, but I left it there on the electric button because it was within four inches of the revolver in the drawer, and I thought if he made a jump at me I would put a thirty-eight caliber long right through his heart, and I remembered putting five bullets inside an envelope on a tree up at the Hurricane Clubhouse a few days before and I remembered of wondering if that long pale forefinger of mine on the button had strength enough to pull that self-cocking Smith and Wesson that Chief Chanson gave me. Oh, I was cool. I was dying right there. Then Schubert, the Lutheran music minister whom I had appointed messenger, came in, and he looked to me awfully small for a fight with a crazy man. But I remember that I thought Maybe he is one of those German turners who can walk all over a man like a cat, and wondered why I had not thought to find out before if he was an athlete. When Schubert came in, the man rose up, and I quit thinking, and I said, Mr. Schubert, I want you to go with this gentleman over to the First National Bank and identify him and tell Mr. Ramsey to give him $6,000. A smile came to Schubert's face, and I feared the crazy man would see it, and all would be over. But I now had my hand on the pearl handle of the revolver, and I never had anything feel so good. I have handled lots of things in my time, gold doubloons, silver certificates, a million dollars in bonds, and plenty of things valuable. I have handled hot-boiled eggs and gold nuggets, held in my hand the soft white hand of the dearest girl that ever came down the pike when I was younger, and once a jeweler let me handle a thirty-carat blue diamond as big as a bantam's egg, but nothing that I ever held in that right hand ever felt so smooth and beautiful and satisfactory as did the pearl handle of that self-cocking revolver, and I could not help putting my finger on the trigger and pressing a little to see if I had strength to shoot, and when I felt the plunger beginning to come back to where it has to come before it shoots, and it seemed easy enough, I let it down again. My heart began to beat regular, and I said to myself, I wouldn't do a thing but make a porous plaster of his left shirt bosom. Schubert got a look at the man and at my face, and he took it all in and said, All right, come on and the two went out the door, and I put the revolver in my pistol pocket and went out in the other room, and told my secretary to run to the police office and get an officer and head off Schubert and the crazy man. Then I went out in the hall and called Schubert back and said, The man is crazy. Kill time going through the park so Clark can get the police. And the crazy man stood still while I whispered to Schubert. I picked out a black marble tiling where I would drop him if he pulled a gun. Schubert turned pale and went out in the park with the man. Then I went to the window and watched the play. Poor Clark was lame in one foot, but he got over the ground like a racehorse, and Schubert walked slow and went crooked across the lawn, and I stood at the window and perspired. I was weak and wanted a drink of whiskey worse than ever in my life. Pretty soon I saw Clark coming with a big policeman, saw the officer take the crazy man by the arm and lead him off. Clark and Schubert came back fanning themselves and looking as though they had done a day's work in the harvest field. I said, I hope you fellows were not frightened, and they said they knew I was not by the way I looked, and then we had a great laugh over it, though I had to tickle myself in the ribs with my thumb in order to laugh. You know how it is when you know it is your turn to laugh, but you had rather cry. 
I felt like a man I saw once at a maple sugar party, who tipped a soup plate full of hot maple syrup into his lap, and when all the rest laughed, he stood up and tried to back away from his warm trousers that were sticking to his person, and he tried to laugh too. When we got him undressed and were putting oil and cotton batting on his body where he was blistered, I said, What in thunder were you laughing at when that syrup went in your lap? He said, as he groaned with pain, Egad, I had to. It was my turn. Well, I had to laugh when the crazy man episode was over, because it was my turn, but it was not that hearty, hilarious laugh you might hear at a picnic or on a steamboat excursion when surrounded by those whom you love and enjoy being with. Do you know that even today I can't think of that affair without having creeps up my back? Well, the next day they sent the man to the insane asylum from whence he had escaped, and he is there yet for all I know, and that is all there is to the story of my coolness, your friend. THE YELLOW SHOE PERIOD It is said Dewey was the first man in Washington years ago, when yellow shoes were invented, to put on a pair of them. The officials in his office laughed at him and guyed him, and though the shoes hurt his feet till he almost fainted, he would not take them off for fear it would look as though the boys had driven him to do so by their chaffing. Now that yellow shoes have become legal tender, we can all laugh, but it was a serious matter when a man first decided to wear them. First he talked about yellow shoes at home, till the family had consented that they were a good thing, but when a pair was delivered at his house everybody said, I hope you are not going to wear those things, and he was sad. He would let them stand in his room for a day or two, till he got so he would not shy at them himself, and some morning he would put them on. If he was a middle-aged or elderly man, it was even worse, for when he came stubbing his toes downstairs and showed up before the family, his wife or someone would scream or pretend to faint away, and he would try to look as though he had always worn yellow shoes, and perhaps go into the kitchen and spring them on the servant girls, who would hide their faces and snigger when he went out, and then he would take them off and wear his old black shoes downtown. It usually took the average man about a week of wearing the yellow shoes around the house, mornings and evenings, before he dared to wear them downtown. But some men wore them downtown nights at first, and imagined no one noticed them, though when the wearer got near an arc light, he almost had heart disease. Finally, the middle-aged man got courage, and he started out for the streetcar on a bright morning with the yellow shoes on, and tried to look as though he didn't know they were yellow, but he couldn't help looking down at them as he stood waiting for a car, and it did seem to him as though he never saw anything so yellow in his life. Then the car would come along, and he wished there were not three or four passengers on the front platform smoking, for he could feel that they were commenting on his shoes, and he would swear that he saw the motorman laughing at some remark the passengers made but in an age or two the front of the car would get by, and he would get on the rear platform hurriedly, thinking no one there would notice his shoes, but he would stub his toe on the top step and go up to the platform on a hop, skip, and jump, and plant one of those yellow boys on the foot of a passenger who would get mad and say something about a man bringing sole leather portmanteaus onto the cars and all the passengers on the hind platform would look at the yellow shoes in pity. When he got in the car, he could hear them laughing out there and swearing, and he would have given a five-dollar note if he had never bought the shoes, and he would take them back now, only the soles were soiled. He would sit down in a seat with a strange woman and think the shoes were out of sight, and then she would lean over in front and look down on them, and he could see a man across the aisle, hunch another man with his elbow, and see them both look across at his feet. There might be a dozen other men on the car with yellow shoes on, but nobody paid any attention to them. A man in front of him would look around and sniff as though he smelled something, 
and he knew it was his new yellow shoes the man smelled, and the perspiration would start out on his neck and face. The ordeal came when he had to get off the car. He would be away up in front and wish he could go out the front door, but he knew what he would get from those smokers in front, so he would boldly walk back through the car, and every last passenger would look down at his new shoes, and ladies whose skirts were out in the aisle would pull them in, and when he got through the gang of pirates on the rear platform and was on the ground, he would swear to get even with all of them before he died. Then he would walk down the sidewalk to his place of business, and it would seem as though he met the whole population, and that every man looked down at the yellow shoes, and frequently he would be sure he saw a smile on a man's face that he could not remember of ever seeing smile before, and he would stub one toe against the heel of his other shoe and try to act as though that was the way he always walked, and he didn't care a continental what anybody thought. But he would finally get to his office and see the clerks stare at him, and was never so happy in his life as when he got those yellow shoes under his desk out of sight. He would think the novelty would wear off before noon, but his spirit would be broken, for about eleven o'clock he would send a boy to the house after his old black shoes, and he would put them on and go out to luncheon happy for the first time that day, and when he came back he would offer to sell the yellow shoes to the office boy for half price, but he couldn't fool the office boy. And finally, when the yellow shoes had begun to go out of style late in the fall, he would put them on and wear them every day. Dewey is not the only man that has had troubles of his own with yellow shoes. End of Section 3 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 4 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck Unusual Hunting Experience One of the sporting papers devoted to the interests of those who shoot and fish has asked its readers to write accounts of the most unusual and interesting things that have occurred in their experiences in hunting and fishing, and some of the stories told are very interesting. The editor of Peck's Son had a hunting experience once that probably no other man on earth ever had. In 1865, he was a lieutenant of cavalry, stationed at Laredo, Texas, on the Rio Grande. With 15 men, he made a scout about 40 miles up the river, looking for Mexican cattle thieves who were stealing Texas cattle and running them across the river into Mexico. One evening, the party camped in a bottom covered with trees on the Rio Grande, and about dusk, the lieutenant decided to go in swimming. The writer of this, undressed, laid his loaded carbine on the bank and jumped into the river. Suddenly, a flock of wild turkeys flew upon a tree hanging over the river, and the writer swam out of the water, took the carbine, and walked through the mesquite bushes in undress uniform and shot five wild turkeys the bodies dropping into the river and floating rapidly downstream toward the gulf. A quarter of a mile below was a naked soldier swimming his horse in the river, and the naked officer yelled at him to retrieve the turkeys. The soldier swam his horse out into the Rio Grande, took the turkeys by the neck, and turned his horse ashore, and landed the turkeys, which were cooked that night, and all the scouting party had a feast. Probably no other man ever shot wild turkeys under the same circumstances, and had them retrieved by a naked man on horseback. If there had been Kodaks in those days, and a picture had been taken of the scene, it is more than likely some illustrated paper would, before this, have published to the world a picture of the editor of Peck's son in a new role, shooting as the daylight was fading, with not clothes enough on him to wad the gun he was shooting. THE WOMAN AND THE COCKTAIL New York society is all torn up on the question as to whether women ought to drink cocktails or not. Of course, society ladies are expected to drink something, but heretofore light wines have been considered heavy enough for them, with champagne occasionally. A woman with too much champagne is about the most uncertain thing imaginable. You don't know whether she is going to kick the chandeliers, give a college yell, or lop down on someone's shoulder and be seasick. When a woman is full of champagne, 
it is peculiar what an effect it has on her. First, she begins to look cross-eyed. Then one eye closes up and she can't open it without closing the other. Then she gets tongue-tied and her under lip gets caught in her teeth and she talks out of one side of her mouth and laughs at what she says as though it was a joke, which it seldom is. Then her hair begins to get loose and falls down over her eyes and back of her ears, and when she tries to put it up it never stays where she puts it, and the hairpins begin to fall out, and she looks as though she was coming all to pieces and wanted someone to hold her together. When someone else is telling a story, the woman with the champagne skate laughs before it is time, and when the others look at her in astonishment, she gets mad and pouts, and when the nub of the story is reached and the rest laugh, she looks as if she would cry. When the woman with the champagne sufficiency attempts to spear a blue point lobster, she misses it and catches a piece of lemon and eats it with the queerest expression, as though she thought oysters were pretty sour, and she winks and tries to laugh until she knocks an oyster shell off the plate into her lap and then she looks at the man across the table, with one eye at a time, as though he was to blame for it. She tries to politely sip the soup out of the side of her spoon, but her mouth seems to have gone away somewhere on a visit, and she passes on soup and eats large quantities of salted almonds, because they are dead easy. When the champagne bubbles go to her nose and tickle her, she chokes up and acts as though she had paralysis of the optic nerve and she lays in to an innocent man at her left who has kindly removed the oyster shell from her lap, and she gives him one look with the eye that has come open that makes him lose his appetite. It is a sight to see the woman with the champagne jag try to cut a gash in a quail by holding her knife between her thumb and forefinger and three or four marquise rings trying to help. She rolls the quail about on the plate, trying to get the dissecting knife into a vital part and pries around to break off a piece of the breast, and just as she is about to tie it loose, the knife slips, and the quail lands on the trousers of the man on her right, and she laughs, and he says, Damn, in a falsetto voice, and apologizes to her, and then she looks offended and does not speak to him any more, but eats stuffed olives because they do not have to be carved, and she drinks another glass of wine and wishes the dinner was over, so she could dance and be gay. But the cocktail is the corker. It does not make a woman sick nor stupid, but just puts the very deuce into the light of her eye. With the first swallow of the cocktail, the woman's eyes begin to sparkle and twinkle, and she looks positively dangerous. The lips become scarlet, the skin takes on that hue that makes a man forget that his wife is away down at the other end of the table, busy with another man, and he looks into the eyes of his cocktail friend with the eyes, and when she gets down to the bottom of the glass and takes the cherry between her thumb and finger and places it between lips redder than the cherry and looks at that man once more, the best he can do is to get up from the table and go and get his wife and go home, for if he lingers there is liable to be trouble. The cocktail does not make the woman drunk and sick like the champagne, nor muss her hair and make her cross-eyed, but it makes every drop of blood tingle like your foot was asleep and touches the button so you can hear the bell ring at the central office. The fire department turns out, and there is a conflagration with no insurance. But it is better to drink soda water. The Dakota District Attorney I have just been reading in the morning paper, said a man who clerks in a commission house, as the crowd was playing cinch in the smoking car that a district attorney out in a Dakota county has given a written opinion that one of the amendments to the Constitution of the United States is unconstitutional. Wouldn't that kill you? What reason did he give? asked the man whose turn it was to deal, as he shuffled the cards and offered the pack to be cut. Was the district attorney a lawyer of eminence, whose opinion was equal to a Supreme Court decision, or just a common dub? Just a common dub, said the man who had started the trouble. Two years ago I was out there shooting chickens, and that fellow drove one of our teams and lifted the dogs in the wagon and watered them. He was studying law then, but he didn't look like a man who was going to destroy the Constitution. He helped on a threshing machine after the shooting season was over and got quite well acquainted in the farming community, and when he was admitted to the bar by the local judge, 
who used to sell lightning rods, the people took him up and elected him district attorney. It seems to me as though a fellow ought to be restrained by law from delivering opinions that may bring on revolutions. Well, that reminds me, said the old kicker, who had held all the trumps and made all there was to be made, that I heard some lawyers in Chicago talking about opinions of district attorneys, and I can recall how they winked at each other when they talked. I never could reconcile myself to understand how the opinion of a cheap lawyer, after he is elected, carries so much weight, when, as a lawyer, before he is elected, his opinion is not worth ten cents. The best lawyers do not get elected to these positions because they do not pay enough, and some dub, who has got a few friends in a convention, is mentioned, and he is nominated, and then he is elected. Previous to this, he was afraid of the cars, and if he had a case in court, he would go and ask a lawyer, on the sly, what to do, and he would choke up when addressing a justice of the peace, and blush, and his voice would sound hollow. But after election, he begins to look wise, and when a case is talked about, the papers say nothing will be done until the district attorney has rendered an opinion, and lawyers act as though it would be treason to the state to make a move until his nibs has rendered an opinion, and he goes around with his brow corrugated and his eyes fastened on the hereafter, looking wise, and great men who may have to combat that opinion, when rendered, walk as though they had felt slippers on for fear of disturbing him, and his office is sacred, and no one passes the door without hushing up all loud conversation. Reporters sit out in the hall on cushioned seats for fear of making a noise, and listen for the sound of the scratching of a pen, and look at each other and say, the opinion is about to be rendered, and all nature takes on an appearance of humidity in the atmosphere, and you can hear the worms eating the leaves of the trees, and the moths at their silent work in your clothes. Then the opinion is rendered, the opinion of a man who, before election, couldn't tell what was trumps in a game of whist without looking at the last card, or asking someone, and he has his opinion published to the world, to the effect that, unless all signs fail, such and such is the case, and the Dakota attorney goes and takes a vacation, while the attorneys who had been walking quietly and keeping still for fear of disturbing the opinionated official take the case into court and drive a load of hay through it and toss the opinion up and kick it when it comes down and knock the tar out of the opinion of his highness, and when the court decides that the opinion does not amount to a pinch of salt, and a verdict is rendered against the wise man, with costs, he looks at himself in the mirror, furnished by the Dakota County, and says, well, I'll be, and he goes about among his friends explaining how the court is prejudiced, and that the judge doesn't know enough to pound salt, and to wait until the next judicial election, and they won't do a thing to that judge. Milwaukee, all off here, shouts the brakeman, and the crowd begins to hustle to the door so all can get off first. Buy Meat Talic Sausage The sun is pained to be informed, on good authority, that parties in this city are making sausage out of horse meat. It is claimed that the horse sausage is shipped abroad, to the east, and to Europe, but the average citizen would not be convinced of such shipping without seeing the bills of lading. It is not possible that the managers of respectable markets will sell the horse sausage, so everybody will not get a taste of horse, but somebody is going to eat it, and all are anxious to know what effect it has on a man. Does the man with a horse sausage jag on show his condition by any outward sign? How are people who buy sausage to tell whether the basis of the same is horse or ox? It is a question that interests all, and perhaps it would be well to have new offices created, with good salaries, to investigate the sausage of commerce. If horse sausage is good, such official could certify it, and tag the accused sausage with a picture of a horse. If the son can buy horse sausage, it will detail one of its staff to eat some of it and report. It is hoped that this sausage question will not become a national or an international one, like the money question or the tariff. If it becomes a question of tariff, our people ought to insist that horse sausage shall be for revenue only, and not for protection. 
If it becomes like the money question, there should be a double standard or buy meat tallet condition, consisting of beef and pork, 16 of beef to 1 of pork, a fixed ratio without the consent of any other sausage manufacturer. It looks to the sun as though some arrogant and unscrupulous political party was at the bottom of this horse meat sausage and was trying to establish a single horse meat standard and force it down the throats of the people who were content with the old sausage of our fathers, the Jeffersonian sausage that was good enough until this crime of 1899 was committed and the good old sausage of a hundred years' service to man, with never a kick from anybody, is being demonetized, and in its place is to be established this horse-meat single standard. If such is the case, it will be bad for the people, for it will be found that the instigators of this sausage crime have got a corner on all the horse-meat in the country, so that only the mints controlled by the wicked political party can coin these yellow horse sausages. The sun may be an alarmist, but it desires to have the people watch out and see that the sausage they consume is composed of the old stuff that made us a contented and happy people, and that they do not get into their systems, under any disguise, this monopolistic stuff, coined of defunct dray horse, that will cause those who eat it to kick up and run away and break the whiffle trees. End of section four. Recording by Melora. Section five of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Red headed boy angel. A fifteen-year-old boy living in an interior town in this state, who has heard that the son was going to make a specialty of advising and chaperoning boys that are growing up that come in the son's jurisdiction, is responsible for this correspondence. He writes a letter from his home as follows. My dear governor, I want to get up a list of our citizens who will take your paper and deliver it to them every Saturday, but my stepfather, who is intermittently pious, praying one day and swearing the next, says he don't want any red-headed newsboy around him, and if he catches me selling papers he will warm my jacket. My mother, who is a meek little woman, who never would have allowed my stepfather if I had been as old as I am now, I can tell you, while she wants me to earn something towards buying a jacket for my stepfather to warm, as I have done for over six years, thinks I had better give up selling papers rather than have any trouble with him. It makes me sick to be treated so. I am not very large, my hair is red as a circus poster, and my skin is freckled, and my mother's husband makes fun of my looks and wants me to study for the ministry so sometimes I feel as though I would make a better pirate or train robber if I stay here much longer. My stepfather whipped me last summer with a belt that had a big nickel buckle on it till I fainted because I went in swimming without his consent, though my mother told me I could go in swimming. Then he made me go without my supper and insisted that I sing I want to be an angel until bedtime. I wish you would advise me what to do, and whether to run away or stay here and protect my mother. He kicked mother the other day because the strawberry shortcake was not light enough, and he was to blame because he bought some cheap baking powder at auction that Ma said wouldn't raise a blister. In your bad boy experience you must have had something like me. Is there anything that you know of that will make red hair turn black? and that will take freckles off a fellow's face. There are some freckles on me as big as a three-cent piece, and they are yellow and bilious looking. I have always looked forward to having a nice black mustache, but the hairs are beginning to come in sight on my top lip, and they are as red as a fox's tail. Is there any cure for a red mustache? Please write me. Yours truly, just a red-headed boy. Answer my dear kid, 
it is not my intention to set up an office to regulate the family affairs of all who read the sun, but your letter interests me deeply, and I can see that in your present state of indignation you may do something you will be sorry for. So I will write you a few verses. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother. If there is anything in the good book that advises a boy to honor a stepfather who trounces him without cause with a strap with an iron buckle on it, a man who is apparently a heartless hypocrite, I have not found the chapter in verse, though I will retain the pastor of my church to look up the law on the subject. You had better advise with your mother and some good men that you know as to whether you should become a newsboy and if they all think you can make a few dollars honestly by selling papers on Saturday and not interfere with your studies at school, you just do it. And if that old hypocrite attempts to molest you, wire me, and I will come out there on the first train and scare the daylights out of him. I will have him arrested for treason, my boy, for suppressing a newspaper and depriving the people and the press of liberty. Oh, the boys won't do a thing to that old wretch. Now, my boy, don't you worry about being red-headed. No boy is red-headed from choice, and it is very discouraging to be the only red-headed freckled boy in a school. The girls giggle at him and are afraid to get near him for fear of spontaneous combustion. And at a party, the red-headed boy often can't get a partner, while the black-haired boys have partners to burn. But don't worry, my boy. You will feel as though the whole world is against you, and you will at times want to go off somewhere and die. Don't do it. When the rest are having fun and neglecting studies, you pitch right in and learn all there is in the books. By and by, the other boys will be asking you to help them in their studies, to keep them from failing to get there. Help them cheerfully, and after a while, the boys will swear by you and say you have got more in that old red head and under those freckles than all of them. Why, some of those pretty boys will be trying to catch freckles of you, and some day a lock of that red hair will be as precious to some good girl as it is now to your mother. You will make money while the smart alecks are spending all they can get, and they will want to borrow of you. Lend them a little, but insist that they pay it when due. If you are the banker of the boys in school, you may be the banker of the town when you grow up. Keep your red hair and your freckles, for some day you will be proud of them. Learn to be an all-around boy. Don't be a preacher now, but when you get old enough to know what you are best fitted for, be a preacher, if that is in your line, and be a good one. If you have learned to play football and all the games, and to box so you are not afraid to put up your hands with anybody of your weight, it won't be in your way if you become a preacher. Last summer I saw a little preacher on a bicycle run into by a bruiser who laughed at the little preacher and asked him what he was going to do about it. The little preacher took off his sweater and rolled up his shirt sleeves, and when the bruiser came for him and attempted to land on the point of his jaw, the little preacher ducked and gave the bruiser one under the ear that laid him cold, and then he fanned the bruiser till he came to his senses and asked him if he would like to have another round. The bruiser felt of the place where he thought his ear came off, and when he found it was still on the side of his head, he said, No, thank you. I don't want to fight a bantam. I am a heavyweight. And he apologized and went away, and I thought the minister uttered a silent prayer, though he was laughing all the time. The prettiest prayer I have heard in a year was by a young minister, chaplain of a regiment, who two years ago I saw taken off the football field at Madison, senseless, from getting jumped on in the mud by fifteen players. So, my boy, you go on studying, and some day a general may be looking up and down the line for a man to lead a dangerous expedition, and he may pick out a red-headed fellow about your build. And if you do as well as that red-headed Kansas colonel, the world will be talking about you the next day, and that confounded stepfather of yours will take up all the room at the depot when you come home and tell everybody, That's my boy! 
then I want you to take off your army belt with the big brass buckle, take your stepfather across your knee, and give it to him good and plenty, and we will elect you United States Senator. So long, you red-headed kid. Interrupted Wedding Trip Some people have an idea that after men get along in years and assume grave responsibilities, that they forget the days when they were boys and never play any more jokes on their friends. But it is a great mistake. No man gets so high up in the business or professional world or so engrossed in the affairs of life, if he has ever been a boy with a boy's ideas of fun, that he forgets to look for chances to play jokes on his friends. This idea was beautifully illustrated a year or so ago when a prominent hotel man of Chicago got married. He had more friends than anybody in Chicago, and when it was noised around that he had been captured by a pair of bright eyes, he who was considered immune against any fever that love brings was the subject of many congratulations. But there were consultations among his friends as to how to make life a burden to him on his wedding trip. The friends did not resort to the old custom of trimming his trunk with white ribbons and advertising the fact to the world that he was married. They had a deeper scheme. Mr. Charles, the bridegroom, who was a friend of Mr. Pinkerton, the detective, was offered a squad of private detectives to go with him on his bridal tour, and the captain of a local military company proffered his company as an escort to Denver, while the leader of a band tendered the services of his entire aggregation, including a drum major, free of charge. Mr. Charles declined all these kindly offers with politeness, but there was an offer that he accepted, to his great sorrow. A friend who was general manager of a railroad west of Omaha tendered his private car to the bridegroom to be at his disposal from Omaha to Denver, up into the mountains, and return. That was too good a thing for a bridegroom to decline, and Mr. Charles bit like a bass. The marriage took place, and the bridal party got to Omaha by the ordinary cars and after shaking the rice out of their clothing all across the states of Illinois and Iowa, the happy couple arrived at Omaha. They put in the day looking at the sights and occasionally dropping more rice on the streets, which seemed never to entirely leave them. While on the principal street of Omaha, a shower came up, and Mr. Charles opened the new umbrella, and about a quart of rice which had been hidden there fell upon the new bonnet of the bride and all over the sidewalk. Mr. Charles was not a profane man, but when such things kept occurring after he was five hundred miles away from his friends, he felt that the rice planting was being overdone. Telling of it afterward, he said he got to be afraid to put his hands in his pockets, for he always found rice there. A small hole in his overcoat pocket allowed a stream of rice to pour on the ground wherever he traveled, and in a street car, where he sat, the floor became covered to the depth of an inch. But at evening, the bride and groom entered the car so kindly donated by the general manager, met the porter, who was also the cook, and who exhibited his teeth in smiles, retired in the stateroom of the car, and prepared to sleep. Mr. Charles says, now that it is over, that he wouldn't go through another such night for a million dollars. First the car was taken out to the stockyards and placed between stock trains, where pigs squealed for hours and cattle bellowed until the bridegroom was frantic. But finally the car was hitched onto a train and started west. Every engineer seemed to have orders to blow the whistle whenever passing the special car, and there was scarcely a minute that the engine hauling the train on which was the private car did not sound for a crossing or something. It is perhaps better to let Mr. Charles tell the balance of the story himself. He returned to Chicago after an absence of ten days, a little pale, and with a nervous look, which is said always to be the case with a returned bridegroom. He did not say much about his trip till he met his late bosom friend, Mr. Pinkerton. 
After a few words to break the ice, Mr. Pinkerton said, Charles, how did you enjoy the special car that the old man furnished you? Great way to travel, isn't it? Don't ever mention special car to me, said Mr. Charles, as he got up and walked the floor. And I will bet you that general manager will never cross my path again. I shall kill him on sight. And Mr. Charles took a revolver from a drawer in his desk and began to turn the cylinder. What was wrong? asked Mr. Pinkerton, with a laugh that spread all over his face. Now don't you ever breathe a word of this, said Mr. Charles, but I have got plenty. We hadn't more than got into the car at Omaha before a switch engine jerked it out to the packing houses, and of all the noises and smells I ever heard and smelled, that beat all. Ten thousand squealing hogs and bellowing cattle and men punching cattle with sharp sticks and swearing, and a perfect hell upon earth. Oh, you must have dreamed it, said the friend. You were nervous from overwork before you left home, and the reaction and the peace and quiet of a wedding trip were too much for you. Oh, go on, said the bridegroom. I believe you helped put up the job yourself. But it was quiet enough later. After we got out into Nebraska, more than seven pounds of rice came down through the ventilator on my bed. The bells in the car had been arranged with some kind of clockwork, and they rang every seven minutes, and the porter would come to the door and ask what he could do for me. I never slept a wink till after daylight, and when I woke up the car was still, and I dressed and looked out the window, and we were on the prairie with not a house in sight. I tried to call the porter, but he wouldn't port where's the scent. I went out on the platform in my pajamas and found the car was on a side track, no train in sight, and the wind blowing my pajamas four ways for Sunday. I wondered what we had been sidetracked for and started to go in and find the porter, but the door locked itself with me out on the platform. Nice position for a bridegroom, wasn't it, on a chilly morning? I pounded on the door, but no porter, and finally a still small voice asked who was there, and on giving the grand hailing sign of distress and the quarterly password, I was permitted to enter. Well, I dressed and went out, and it was the bleakest looking country for a honeymoon that I ever saw. I hunted the car through for the porter and concluded that my private car had got a hot box in the night and the train had left it sidetracked and took the porter on to Denver. Oh, I was a happy bridegroom. Finally, I saw a black spot on the prairie, and I watched it, and finally it came nearer, and I found it was the porter. He said he had been chasing a jackrabbit. I told him never mind rabbits, but hustle around and get breakfast. He said that was what he was chasing the jackrabbit for, for breakfast. He said there was no food in the car. I told him the car was to have been stocked with provisions by the manager. He said all there was to eat was rice, about a bushel, but no fire and no coal, and we would have to eat the rice dry. Say, just imagine a bridal party that has seen nothing but rice for two days until the rattle of rice on the pavement makes them sick trying to make a breakfast of dry rice. I asked the porter if there was nothing else to eat on the car, and he said some hunters had the car a week before, and they left some crackers, and I told him to fetch them out. What do you think he brought out for us? Some of these dog biscuits. Well, I came near dying right there. A wedding breakfast of dog biscuit and dry rice. I asked him if there was no wine or water on board. He said there was no wine, but there was a bottle of Hyundai water. Ye gods! Hyundai water on an empty stomach? Finally, I asked the porter how he came to be sidetracked, and he said the conductor told him he had orders from the train dispatcher to sidetrack the car at the quietest place in Nebraska, as the occupants wanted to enjoy a quiet life far away from the maddening throng. Well, I could see it was a put-up job, and I was going to stand the rays all night, so I ordered the porter to set the table with the rice, the dog biscuit, and the Hyundai water, and I was going to eat if it killed me, as my wife had a little flask of brandy for sickness, 
when we heard a whistle blow, and presently a train stopped and coupled on to our car and whirled us away toward Denver, and they brought us a fine breakfast from the dining car, and my wife never knew the worry and anxiety I had enjoyed talking with that porter. We got to Denver all right and shook that car, and I am now going to devote the balance of my life getting even with that general manager, and Mr. Charles felt for his revolver. How did you explain to your wife about being on the sidetrack on the prairie so long? asked Mr. Pinkerton. Oh, I just lied, said Mr. Charles. I said the rest of the train had gone through a bridge, and our car was the only one that was saved, and I thought we were in big luck to be alive. But just you wait, and Mr. Charles took down a large duck gun and began to try some buckshot cartridges in it, and he had a wicked look in his mild blue eye. End of Section 5 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Section 6 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Clock Watcher and Whistle Jumper The boy who has been employed in a store for two years, but who is looking for a job, he having been discharged recently, has almost got a play several times, but when the man who was going to employ him went to his former employer to ask about him, he got the reply to his inquiries about as follows. Ah, oh, he is honest and all that, but he is a clock watcher and a whistle jumper. To many people that reply would be unintelligible, but to employers of men and boys, and girls for that matter, it means much. It means that half an hour before quitting time, the boy begins to watch the clock and wonder what has got into it to make it go so slow. Every minute he glances at the clock, and ten minutes before it is time to quit, he begins to get ready, neglects the business at hand, and when the whistle finally blows as a signal for quitting, he starts for the door, and you couldn't catch him with a hound dog. He may not want to go anywhere in particular, and may loaf on a corner after he gets out, or he may go to a billiard room, or he may do anything he likes, but the fact remains that he wanted to get out of the place where he worked, and get out quick, and the chances are that his employer or some trusted patient assistant finished up the business that the boy left unfinished, and had his opinion of the boy. But he got out when the whistle blew, and that is all he cared and the chances are he will not give the business of his employer a thought until the whistle blows the next morning, and he will not hurry half as much to get to work as he did to get away. And all the time the fool boy does not know that the employer is sizing him up and knows that he does not take any interest in the business except at quitting time and payday. Some day, when business is a little slack, the whistle jumper is called into the office and told that he needn't watch the clock any more, and that he is free to go away out of hearing of the whistle, and that the house will get along with one less worker, and he is indignant. He wonders why the other boy is not discharged, the boy who, when there was work to do, always remained until it was done, and who got around a little before the time in the morning, and got his books out and his desk dusted before the whistle blew, but that boy remains and becomes a part of the business. The average employer wants boys and men who imagine if they are away the business loses something, boys who can find things to do without being told. If the son was going into the business of giving advice to a boy at work in a place of business, it would be not to look at the clock, unless to find out if it was time to take medicine, and when the whistle blows, to act as though it was a great surprise, and to work a little longer, and not hurry to get away, but to hurry in the morning to get to work. The employer will notice it, and he will be pleased. You can't fool the employer much. He knows all that is going on, and when a boy gets wearied with work and tears the door off the hinges to get out, some day he does not come back. THE WOMAN BEHIND THE GUN 
It is necessary to take out a license in Maine, the same as in Wisconsin, to shoot game, and any person who expects even to shoot cats on a back fence fortifies himself with a license, for fear he will be arrested, for cats are always in season, everywhere, and Wisconsin cat hunters had better see that they have a license. The other day a woman in Maine took out a license as a hunter, and consternation seized the male hunters, and they will not go to the woods until she has shot herself. In fact, the state game warden telegraphed the news to all parts of the state that a woman had taken out a license and requested the hunters to keep out of the woods until she had got through shooting. There are women who can shoot fairly well at the trap, but when they show up at the bird shooting tournaments, the men instinctively get behind something while the woman is on deck with a gun. They know there is no particular danger except in front of the gun, but a woman with a shotgun is always turning around at a critical time, with her gun cocked, to ask somebody if her hat is on straight. So men who are not heavily insured had rather get behind something when Hanner toes the mark. A young lawyer who is a great sport with a shotgun was telling, two or three years ago, about teaching his young wife to shoot, so she could go with him on his hunting trips and a man who used to hear him talk about the fun he would have when she got so she could shoot, met him the other day, taking his gun into a gun store, to have it got ready for the opening day of the season, and said to him, Hello, going hunting, are you? I suppose your wife is going along. I remember you told me a couple of years ago you had bought her a sixteen-gauge shotgun. I suppose she can shoot all around you, eh? Yes, she has shot all around me, and hit me a couple of times, said the young lawyer, but she is not going with me. I shall sneak off alone on the pretense of having a case in court at St. Paul. What's the matter? Don't she like hunting? I thought she was carried away with the sport. Say, old man, said the young lawyer, looking solemn, now this must be in strict confidence, mind you. My wife would be dangerous with a gun if she was out in the middle of a forty-acre field, alone. She has no more idea of the danger of a shotgun than she would of a broom. The first thing I taught her was to always point the gun away from herself. She was the dearest thing in the world to me, and I didn't want her to shoot herself. But by jinx, she points it at me, and everybody that is in sight, and laughs about it, and never seems to think there is any danger. The first time we went out shooting chickens, she fired into the flock and killed one, or scared it to death, and she dropped the gun and ran after the bird, stepped on the trigger, and the other barrel went off, shot the heel out of my shoe, and filled one of the horses with bird shot, and the team ran away. It cost me sixty dollars for the wagon. Then she claimed every bird I shot for a week. She has no idea of distance, and will shoot at a bird as far as she can see it. I left her one day in the field, and started off to have a quiet life, and I scared up a bird, and she plugged at it, with me between her and the bird, and she filled my canvas coat-tail with number eight shot, and when I yelled to her, she fired the other barrel, and I had to lay down behind a log, or she would have been firing yet. I tried to scold her, when I dared get near her, about being careless, and she laughed and looked so sweet that I just looked at her and admired her until I found her gun was loaded and at full cock and pointed at my head with her dear little finger on the trigger. I had to quit hunting with her, or she would have been a widow before this. I do not want to hurt her feelings by telling her I am afraid of her, but I suffer from nervous prostration when she has the gun in her hand, and so I tell her the shooting is no good, or it is too hot or too cold, and I leave my gun at the gun store, and when I want to go hunting, I sneak off, and she thinks I am attending to business. Oh, yes, she will find it out some day, and be heartbroken at my deceiving her. But I figure it is better for me to have a heartbroken wife than for her to have a headless husband. An Experimental Turkish Bath some of the great inventions of the age have been discovered by the merest accident. 
this has been the case from earliest times, ever since Mr. Franklin discovered the attraction of gravitation by the fall of an apple from a tree. All must have noticed the new India rubber bathing arrangements, by which a person can get inside a rubber affair, light a lamp, and take a Turkish bath at home. It is on the same principle of the old-fashioned whiskey sweat, but its being utilized as a full Turkish bath was an accident. Two years ago, on a cold November day, a party of duck hunters were sitting about a stove at a clubhouse at Lake Koshkonong, thawing out after a morning in the bird blinds, during which nearly all were frostbitten. One of the gentlemen, Mr. Clemens of Janesville, sat with his cold feet in the oven of the cook stove for a long time, thinking, and finally he said he had thought of a way to keep warm in a boat, and he was going to try it. The boys chaffed him and said the only way to keep warm in a duck boat on such a day was to bring the boat in by the stove and line it with fur. But Mr. Clemens said he had a scheme, and after dinner he took a rubber blanket and a kerosene lantern and started for his boat. No man had ever started after ducks before from that clubhouse in the daytime with a lantern, and his companions looked at his 250 pounds of flesh and his lantern and they looked at each other and tapped their foreheads and sighed. Poor Fred, they thought. His mind could not stand the strain, and he has broken down just in the prime of life. He got into his boat with the lantern at his feet, rowed out to his blind not far away, and the crowd saw him pull the rubber blanket up around his neck, and they watched him. In a short time steam or smoke was seen to arise from the boat, and the ice that had collected on the blind stakes began to melt and to disappear. For an hour Mr. Clemens never moved a muscle, and ducks began to settle in among his decoys, and they would swim up to the boat and look over the side and look as though this was a new scheme in duck hunting that interested them. When the crowd saw that Mr. Clemens did not move when ducks were all about him, and they saw the steam arising in clouds about the boat, they became alarmed at the condition of their friend, and thought that possibly he had passed away there in the boat, that his life's work had terminated, and they knew that if he had died it had been just as he would have preferred to have the end come, on the good old lake surrounded by the rare game that he had pursued for years with so much pleasure. So they prepared to take his remains to the shore, and all started out in duck boats to go to the blind and tow back to the shore he loved so well all that was mortal of the best fellow that ever shot a ten-pound gun at an eight-ounce duck. There was sadness on every face as the flotilla approached the blind, and no one spoke, as all were thinking of the sad end of one of God's noblemen. As the boat approached, the ducks flew away, having warmed their feet in the warm steam that came out of the boat. As the friends gathered around the steaming boat, which reminded them of a scene in the Yellowstone Park, they saw that the face of their friend was covered with frost from the top of his head to the rubber blanket. And then he realized that his friends were there, and he said, Boys, this is great. I have enjoyed the finest Turkish bath a man ever had. And he threw off the rubber blanket, and there was not a dry thread on him. In the enjoyment of his improvised Turkish bath, he had become oblivious of ducks and everything, and had given himself up to pure enjoyment. His friends got him to return to the clubhouse, where he was rubbed down and weighed, and it was found that he had lost twenty-seven pounds. The story was told in Janesville, and an inventor named Withington is said to have applied for a patent on the India rubber Turkish bath, and it is said he is receiving a royalty of five hundred dollars a week on the patent, while Mr. Clemens, the originator, is not getting a thing, except an occasional bath at reduced rates. Such is life. End of section six. Recording by Melora. Section seven of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spare the child and spoil the rod. It is a sad day for a father who has brought a son up with frequent whippings to realize that the son has got big enough to handle the father if it were necessary. A father who has been a tyrant over his boy is in hard luck when the time comes that the boy can pay him back if he wants to in the same treatment. Sometimes a minister is the hardest man on his boys of any father in a community. He has the spare the rod and spoil the child business constantly before him, and he often overdoes the thing, trying to be a sort of bad man example to other fathers, and it is often the case that a minister's sons are the worst boys in a community, whether on account of the whippings they get or not has never been decided. There is no minister or other father in the land who is in quite as tight a place at this time, on account of a boy growing to manhood with a memory, as the father of Jim Jeffries, the champion prize fighter. It is said the old man never let a chance escape to trounce Jim when he was a boy, and often the boy thought there was no cause for the whipping. Jim often felt that the old minister would get mad at his congregation, or the scraps in the choir, the shortage at the donations, or the difficulties of preaching on an empty stomach, and he would come home and take a fall out of Jim. Up to a couple of years ago, Jim was actually afraid of the old man, because he would go at the boy with blood in his eye and chase him around the room and break furniture with him, and the Los Angeles boys got so they would help Jim in the windows nights after the minister had said his prayers and gone to bed. It is pretty tough on a big growing boy to be trounced and then be made to get down on his knees and listen to a prayer an hour long when his knees are skinned from playing marbles, and to whip a boy good and plenty before breakfast and then compel him to ask a blessing, or to tell a boy he will be attended to after breakfast and then make him ask a blessing and thank the ruler for what is set before him, and say, for what we are about to receive, the Lord make us duly thankful. Jim Jeffries remembers what came into his life when he was a boy, and it is not strange now, as he returns to the roof tree, if he decides what he will do if the old minister attempts to do him up as he used to. It is possible the father has seen the handwriting on Mr. Fitzsimmons' jaw, and that he will not assert himself in the old way if James spills the huckleberry juice on the clean tablecloth. But if he does forget the changed conditions and says, James, I want to see you in the woodshed after supper, he will be surprised at the alacrity with which James will appear in the aforesaid wood receptacle and if the ancient minister attempts to take young Jeffreys across his knee in the old familiar way and reach for a barrel stave with which to drive the rich red blood to the brain of his stalwart offspring, the old minister will no doubt be surprised at the forcible manner in which the champion will spread the gospel all around that woodshed with a blow in the solar plexus of the exhorter. Some friend may tell the father that if he feels that it is his duty to chastise James, that he send in a call for the hurry wagon, or get the governor to call out the troops, or perhaps get some cowboys to rope James and tie him to a sedentary cow horse until he is properly branded with a barrel stave. If nobody is friend enough to this opinionated elderly preacher, to give him a few pointers as to the position James holds in the world, and how little indignity he is licensed to stand from those who would molest or make him afraid, the old gentleman will try to do something to James that will cause the sleeping lion and the young man to be aroused. And if the big boy ever does start for that old man, there is no roped arena to keep him inside. There will come a time when this old man that never knew fear will see a human funnel-shaped cloud bearing down on him, and he will suddenly remember of a friendly cyclone cellar down by Santa Monica or Long Beach that he has noticed in his travels as a circuit rider, and he will pull out for the coast, 
and there will be a streak of coat tail seventeen miles long between Los Angeles and Blue Water, with young Mr. Jeffrey's father leading the streak a few laps. As champion of the world, James cannot take any back talk from prince or pauper. From the world, the flesh, or the devil will be to pay. If he should submit to chastisement now by his father, and should challenge Corbett, Corbett would tell James that he must go and fight a woman and get a reputation. So the son advises the elder Mr. Jeffries to exercise care and not let that hasty temper of his get him into the same trouble that the late Mr. Fitzsimmons, the actor, got into when his mouth got loose and went off when he thought it was not loaded. Hair Cut Curly a young schoolboy in an interior town has written to a teacher living here, asking her to go to a drug store and get him a bottle of some kind of stuff that will make his hair grow curly. He says that he is very good looking with sparkling blue eyes and he has a pure white complexion, but that his hair, which is a sort of brick color, is straight and he would give anything if he could put something on it that would make it curl. The teacher who received the letter thinks it must be a joke, as she thinks no boy of the present day could possibly be foolish enough to believe straight hair could be made curly, and she has asked the son what it thinks of the proposal. Well, it is no joke. She may rely on that. In almost any school there is one boy whose hair is naturally curly, and every last boy in school is usually jealous of the curly-headed boy, for the girls pet him and make him think he is a little god on wheels, while the other boys with straight hair stand around like stoughton bottles at recess. The boys usually hate the curly-haired boy as much as the girls like him, particularly if he is vain and stuck on himself, as many curly-haired boys are. The curly boy can live it down if he is a good fellow and mixes with the other boys, and does not set too much store by his hair. But if he is rich, or proud and exclusive, he makes the other boys wild, and they want to maul him. And yet every boy in the bunch would like to have curly hair, at about a certain age. A man who is now on the supreme bench of a state not so far away, when a boy with the straightest kind of hair, wanted his hair to be curly, and he was told in a joke that the barbers could cut hair so it would grow out curly if he asked them to. And for two years, whenever he had his hair cut, he told the barber to be sure and cut it curly, and he watched his hair every time he went near a mirror to see if it had begun to curl. The barber told him it would take time, but it would curl all right if he kept on having it cut curly. But it never curls worth a cent, and the judge is now rather glad his hair didn't curl under the manipulation of the barber, as he has got along pretty well with straight hair. But when he sees a man with curly hair, even though he is on the bench, he smiles out loud at his early troubles with his hair. The schoolboy had better not worry much about his hair. He should brush it once in a while and wash it with dog soap, but don't let its straightness cause worry. The only curly-haired boy in school is not liable to be the future president on account of his curly hair. It is something inside the hair that makes conventions seek a man for president. They often pick out a man and couldn't tell even the color of his hair or whether he has had any hair or not until after he is elected and inaugurated and then the nature of the president's hair is only noticed because some fashion reporter has alluded to it. If a curly-haired boy in school does not stand as well in his classes as the straight-haired boy and does not get on as well in later life, it cannot exactly be laid to his hair, but the hair has had something to do with it. He has paid too much attention to it, perhaps, or has got the idea that he is blue-blooded because his hair curls and feels that he is the whole thing in school and after he gets out. The curly-haired boy is apt to let it grow long and shake his mane and try to look brave and savage or sweet and dear, and the girls spoil him. 
A flock of schoolgirls can spoil a boy quick if they neglect half the other boys and fawn around him. Spoiled in school, and a boy goes out into the world handicapped. He is simply traveling on his hair, and when the people are looking around for brain, he gets in the way and thinks they can't help seeing that he is it. But somehow they pass him by and pick up a duffer whose hair is full of burrs, but whose brain is throbbing and working overtime, and Curly wonders about it. So, boy, never mind the hair. Don't put any stuff on it to make it curl. If it curls natural, try to straighten it out with a comb, and keep right on studying algebra till your straight hair aches. THE COUNTRY'S BRIDE AND GROOM The trouble that Dewey and his beautiful young wife are having in New York, keeping out of sight of people and preventing themselves being carried on the shoulders of the populace if they show up at a bargain counter, is awful. But it will soon be over, and they can settle down to light housekeeping. The day will soon come when they, the bride and groom, will gather around the breakfast table with their appetites gone, and they will feel like kicking. There are so many things to kick about in housekeeping that one must have great control over himself to keep from making things blue all around. But the admiral who has lived on condensed milk for so many years can get along with a smile when the milkman fails to be on time. If the pancakes are not light enough, he must learn to eat them and not suggest that the cook put a little more baking powder in the batter as they used to do on the Olympia. That Olympia is liable to be as troublesome, if frequently alluded to, as the things that mother used to make to the ordinary bride. The time will come when it will not be well to mention how smooth things used to run on the Olympia, for in such a moment as you thinks not, the worm will be liable to turn, and the great man may be told he had better buy a canal boat and live on that. But the admiral will begin to realize that he is nothing but a human being some day when he is helped on with his overcoat, the lint picked off the collar by the small white hands, and he is told not to wear his hat on one side in that rakish fashion, but to have it on square. And when he is asked who that woman is that he bowed to on the street, and when he says she is a clerk in one of the departments whom he has known for years, and he is told he'd better walk on the other side of the street when he comes home, he will realize that he is not in supreme command. Then he will be asked to drop into a store and match a piece of ribbon, and his fate is sealed if he complies with that request. The son does not desire to create trouble, but as an admirer of the great sailor, it does want to beg of him to decline as politely as possible the invitation to go to a store and match anything, for that is the entering wedge of a career of shopping by proxy. Once he matches a piece of ribbon, he is engaged for life, and from that out he will have a list of things to drop in and get that will take his valuable time from the government that needs his services so much. He will have to do everything, from ordering the coal to feeling of the breastbones of the chickens to see if they are ripe, and half his life will be spent on the revolving stools of the stores until he will be seasick from the motion and unsafe in his peace of mind from the bright eyes of the clerks and shoppers who will know him so well. If he tumbles to the first order to match a ribbon and winks and says, I have been there before many a time, and declines, he is saved. Or if he takes the order to match a blue ribbon and brings home a green one, and when scolded, puts in a plea of color blindness, his life will not be altogether a burden afterward. The best way is to never do anything of that kind right, but to make mistakes every time. And afterwards, when someone says, Why can't George get this on his way downtown? The bride will say, Oh, don't trust anything to George. He couldn't buy anything unless I was with him. If he went out to buy a horse, someone would sell him an automobile. And George will have established a reputation for absent-mindedness that will give him much rest. Some day, after the Admiral has had set before him all the delicacies to be found in Washington, 
terrapin, canvasback, duck, oysters that are the best in the world, the bride will notice that his appetite does not improve, and he will sigh and have a faraway look in his eyes, and the line around his mouth will be pronounced, and the wife will say, as he pushes aside the rich food, What is it, George? Something is troubling you? What is there in the world that I can get that you can relish? His eyes will brighten, and he will say, Oh, if you could get me a can of beef, such as Armour used to make, I could die happy. And the rattle of the can opener will be heard in the land, and the beef that made Chicago famous will be heard to drop with a dull thud on the bottom of the sailor's stomach, and a smile of peace and contentment will come over the face that has become so dear to the American people. He has got to learn not to blush and look guilty when a long hair is found on his coat of a different color from the one that has a right to be there. In a large city, where women's hair is blowing in the breeze all the time, unconfined and fluffy, a stray hair is liable to lodge on the coat of the best man in the world, and only those who are liable to be guilty are the ones who should blush. Let a sentiment be created in the family that stray hairs are the commonest thing to be found in the atmosphere, and in time no surprise will be manifest when they are found. But it takes a long time for a wife to get over wondering how in the very dickens that hair should have happened to lodge on her husband when there were so many men that it might have struck. But by patience and a good draw poker face, the desired effect may be obtained. Oh, George will be all right in time. End of section 7 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 8 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Goat Meat Habit Chicago is addicted to the goat meat habit. It has been discovered that a good deal of the mutton that is eaten in Chicago is nothing but goat, and that carloads of goat meat are being shipped there from Montana every week. That accounts for a good many things. There has been something strange in the conduct of many Chicago citizens, which we have never been able to satisfactorily explain, but this goat meat theory comes in just in time. Of course, a man is not to blame if he has eaten goat meat and did not know it, but if he deliberately eats billy goat, knowing it to be such, he cannot set up a claim to having lived a blameless life. There is no sure thing, but two-thirds of the crime in Chicago is caused by a goat diet. What that town needs, to become as quiet and peaceful as Oshkosh, is less detectives and more meat inspectors. It must be that some of the hotels there serve goat meat instead of mutton, because cases have been known where good citizens of towns in the West, men who belong to churches and schools of design, have gone to Chicago to lead a pious life for a time, and rest up from the cares of business, and after they have been in a Chicago hotel a few hours and eaten strange meat, they have gone blatting about, looking for trouble, which has often met them halfway, and they have been injured in their reputation and finances, and have finally gone home with guilty consciences to pray for forgiveness and to diet on liver in order to get the goat meat out of their systems. It is time Chicago did something to protect the strangers within her gates, and now is the time to put a stop to this goat meat vaccination before the crowd goes there in October to lay the cornerstone of Mr. McKinley's boom for a second term, with Dewey on the side. The mayor should put his trusty henchman to henching on this goat question, and run in every goat in the town, dead or alive, and make a public announcement that there is no goat meat epidemic there, or thousands of people who would like to go there and shout for Dewey and see McKinley acknowledge the applause by bowing and bearing his head, will stay away. Of course, if people prefer goat meat, it is different, but the people would hate mightily to see the distinguished people that are to be there acquire habits that it would take a lifetime to outgrow. Goat meat, if eaten at all, should be tagged like oleomargarine, 
so a guest would know what he was getting. But to allow it to be eaten by the innocent and good, who will never know what has caused them to act that way, is wicked. It is not so bad for the regular resident of Chicago. He may eat dog if he wants to, and one goat more or less will not affect him. But it is the man from out of town that we plead for. He goes to Chicago from force of habit, and does not believe he can be harmed by doing so. He probably could not, unless something was smuggled into him, in disguise. But you take the mildest man in all Wisconsin, put him in Chicago, and fill him up with the meat of billy goats, even though it is well cooked, so the germs would seem to be destroyed, and you want to watch him. He will say such things, and do such things, that he ought to be sent home with a trained nurse. NEW WAR EXPLOSIVES It is getting so anything that will wound or kill may be used in war, and as that question seems to be settled, inventors will go to work to study out new weapons. Up to a few years ago, only the bullet, the bayonet, the sword, and the mule were considered proper to be used in civilized warfare, but gradually dynamite and other explosives more dangerous than the mule have come into use. The mule was considered the most deadly explosive, until a method was discovered for shooting dynamite with safety, as the mule would get into a crowd of the enemy by stampede or otherwise, and keep kicking until all were laid out. The last use of the mule against an enemy was when General White stampeded a mess of mules at Ladysmith towards the enemy. The result in killed and wounded is not known as yet, owing to imperfect communication. But as it is admitted that Eubear has started with his army for the south, the supposition is that the mules are still after his army, and he may surrender to the British the first chance he gets, in order to save the part of his army not yet kicked to death. There is terror in the hundred-pound shell as it comes across the country, loaded for bear, liable to explode any minute, and tear up the turf for acres but the terror is as nothing compared to a stampede of mules. You know that when a shell once explodes, that is the end of it, but when a mule begins to kick and cavort and bray, that is only the beginning of the trouble. The dum-dum bullet that goes into a man, making an inch hole where it goes in, then mushrooms and tears his insides all up into cut feed, and finally goes out on the other side, out of a hole as big as a wash-tub, is considered dangerous to life but it can't compare with the four iron-shod feet of a mule for making an enemy wish he had been run through a corn-husker instead. The mule is doing as well as he can, but the time has come when something more deadly is needed, something with longer range than the mule. So leadite, an explosive that makes mincemeat of an army at four miles' range, is used, and now anything goes. It is considered legitimate warfare to use anything that will kill, so the cucumber and rough on rats is very likely the next thing that will be used. A gun that will shoot cucumbers into a man and give him cholera morbus will bring the inventor a fortune. A man who has a six-inch cucumber shot into his vitals will never live to get to a hospital, and his comrades will surely leave him on the field of battle. Nothing will save him from the deadly pains of cholera morbus but olive oil, and no soldier can carry a bottle of olive oil into battle. The shooting of bread or cheese saturated with rat poison will cause inventors much study, but the inventive genius of our country has never failed in anything it has undertaken. Shells can be invented similar to the deadly shrapnel, containing pieces of hardtack broken irregularly, like scrap iron, saturated with the rat poison, and no enemy can live in range of the gun that fires it. And the contractors who furnish the rat poison for war purposes will guarantee that the wounded shall not die on the premises. Military experts are looking for great results from the firing of shells of rat poison, and it was expected that it would be experimented with on the Filipinos, but it has been found that Aguinaldo heard of the new ammunition being shipped to the Far East, and he has taken to the woods and mountains, so it is feared he is liable to be immune from rat poison, owing to distance from the base of supplies. 
it is too bad it could not have been tried on the Filipino dog before going on the road for the regular season in Africa. There are some officers who, from their position in Cuba, got much valuable information in regard to canned beef as a deadly weapon, who believe the embalmed article, in round cans, fired from a mortar, could be made the most destructive missile yet invented. But their fear of being accused of suggesting uncivilized weapons has kept embalmed beef in the list of foods instead of missiles. But it is liable to be perfected for the next war. Certainly nothing would create greater consternation in the ranks of a civilized enemy than the explosion of cans of embalmed beef in their ranks, for one sniff of it would be worse than the pots that the Chinese use in warfare. Future wars will be conducted largely on the result of experiments being made in new weapons in the wars that are now being so humanely conducted by the two most civilized nations on the earth. THE MAN WHO ASKED QUESTIONS There is a man who is always asking questions, and who can never talk five minutes without asking so many that the answers would fill a book. He likes to talk with the young lawyers that congregate around the hotels, the courts, and the office buildings. These young lawyers, with a few older ones, get together evenings and talk over incidents, argue cases, and give opinions to themselves on cases in court, and hand-down decisions, as they call it. They have a good deal of fun with each other, and when one gives an opinion as to how a certain case, in some court, will be decided, the others give great weight to the opinion rendered, and often say, I guess you are right, old man, until the court decides the other way, when they will say, Well, I see the judge differed with you, and add, consolingly, But he probably hadn't studied up the matter as you did. The man who asks questions had bothered these lawyers a long time, and they decided to get even with him. So one evening he tired them out asking questions about different things that were topics of conversation, and the next morning he received a bill from every last one of them, for from five to twenty-five dollars, for advice, with a request to please remit. He is a man that does not know the first principles of a joke and when he got the batch of bills from lawyers, he was mad in a minute, and took them to his regular lawyer, and spread them out, and said, Do I have to pay these bills? The lawyer looked them over carefully, without a smile, having already been seen by the other lawyers, and told of the joke, and said, Why, I suppose so. They seem to be all regular enough. Here is one charging ten dollars in Dreyfus' case, and one for fifteen dollars for opinion in Plankinton Bank case. Did you ask these lawyers for legal advice in those celebrated cases? And his lawyer looked at him over his spectacles inquiringly. No, nah, said the man who asks questions. I never asked for any paid advice. We were talking over these cases, and I asked a solemn-looking duck what his opinion was as to the guilt or innocence of Dreyfus, and he hummed and hogged, and talked about the evidence in the case, and said he had read every word of evidence, and he finally said he thought Dreyfus was guilty. I knew a confounded sight better, and gave my opinion that he was innocent, and showed why. And here he comes in with a bill for ten dollars for an opinion in that case. Then I asked him if he didn't think Plankinton ought to give back the money he took for his services, and board the creditors at the Plankinton house, till they had boarded out their claims and he said he would look the matter up, and let me know, and the next day he said he had looked it up, and found that if the court sanctioned Mr. Plankinton's bill, he couldn't be held to board the creditors to the amount of their claims, and here he salts me twelve dollars for that opinion. I tell you, it is an outrage, ain't it? Well, not necessarily, said the lawyer, drumming on the table with his fingers and pursing up his mouth. The lawyer, no doubt, took it that you were interested in those cases, and he, no doubt, took the testimony and weighed it carefully, and balanced the evidence carefully in his mind, and gave you his opinion, believing it would be valuable to you. What is this charge in this other bill for an opinion on the Rampo water combine? Are you interested in that New York swindle? Not on your life, said the man who asks questions. We were talking about Tammany, 
and the prospects of the organization coming out and supporting Brian. I had no interest in it, but it was the day Croker was interviewed, and I asked a young Irish lawyer if he didn't think the fellows in New York had gone into that Rampo Water Company with a view of swindling the city out of twenty millions. And after consulting with another dove on the subject, he came to me and said that he was ready to hand down an opinion that Mr. Platt and Mr. Croker were actuated solely with the desire to better the condition of the people of New York in their water supply, and that they had never thought of the possibility of making a dollar out of it. And here he has charged me twelve dollars for that advice, and ten dollars for advice as to whether there would or would not be a war between England and the Transvaal. I only asked that question to find out what he thought about the prospect of war. Very likely, said the lawyer, as he put his feet up on his desk and locked his fingers together across his stomach. But you understand, a lawyer, to be ready to give opinions offhand on all questions, has got to study up all the time. It seems to me these charges, if they are proper, are exceedingly reasonable. But what is this charge in this other bill? Ten dollars for advice in regard to pants. I can't see how that can properly come into a bill for legal advice. Just like the whole blamed business, said the talking man. There were a whole lot of us talking about everything when I felt as though my trousers were too short at the bottom, and I asked that smooth-faced lawyer with bushy hair and a white hat, says I, look at the bottom of my pants and see if you don't think they are too short. And he put on his glasses and looked and had me walk by him. And finally he said he wasn't up on the styles, and was not much of a tailor, but he would jump at a conclusion, without looking up the authorities, and give me his opinion, that the pants ought to be let out a couple of holes on my suspenders. And by mighty, he has charged me ten dollars for handing down that opinion. He might as well charge a woman for legal advice when she asks him if her hat is on straight. This beats me, and I will never ask a lawyer the time of day again. Do I have to pay these bills? Well, I don't see any way out of it, unless you contest the matter in the courts, said the lawyer. And how much are you going to charge me for this advice? Oh, a mere nominal sum, said the lawyer, smiling and rubbing his hands. Perhaps twenty-five dollars? Well, I'll be dodgasted, said the man, as he went out to buy a gun. End of Section 8 Recording by Melora. Section 9 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hen in Politics. No person, not an expert at reading character, could look in the face of the common barnyard hen and say that she was possessed of great brain, or that she had a mind that grasped great problems. The hen has always been looked upon as the feathered Mormon wife, contented to see her husband go around mashing other hens and never making any trouble. The husband of the hen has never been called to account for his misdeeds, never has had the charge of conduct unbecoming a rooster made against him. Knowing him to be untrue to her, she has gone clucking about, laying eggs when they were cheap, and striking when eggs were dear, at the apparent behest of a walking delegate. She has never gone into the courts to secure a separation and alimony, but has borne her burden and smiled in the face of trouble, apparently not caring whether her rooster flirted with other hens or went to Congress. On account of the chickens who were growing up, whose lives would be embittered by the knowledge of scandal in the household, the hen has kept silent, though her gizzard pained her, and she has always been cheerful, digging worms for the lazy rooster to get fat on, and laying eggs for him to cackle over and make believe he had laid. The hen has never even looked reproachful at her polygamous consort, though he has carried on his flirtations under her very eyes, and in the presence of the chickens, 
but has turned her back on them and chased grasshoppers, seeming not to notice what was going on, though a sad sigh would occasionally escape her. She has seemed to have confidence that when old age came to the rooster and he had found that there was no pleasure in the chase after strange pullets, he would come back to her and settle down and let her support him. But it was always her luck to have her rooster, when he got old enough to know better, killed for a boarding-house stew, and after a period of mourning she would find another rooster who would promise to be good to her, with the same result, broken promises, scandal, and heartburning. The hen has always been looked upon as a chump. But within the last four months, the hens of this country have done something that great political parties have failed to do, that organized labor has not succeeded in doing, and she has set the pace that will bring to her banner the bone and sinew of the land and cause a monument to be erected to her memory. She has broken up a trust and sent the conspirators to begging for mercy. A year ago or less, the packers, the armors, the swifts, and the others, decided to buy up all the eggs in the country when they were cheap and plenty, put them in cold storage, and when winter came and the hens refused to lay, they would raise the price of eggs to fifty cents a dozen and prey upon the wealth of the housewife. The plan was well considered, and all the eggs were stored, and the rich packers went off to the winter resorts in warm climates and waited for the rise in eggs. It is said the packers even went so far as to let Rockefeller in the deal on the ground floor. Along about Thanksgiving and Christmas, to the consternation of the packers, fresh eggs were plenty, and there was no call for the decayed eggs in cold storage, and it was found that the hens were doing business at the old stand, laying eggs faster than ever. In January, the hens even worked harder, and night and day they filled the nest with eggs, while the packers perspired blood. The hens just winked and said nothing but laid eggs. The packers came back from their winter resorts in consternation to head off the hens. The only way to save their cold storage eggs was to stop the hens, so they issued orders to their agents to buy all the poultry in the country and kill and dress it and boil it and can it for the market. The farmers sold their poultry at a big price, all except the old hens that were laying eggs, and so the packers were beaten again, and failure stares many a rich man in the face owing to his being long on cold storage eggs. The lecture season is nearly over, and the demand for cold eggs is limited, and the hens are still at work. It is said that Rockefeller is indignant at the packers who have sold him this cold storage gold brick, as this is the first speculation he ever went into that failed, and it is believed that he has raised the price of kerosene in order to get even on the egg deal. The question that bothers scientists and students of political economy is how in the world the supposedly unintelligent hen could have known anything of supply and demand, and known that, by taking no vacation, but laying eggs all through the winter to beat the band, she could break up as soulless a monopoly as ever scuttled a ship or filled a soldier with embalmed beef. It is evident to all that some power greater than any ever known in the history of hen fruit has had a controlling influence on the hens of this country during the last few months, and has helped her to assist the Democrats in downing the trusts. If the hen can only develop a capacity for producing kerosene oil, she may help to make Rockefeller feel like 30 cents, and if she ever does to get laying cigarettes, the tobacco trust will get it in the neck. Let us erect a monument to the hen, the first to make a trust wish it had subsidized her before it tried to corner eggs. Dreyfus and Embalmed Beef Well, I tell you, said the old kicker, 
after listening to the talk of the seven-up players on the suburban train about boycotting France on account of the decision in the Dreyfus case. You don't want to go off half-cocked in this business. These army trials are notorious for making decisions about as the general staff wants them made. Now you take that embalmed beef trial, for instance. Ah, go on now, said the man who had just made high, low, jack, and was counting the game. That beef trial was no comparison. The only thing was that if the beef had been condemned by the trial board, it would have advertised to the world that our packers were on the make and would sell any old dead thing if they could get it sealed up in a can before it exploded. Whose deal is it? That's what I say, said the old kicker. That board was organized to acquit, the same as the French board was organized to convict. If the beef was found to have been bad, the general staff was such a general staff would be canned and roasted, and the fellows who sold the beef would have been sent to Devil's Island unless they put up lots of money. Now, France and every other country watched the beef trial and expected a conviction, and when the verdict came in, showing that the stinking meat that nauseated and killed the best soldiers in the world was as pure as baking powder, the people abroad thought strongly of boycotting America for putting up such a job to save the necks of conspirators against the men behind the guns. Go slow, boys, about boycotting France on champagne and pâté de foie gras. Oh, here you are all wrong, said the man who only had one trump and played it the first hand. Don't you remember they had some of the beef at the trial, and everybody tasted of it and said it was good? Sure, said the old kicker. They made up a lot on purpose, same as the green goods men have samples of genuine greenbacks to show to the jays who buy sawdust. Officers who were expected to do so testified that the beef was good enough, but officers who were there to tell the truth said it was vile, embalmed, and slimy, and common soldiers said it was worse than grave robbery. Roosevelt said the meat was awful, and yet a can of nice perfumed beef was sent to Alger, and he put some on a cracker and gave it to the president, and they both said it was so good they ordered some for their private tables, and the trial board took that kind of testimony and acquitted the conspirators. They wanted to save the honor of the army, the same as the court at Wren did. Oh, you can't fool me. And the old kicker stamped his feet and acted as though it was a personal matter with him. Yes, but didn't the president get rid of Alger and send him back to Michigan with a flea in his ear? said the man whose next deal it was. Didn't he show that he wouldn't have any man in his cabinet that would allow the soldiers to be fed on such stuff? And didn't they fire Egan? What for? said the old kicker, as he pounded the palm of his left hand with his right fist. If the beef was good, as it was demonstrated to be by the verdict of the court-martial, what did he fire Alger for? The court-martial vindicated Alger and the beef as it was appointed to do. The Alger end of the beef was all right, wasn't it? Then why did they fire Alger and destroy all the embalmed beef on hand in Cuba and Puerto Rico if it was good, and tell the packers they were vindicated, but they must not do it again? Probably there were extenuating circumstances, same as the French court said there was in the Dreyfus alleged treason. If the verdict of the beef court was right, Alger should be the logical candidate for president, and the beef that was so good should have been ordered back to this country and fed out to the White House guests at a reception for an object lesson, and Miles, the wicked man who did so much damage to the pious pork packers by his beef report, after they had been of so much financial assistance to the campaign, should have been sent to report to the Sultan of Sulu as a prisoner of war. Say, just to try you fellows, I have a can of embalmed roast beef in the baggage car that I have been keeping ever since my nephew brought it back from Cuba, and I am going to open it right here on this board you are playing cards on 
with this can opener. Porter, get the tongs and bring in that green tin can in the corner of the baggage car. And the old kicker took a can opener out of his pocket, and the porter started for the can. You confounded old scavenger, said the man who had defended the army beef as the porter came in with the can, his nose turned up at an acute angle. You open up that can in this car and you die. You don't know that the president of the state board of health is in the next car. I will call him if you stab that can with your can opener. I am willing to admit anything and will not boycott France if you will let up on that can. Well, all right, said the old kicker. I just wanted to argue, that's all. There is nothing in the can anyway. I just carry it to paralyze fellows who say the embalmed beef given the soldiers was all right. I have never found an apologist of that beef that has had sand enough to remain quiet while a case of the remains was being opened. They can all smell it, four cars ahead. And the old kicker prepared to leave the car and get his can checked at the depot so he could use it when he went out again at night if they got to arguing on an embalmed beef. THE DEADLY PISTOL POCKET A judge in Texas has found it necessary to warn juries to be careful of the claim of self-defense so often made in murder cases, the claim that the deceased put his hand behind him and, of course, was shot, on the theory that he was going to draw a pistol. There were so many claims of self-defense that the judge feared the habit was growing on people, that of shooting at a man because he reached around behind him. The judge is right in calling attention to this thing, because many people put their hands behind them who never carried a weapon and never thought of having a quarrel with anybody. This is particularly the case with northern people who often carry a handkerchief in the pocket known as the pistol pocket and it is small consolation to a man after he has been killed and buried, and the man who shot him has been acquitted, to be told that he never ought to have reached around behind him, though he could prove by a thousand people at home that he always carried his handkerchief in his pistol pocket, and always drew it in an altercation in order to weep properly. Some men in the east, in the temperance districts of Maine, carry small flasks in their pistol pockets, properly covered with an orthodox coat-tail. And these men are far from being fighters. Suppose such a man should visit a locality on business where the citizens shoot too recklessly and on too slight provocation, and should get into a political argument or any sort of argument of a heated nature and should notice that his opponent was becoming excited, and should suddenly remember his flask, and think he could bring the argument to a better understanding by offering the gentleman he was talking with a drink of old New England rum, and should reach for it. He would be taking his life in his hands. Before he had got the flap of his orthodox coat-tail raised up, sufficient to get his hand hold of the flask, the soft-nosed bullets of the gentleman he had fluid designs upon might begin to enter his bosom, and when he fell and was breathing his last, the hand might produce the flask. The shooter, when he saw the flask, would realize that he had made the mistake of his life, and that the dead man was only trying to produce an argument that all could agree was sound. But it would be everlastingly too late and he would have to go into court and make the claim of self-defense, while the remains would be shipped home C.O.D. The pockets in the basement of trousers have caused trouble enough. Those pockets were never needed, and were originally put in during a temperance revival, and fostered by the workings of the Maine liquor law as being a sort of cold storage for illegal beverages far away from the maddening throng where nobody would think of looking for the illicit stuff. For many years only a few hip pockets were made, and those who had them in their trousers were exempt from the suspicion that they were walking bars, however much their breath might give them away. The first discovery of the new hip pockets by others than the wearers 
was by a St. Albans woman who was searching her husband's trousers for money while he slept, and when she found a flask full of budge she screamed and fainted away, and the husband was caught and punished. The hip pocket must go if we are to mingle much in the east and west. Out on the frontier, the prejudice against men who reach under their coattails is just as great as it is in other localities where quick gun action is the rule. Even boys know better than to carry their marbles in hip pockets, but the tenderfoot is not posted, and he dies in his tracks. The hip pocket must be abolished, or our people must learn to explain beforehand to those around them that there is no occasion for rashness, as they are only about to reach around under their coattails to get a notebook or a handkerchief. There might be a custom established of ringing a bell to give warning when one is about to reach behind, or a man might sing a peace song before doing so, which would give the western fighting man notice that nothing sanguinary was about to happen when the fatal movement was about to be made. It is a question whether the national government or the states should establish a code of signals that will protect the citizen who is not reaching for a gun when he lifts his coattail, but one or the other should take action. Some day an eminent political speaker will make the mistake of drawing some document from his pistol pocket to read to an assembled multitude, and he will have the concentrated fire of a large audience turned upon him. And then the country will awake to the dangers of the hip pocket. Until that time, the killing will go on, and self-defense will be the excuse. End of section 9 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Section 10 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Guest on a Coal Carrier The old kicker was on the streetcar once more, having come in from the country and got the children in school and he was prepared again to settle grave questions by argument on the streetcars, morning and evening, as he rode to and from business. This was his first trip downtown since he returned from his summer home, and he looked about the car when he came in to see who of his old friends were yet alive, and whom he should sit down with and try to talk to death, as was his custom when in town. Most of the passengers knew that he was back, and dreaded him, and they buried their faces in the morning papers, or looked steadily out of the windows, so he would pass them by, or sat wide, taking up all the seat, so he could not crowd himself in. But he found one slim man who left a place big enough for him to sit down, but the man had a studious, careworn look, and the old kicker sat down and said, "'Guess you haven't had any outing this summer. You look pale as a ghost,' and as though you were about down with nervous prostration. No, the only outing I have taken this summer was to wear a negligee shirt, a yellow belt, and tan shoes. But I have gained ten pounds from not being talked to death by these confounded old cranks that have given us a rest by going into the country. And the studious man continued reading his paper. Is that so? said the old kicker, looking at the man's face sideways to see if he meant anything personal. But every man ought to get out of town for a week or two in the summer. Lake looks beautiful this morning. Yes, the lake is always beautiful, said the studious man, and that reminds me that I have an invitation to go down to Buffalo and take a trip up the lakes on a coal carrier, and I think I shall go. Did you ever ride on a coal boat? Once, said the old kicker. Couldn't get me on one again with a derrick. Say, Take my advice and walk. I know what you think. You think it will be a cheap and enjoyable trip, as you get your transportation and meals free, and that you will be a new man when you get back, and it won't cost you a cent. Well, you'll get fooled. Ever play draw poker? Well, I have played a little for gun wads at home with my wife and some of the neighbors, said the studious man. You have, eh? Then you think you know all about it, said the old kicker 
as he sneezed a couple of times on account of an armful of goldenrod a girl in the seat in front was taking to the office where she was a stenographer that dumb goldenrod ought to be thrown out the window i went on such a trip once and thought i was the smartest fellow alive i had a stateroom in the captain's cabin and the first day i trod the deck and got tanned and smelled of the three thousand barrels of kerosene and was happy the first night the captain got me into a poker game with the mate and another passenger and i won over thirty dollars and i figured that in eight days i could have all the money in the party and maybe own the boat and cargo the next day i didn't care so much about the scenery and so we remained in the cabin and played poker all day and away into the night i won again and couldn't sleep from counting what i expected to win we run into milwaukee to unload the coal and i never went ashore but played poker all the time then we started for duluth with the oil and i began to lose the smell of the oil and the menominee river had made me sick and i couldn't play as well and before we got to the sioux i had lost four hundred dollars and my watch and they wouldn't let me in the game any more for i owed a hundred dollars to the others then i walked the deck and listened to the clicking of the chips in the cabin a storm came up and i had just heaved up all the cheap board i had accumulated as a guest of the captain and when we got to duluth i had lost twenty pounds my clothes were filled with coal dust and covered with bad smelling oil and i went ashore and found a commission man i used to know here in milwaukee and he loaned me a shirt and twelve dollars and i came home by rail and my wife made me sleep in the coal shed for a week with a kerosene can say don't you take a trip on a coal boat and the old kicker got up and motioned the conductor to stop at the next corner but i shall sail with a captain who is a church member and there will be no danger said the studious man the worst kind said the old kicker this captain i was with was a vestryman in a buffalo church and he could deal the almightiest hand i ever saw when there was a jackpot well i get off here and the old kicker jumped off the car before it had crossed the street strained his back and shook his fist at the conductor calling an audience with a fire alarm a friend sends a clipping from a new york paper pretending to give an account of a speech made by the editor of the sun when he occupied the position of governor of wisconsin at hurley and turning in a fire alarm to get an audience to speak to the article is so untruthful that maybe it is best to tell it right from the fountainhead inasmuch as it has never been in print and never ought to have been and never would have been if the new york paper had not got it all mixed up along in eighteen ninety two or eighteen ninety three when all the mines at Hurley and in that vicinity were closed down, and the men had no work and no money, things looked pretty blue, and there was a pretty good chance that a whole lot of people would starve to death. The people tried to bond the county to raise money to feed the destitute through the winter, but non-resident taxpayers got an injunction or something legal and put a stop to that method of raising money, and as a last resort the authorities appealed to the governor for aid. They hated to call for help, but there was nothing else to do. The miners, when they made money fast, had spent it pretty recklessly, and when trouble came, they hadn't enough money to buy a plug of tobacco. The governor listened and asked how long they could exist on the supply of food in the town, and the committee said the following Monday they would be entirely out of food, and the governor promised to have stuff there to burn the next Monday morning. He came to Milwaukee issued a notice to the people of the state that starving was going on up north and for them to get a hustle on or words to that effect well gentle reader reader living outside of wisconsin probably you don't know anything about a wisconsin case of hustle when anybody is suffering the next day in milwaukee the governor and members of his staff couldn't go ten steps without being offered money and cut feed for those hurley miners in two days there were several thousand dollars in money and a warehouse full of food ready to ship and saturday night a special train with the old man and a lot of his young kid staff were on the way to hurley and sunday morning the train pulled into the hungry town and the mayor and the businessmen were all there and the ladies of relief societies 
laughing and crying because the people of old Wisconsin had remembered them so generously. There was four feet of snow on the ground that winter morning, and soon all the sleighs in town were hauling the flour and the pork and beef and everything up to the city building and storing it away in the basement and beside the fire engine. For a couple of hours the sleighs were loaded and unloaded regularly. But about ten o'clock the sleighs came slow from the train and got stuck on the hill, and the work had practically stopped. The governor asked what was the matter, and was told that the men who were working to load and unload the stuff wanted to know who was going to pay them for their work. They were practically on a strike for pay, for handling the provisions that were to be given them freely by the people to live on during the winter. The idea was so preposterous that the governor couldn't believe it, but one of his staff came up from the depot and said it was true. They were grumbling about being paid for their work. The mayor and the businessmen were ashamed of their people and blushed, and then the governor and his staff and the businessmen took hold of a sleigh load of barrels of corned beef and lifted it up the hill, while some of the laboring men stood and looked on and laughed. On the way home the next day, some of the staff said they had never seen the old man mad before, and they didn't want to see him mad any more because it spoiled his looks. After the sleigh of beef was landed at the top of the hill, the governor brushed the snow and rock salt off his overcoat, took off his hat, and wiped the perspiration off the bald spot on his head, and turning to the mayor said, Will you kindly turn in the fire alarm for me? Certainly, governor, said the mayor, as he started to go into the engine house. I'll turn in anything you want, and he disappeared inside the building. Soon the bell began to ring, as though the whole town of Hurley was in flames, and the whole population came running up the hill, men with leather hats and slickers and monkey wrenches, laboring men and businessmen, women and children, all excited and covered with snow. Some were going to pull out the hose cart and the fire apparatus, and all wondering where the fire was. The crowd gathered around an overturned sleigh, which had been loaded with flour, and the mayor said, the governor wants to talk to you, friends. The governor got up on top of a snowdrift, one leg going down, through, and filling his trousers leg with snow, and when all was quiet, he said, Fellow citizens, the people of Wisconsin have heard of your condition, that you are liable to be on the verge of starvation tomorrow, because you have been long deprived of work. In their generosity, they have sent you good cheer, and bid you not to be discouraged, as no one is to be allowed to suffer for food and clothing in this state. They have sent you a train load of food, free, and wish you to use it and be happy all this cold winter. I find that some of you object to unloading this food from the cars and bringing it here, unless you are paid for your work. Shame on you! Now, I'll tell you what will happen. There are five car loads at the depot, and unless you go down there, and hustle it out and up here within two hours, I will take it back to Milwaukee, and all of this that has been delivered at this building will go back on the same train. The people of this state are not going to hire you to eat the food they give you. Now go and get those stalled sleighs up here and load them again and hurry about. That is all. That was about the substance of the old man's speech, though someone said afterwards that he used one profane word. Anyway, the crowd started for the depot, and within an hour all the stuff was at the city building, and the local committee worked all night to get ready to issue it to the people the next morning, and all that long cold winter nobody in Hurley suffered. That is all there was to the story of the governor turning in a fire alarm to get an audience to talk to, but the speech carried the day. American Jew Baiter Dead Judge Hilton, the man who appointed himself to inherit A.T. Stewart's millions, died at Saratoga a few days ago. He was a man who made a miscue, and never had a happy moment after he got Stewart's money. He got the big head too quick, and looked about for something smart to do, to show that he was strictly in it. He was the owner of one of the Stewart hotels at Saratoga, 
at which many rich Jews were guests, and because he didn't like the way some particular Jew acted at the table, either eating with his knife or something equally as foolish, he issued an order that Jews were not to be admitted to the hotel, thus becoming a sort of czar before he had worn Mr. Stewart's millions long enough to get used to them. At first the Jews were indignant, then they felt hurt, and then they got so mad they boiled over, and up to this time they have made it warm for Hilton every chance they had. They didn't do a thing, as the boys say, to the A. T. Stewart store on Broadway. They crippled its business, then bought it, and for years the remains of A. T. Stewart, if they could be found, would have seen the name of a firm of Jews over the door of the great store. They have followed Hilton right along, as they had a right to do, for he insulted a whole race, because one man of that race did not please him. If ever a lesson was given to Jew-baiters, it was in this case, and it should be a lesson to be long remembered by men who think they are unusually smart. There are many people who do not like some individual Jews, but few there are who are foolish enough to prescribe a whole race, because some one of that race is objectionable. The people who believe in fair play will not stand for the proscription of any race, and when a smart aleck undertakes to do it, the people join in trying to do him up. It is un-American and devilish. No man has money enough to make a success of turning down the Jews. They are a patient people, and can wait as long as anybody before running the knife into an enemy. If the Vanderbilts, with all their money, should publish a notice that no Jews were welcome to patronize their railroads, it would be only a matter of time when the vast wealth of that family would be exhausted in trying to buck against the fate that would surely overtake them, and the Jews would not be the only ones that would sit up nights to get even. They, certainly, would withdraw their patronage from the Vanderbilts, but the people would take pleasure in helping them, and thousands of Irish, Germans, Americans, and others, who might not love the Jews so greatly, would get in line to do up the railroad that had the meanness to ostracize a religion. If Rockefeller, with his billion dollars, should announce that he did not desire the patronage of the Jews, the race would try to get along without the goods Rockefeller handled, and millions of people would be in such sympathy with the Jews that they would sit up nights in the dark, rather than burn kerosene oil, just to help pay a man for being too mean to be an American, and before he died, Rockefeller would be around borrowing money of the Jews, and he would see his wealth disappear, and the Jews would be justified in smiling. Few Jews will send flowers to the funeral of Judge Hilton. They will not get up a demonstration over his departure from a life that was meant to have little pleasure in it for them, but they would be justified in drinking to the health of Seligman, the first Jew that was ordered to pack up and get out of the Saratoga Hotel. Hilton used to say, if the Jews don't like it at Saratoga, let them go back to Jerusalem. But no rich Jew cared very much about going to Jerusalem to reside, when they could have such good times in this country, with only an occasional enemy. In fact, America is the only country, unless it be England, in which Jews are not made to feel that their room is better than their company. But here they size right up beside any class of people, are as enterprising as the old original American himself, are generous and charitable, whatever may be said of their peculiarity for making and saving money. They don't spend money so recklessly as some, and they are better for it. But when they see that by spending money they can do good for the community in which they reside, or help its business or its general good, they blow in as well as anybody. The business Jew is an object lesson of careful looking out for number one that may well be used by educators of young business boys as illustrations of what a good businessman may be, a lesson to follow. Cities and states would be better off financially if more Jews should be called to political positions where money is to be saved and handled carefully than they are when men want to hold financial positions who are only qualified to spend money and not to save it. A corporation that has a good solid Jew as its treasurer never fails, but always has money ahead. 
Some day a Jew will be treasurer of the United States, and then the government will not make a big bluff at richness on borrowed money, but will earn it before spending it. The only thing the Sun has against the Jews is that they don't buy a couple of million repeating rifles and go to France and raise merry Hades with the Jew baiters and drive them into the ocean. End of section 10. Recording by Melora. Section 11 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Horseless Carriage. The day of the automobile has come, and the queer old people who try to stand in the way of its progress are going to be run over by its large tires and have the ancient wind squeezed out of them. The Chicago Park Commissioners, composed of a few old father times who may be interested in the livery business or the fertilizer industry, adopted a resolution against the automobile carriage in the parks. But a judge who was born since this country was settled, and who expected to live a few years in that city, declared that the park commissioners had no right to shut out the motor carriage, and the old fossils who tried to keep the noiseless, horseless vehicle out of society have been embalmed and placed in hermetically sealed cases in the anthropological building with the mummies. The horseless carriage has come to stay, as did the safety bicycle. When the safety first appeared, with its noiseless wind tires, horses were scared, and there were old back numbers who said these vehicles must only travel on back streets. But these old people have died, and the safety is so plenty that a horse that used to begin to snort and paw and shy at a wheel half a mile ahead would be kept pretty busy shying at the wheels that surround him on all sides. The only argument against the horseless carriage is that it might frighten horses. Anything might frighten a horse, even a baby wagon. But shall we cease to raise children because a fool horse may be frightened at a baby? That would have been the next order of the Chicago Park Commissioners that children cease to be in the interest of the narrow-headed horse that sees in a lady's parasol an object frightful to behold. The day of the horse is numbered. He has lorded it over the people too long. The horse never was reliable. The family horse that had the lives of a dozen good people in his hands, or feet rather, would be lauded to the skies for years, and then would shy at a flying piece of paper that he ought to know if he had an ounce of brain, was harmless, and he would run away and scatter the family all over the street. The horse has been overrated, as not one in a thousand was reliable. The young man who took his girl out riding with a horse guaranteed to be so safe you could lay the lines down on the dashboard, has found, when the critical time came, that the horse needed both hands and a windlass to hold him and that he had shied at a flower by the roadside when he ought to be going along straight, driving himself. Many a young couple have been pitched headlong into a barbed wire fence at a moment when the young man was ready to propose by a fool horse that could not tell what he was scared at if put on his oath in a court of justice. With a motor carriage, the young couple will have joy where formerly all was fear and trembling. They are seated in the motor carriage, and when he has fixed the wrap around her shoulders and the lap robe around her feet and looked into her eyes to see if they are there or thereabouts, he touches a button and the motor begins to stutter, the carriage moves, and there you are. He does not have to look ahead for things the motor may get scared at, and he can attend strictly to the girl. He can steer it with his feet, so both hands are free as the air they breathe, and can move about from place to place where they can be of the most service. The motor is not bothered with flies, and does not switch its tail over the lines, compelling the lover to leave his beloved in the seat 
while he leans over the dashboard on his white vest and takes the tail in one hand and the lines in the other and removes the pressure and maybe gets kicked through the dashboard. The motor does not start up suddenly when a carriage comes up behind and jerk till their backs ache. The motor can be left beside the road while the young man and woman go into the woods to pick flowers, and when they come back they will not find that it has unharnessed itself, is walking on the headstall and chewing leaves off a tree like a giraffe, while the young people have to repair the harness and hire a farmer to show them how to put it on the brute that has collected all the flies for miles around and has been lying down and rolling over. The motor will not take a young couple off into the country and then get the stomach ache and have to be unhitched and led around and given medicine out of a bottle and led behind the buggy by the girl while the young man hauls the buggy in town. The motor will not squeal and whinny when it passes a farm horse cultivating corn and prance and kick up and scare a boy and girl out of their wits for fear it is going to run away. It is on the 4th of July that the motor carriage will be worth its weight in gold. The motor will not snort at the smell of powder and pull on the bit and jump over a house when the small boy throws a big firecracker under the carriage. The motor will not become frightened at the pinwheel and run upon the sidewalk and tip the young people out on the lawn, all mixed up, so they have to have water poured on them. And it will not be so frightened at the rocket that it will squat down while the rocket is going up and jump into the air when the rocket explodes. The motor will be colorblind, and when the red fire is lit, it will not turn around on one wheel and kick the whiffle trees and run into a lamp post. The motor will not have to be curried off and rubbed with a brush under the stomach, which makes a horse kick and bite. The motor will not need a veterinary surgeon to cure it of scratches and splints. It can be traded without every body connected with the trade lying about its age and its soundness. You will know by the maker's mark on the back how old it is, and will not have to open its mouth, look at its teeth, and then look wise and say, It will never be ten years old again. You cannot file off the teeth of a twenty-year-old motor and sell it to a tenderfoot for a seven-year-old. You will not have to say it is perfectly gentle. A woman can drive it, and there is not a pimple on it. The motor carriage is going to be the greatest thing that ever happened, and the sun advises everybody to acquire a taste for horse meat. The horse that is eaten cannot run away and smash things. Burning a Tar Barrel Many people who read of the Dewey celebrations in Vermont are unable to understand the meaning of the burning of tar barrels at all the places where the hero was entertained. With electric lights, searchlights, and other methods of lighting up the gloom, these people do not see where the fun comes in in burning dirty and stuck tar barrels. Oh, the ignorance of some people! It is probable that nothing in all the celebrations in his honor in this country touched Dewey in so tender a spot as the burning of tar barrels. It is a custom as old as the country to burn tar barrels on great occasions in country towns. The empty tar barrel is sacred for great celebrations. When the tar has all been drawn out of a barrel, the barrel is not destroyed at once or burned to get rid of it, and a man who would deliberately burn a tar barrel when nothing had happened would be lynched. The tar barrel is hidden away until it is time to come on the scene. The tar barrel is never burned during a political campaign, but after election it is doomed and must come out. If a Republican owns the tar barrel and there is a Democratic victory, he tries to keep the secret that he has a tar barrel hidden and tries to save it from celebrating a victory for the other side, and vice versa. But there is always someone who knows where the tar barrel is, and before the returns are fairly counted, but the result is known, 
Excited men and boys roll the tar barrel to the center of the street, touch a match to it, and then there is a fire for your money. As the flames and fumes of burning tar fill the air, people will come from everywhere, half-dressed as though just out of bed, and they surround the smoking pile, and all enmities cease in the light of the tar barrel. Men who have fought each other in politics for months, ready to kill, will shake hands and say, Well, boys, you Republicans did everlastingly warm us, but we kept you guessing. And if the result is the other way, a good-natured Republican will say, as he puts his arms around a neighboring Democrat he has called a horse-thief all fall, Well, you condom old copperhead, you didn't do a thing to us, did you? And they will turn their backs to the fire, spread their coat-tails, and ask, How are all the folks to home? A thing they have forgotten to do all through the campaign. And one will say, now, Abner, you must come over some night and bring Sarry and play cinch, and we won't talk politics for two years. When the tar barrel burns, the people all come together. There is nothing like the tar barrel in the country town, burning away into the small hours of the morning, with boys yelling and playing, to heal up the old sores of strife and often the women folks cannot withstand the temptation to go downtown, smell tar, and see the boys that have been fighting the political battles of their country lock arms and bury the hatchet. And so Dewey at Montpelier, after witnessing sights such as no man had ever seen before, the destruction of the Spanish fleet, the homecoming, the grand demonstration at New York and Washington, where night was turned into day by electricity and kindred new illuminations, stood on the balcony of his hotel and saw the boys touch off the tar barrels, and he laughed like a boy and choked up and felt that he was indeed at home again. And as the odor of pine tar filled the air and the bright light colored the old elm trees that he played under when he was a boy, and the imps played around the burning barrels as he did when he had no shoes to his feet, and the people he had known when he was not a hero, except to his mother. It is not strange that tears came to his eyes and rolled down his cheeks, and he turned to his big, rough-bearded brother and said, Brother, this beats all the celebrations in all the world. I'd like to go down and touch off a tar barrel myself. Salt Water Baths for Hives An outspoken elderly lady and a lady much younger were sitting together in a street car, and a man was sitting behind them trying to read a paper. The conversation between the ladies was something about bathing, and he could hear their opinions of hot and cold baths, sponge baths, sun baths, and all that, when the younger woman said, she found that putting a little sea salt into the water was very refreshing. Well, I don't, said the elderly lady, and I want to live long enough to get even with the druggist who sold me a bag of sea salt and said it would dissolve in a few minutes. It cut me just like broken glass when I got in the bathtub and sat down in the water. Hush, said the younger woman, as the elderly lady talked quite loud. That man behind will hear you. I don't care if he does, said the elderly lady. He won't know what we are talking about. You see, I couldn't go to the seashore, and I wanted salt sea baths, and I thought if I could get all the benefit of salt water baths for a few cents worth of salt, I could save money. I was particular to ask that man if those great lumps of salt would dissolve, and he said they would melt right down and mingle with the water. The liar. He knew better. Well, I put about a pint of that rock salt in the bathtub and let it soak while I was doing up my hair in a towel. And, oh, did you ever have hives? Shh! Don't talk so loud, said the younger woman. No, I never had hives. What has hives got to do with it? Talk low. Well, if you ever have hives, don't rub any salt water on your legs. 
Shh! For heaven's sake, don't talk so loud, or I'll get right out of the car, said the younger woman. Now whisper about the sea salt. Well, I don't care. It nearly killed me, said the elderly woman. I thought the salt was all dissolved, and I got in, and stepped on the soap, and slipped down, kerplunk. I don't believe a single grain of that salt was dissolved, and every grain of it was three-cornered, and as sharp as tacks, and goodness sakes, I was being crucified. I did not dare to yell, for you know how nervous my husband is, and he would have turned in the fire alarm, and brought the whole fire department as quick as anything. So I just laid there and squashed salt, and pretty soon the water began to get salty and got into the breaking out on me, and I thought I should scream. I jumped out of the bathtub and let the salt water out and scraped the salt out, and actually there was more salt when I took it out than when I put it in. And suffering as I was from the salt in my wounds, I had to wait almost a week, it seemed to me, before that salt water ran out of the bathtub. And then the fresh water I wanted to rinse off the salt run so slow I liked to die before there was enough to get the salt off. Oh, but I could kill that druggist. Hark, what is that snickering behind us? I believe it is that druggist that told me the salt would dissolve. Don't look around. Are you going to put up any peaches this season? No, and I am not going to take any salt water baths, said the younger woman. And she got up to leave, and both of them looked mighty sharp at the man in the seat behind them, who was making a bluff at reading the paper. End section 11 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 12 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elephant Hunting in Wisconsin It is wonderful how sudden a change of public sentiment can be brought about. That is illustrated in the case of Dreyfus in Paris. Two years ago, the people were so bitter against him that they felt as if his punishment of imprisonment for life was not sufficient. Now the chances are they will want to carry him on their shoulders when he returns. The public sentiment of two gentlemen in Nielsville changed last week so quick that it almost made their heads swim. There was a small circus in town, and as it passed through the streets, the people who had seen greater shows commented on the little runt of an elephant that was in the procession. Two of the first citizens, who had traveled some, sat on the porch of the hotel with the city marshal, and talked about big game hunting. Mr. Ring said he had shot all the different kinds of game in this part of the country, deer, bear, wolves, etc., and he was thinking that if everything turned out right with him the next year or two, on his farm, and he could sell a lot of merino bucks and shire horses, at good prosperity prices, he would take a trip to India or Africa, and shoot some lions, tigers, and elephants, but he said if he shot any elephants, he wanted big ones, as he wouldn't fool away time on these little fellows. He said such an elephant as that one that just passed wouldn't be good powder for a revolver, and he would bet he could take a lariat rope and lead it anywhere. Mr. McBride said he had heard, when he was consul to Glasgow, Scotland, from a man who had hunted elephants, that they were great cowards, and if a man took a club and walked right up to them, and spoke to them in a commanding voice that they would get down on their knees and beg for mercy. He said maybe if Ring went to Africa in a year or two, he would go along and hunt elephants, as he had always felt as though he wanted to scare big game. The two gentlemen talked for some time about what little chance there was for excitement in a small town, and how they would like to get where they could chase big game, and the marshal walked away, leaving them there worrying because there was not enough going on to keep a man's blood circulating. Suddenly there was great excitement up the street, people rushing wildly about, parents throwing children into open doorways and running away in excitement, and presently the cry went forth 
that the elephant had got loose and was destroying part of the town. Mr. Ring was at once filled with excitement and was for climbing up the post of the porch. But Mr. McBride said if the elephant came along, he would pull down the porch, and he suggested that they take a closed hack and go out to Mr. Ring's farm and see if the man had got the sheep sheared. Just then the marshal returned and reassured the gentleman. He said the elephant had escaped, sure enough, and had taken to a piece of woods on the edge of town, and he wanted Mr. Ring and Mr. McBride to go with him and help catch the animal and return it to the circus, and he handed a coil of rope to Mr. Ring and an axe helve to Mr. McBride. He said Mr. McBride could club the elephant, and Mr. Ring could rope him, and it would give them experience that might be valuable to them when they went hunting elephants. The elephant business was becoming serious. Mr. Ring said he would like to go and help get the elephant all right enough, but he didn't have his elephant shoes on, and that was not his elephant day anyway. Mr. McBride said he was a lawyer and not an elephant hunter, and he could not do anything so unprofessional as to volunteer in any case, but if the proprietor of the circus wanted to come to him and retain him in the regular way, he would apply to Judge O'Neill, who was present, for an injunction to restrain the elephant from devastating the sugar bushes and pine forests of Clark County, but he would be blessed if he would go chasing elephants on a contingency. Mr. Ring agreed with Mr. McBride. He said, he was attorney of the Northwestern Road, and he couldn't take the circus man's side of the case until he had wired Chicago and found whether his clients were interested one way or another. They argued the case a while, and both showed good reasons why they should not be expected to mix in the fracas, and the marshal rounded up a hostler with a pitchfork and a river driver with a pike pole, and they started out towards the woods. But they soon met a barefooted boy with a twine string tied around the trunk, and he was leading the elephant back to the circus, where he was given a ticket to the evening performance, and the incident was closed, while Mr. Ring and Mr. McBride sat for an hour and talked about the recent rains and how much good they would do the lumbermen who had logs hung up in Black River. THE OUTING AND THE MOSQUITO Within a few years, the summer resort that advertises no mosquitoes will be deserted by summer guests, and the resort that can show the greatest aggregation of fierce and musical insects of that nature will have to turn people away. This seems a wild statement, but it is liable to come to pass. The editor of The Sun has investigated the mosquito question thoroughly and has come to the conclusion that this particular insect was placed on the earth with good intent, and for a purpose but little dreamed of at this time. The man who goes on an outing where there are plenty of mosquitoes, the man who is overworked and worrying about business affairs, is not allowed to think of business. When he tries to think, the insects gather about him and keep him busy, driving them away and swearing at them. A man who is mad and slapping himself constantly to kill the pests cannot get his mind on the affairs of home that worry him. That is one thing mosquitoes are made for, to cause the man with nervous prostration, with his brain paining him and his stomach in the wrong place, to get a move on himself and go home cured. If a man goes to a resort with all these diseases, and more too, and gets in a hammock under a mosquito netting, his think tank is constantly at work on the old problems he tried to leave at home. And when he comes out from under the netting, his head aches, and the old worry is on him, and he is not benefited. But let him go out in the woods and meet the mosquitoes on their own ground, and we defy him to remember what his name is or what business he is in. He gets everything off his mind except mosquitoes, and that is the first requisite of a complete cure. Let such an overworked man or woman fight mosquitoes for two or three weeks, except at night when he ought to sleep under a mosquito bar, and he will go home a new man and will have to be introduced to the troubles he left when he went on his outing. Let two men similarly afflicted go to the same resort. 
and let one take all the mosquito degrees, and let them bite him all the time, and let the other live under a mosquito bar, and the one who has fought the insects will go home fat and hearty, a new man, while the other will go back languid, sick, and with no benefit derived from his outing. The mosquito is an instrument in the hands of Providence to cure the sick. It is said by some that Jenner was the first to discover the benefit of vaccination, but the mosquito discovered it before Jenner was born. The bite or sting of the mosquito is vaccination against malaria. Let two men go into the swamps together, one without any guard against the bites of the insects, and the other covered with netting, so a mosquito couldn't get a bite out of him under any circumstances, and the man who is well bitten comes out of the swamps a healthy man, while the man who is not thus vaccinated will have chills and fever, and will be laid up with malarial fever for months, and he will lay his sickness to the water he drank. He has simply prevented nature from applying the remedy through the mosquito. The mosquito has never been thoroughly understood, except by the Indians. They let the insects work on them, and never drive them off, and no one has ever heard of an Indian being sick of malaria until civilization brought whiskey and mosquito bars to the reservation. The Filipinos never cease to wonder at our soldiers, arming themselves with mosquito bars, and if peace ever comes to us, they will tell us that it was not our short-range guns against their long-range guns that caused us to fall and to die, so much as the disease we courted by not allowing the mosquito to do the fair thing by us in puncturing our tires for malaria and fever. When the mosquito is better known, we shall propagate them instead of killing them, and we will seek the places where they are most plenty. Why they did not enlist. Two young men, who had halfway agreed that they would enlist to fight in the Philippines, and had agreed to meet and talk it over before going to the recruiting officer, met at the appointed time, and neither of them looked enthusiastic over the prospect of becoming a soldier in a far-off country. They looked at each other, and laughed a half-hearted laugh, and finally, "'It's all off with me,' said John. "'I throw up my hands and stay home,' said Jim. "'What soured you on war?' asked John. "'Well, I'll tell you,' said Jim, as he sat down in a chair in front of a hotel, in sight of the recruiting office. "'I have been reading what the boys say, who have come back from the Philippines, about the climate, the people, and the service. If some country should make war on the United States, nobody could keep me out.' but this sawed-off war does not seem to appeal to me, and I would only go as an adventure, same as a boy goes on a tramp when he runs away from home. I have lived in Wisconsin all my life, and enjoy the climate and the people. They all seem to be my kind. The people here are good, square stuff, and they would not stab a man in the back. I don't think you can find a man in Wisconsin who would use a flag of truce to decoy soldiers in range of guns, and then shoot them down? Our people are great big fellows, with souls in them, who, if they fight, fight fair, and honor a foe, if the foe fights square. These Filipinos are tricky little things, brave enough when in a bunch, but when their lines are broken, they run like rabbits, and shooting them is a good deal like pot-hunting, the boys say. It almost seems as though they should be protected in the breeding season, the way we protect game. I'm not mad enough at them to deliberately go 8,000 miles to flush them in the bushes like quails and shoot them in the back as they cackle and try to get away to cover, like prairie chickens. I would feel as ashamed to kill them as I would to fire birdshot into a flock of little children, dressed up as brownies and playing on the lawn. I have got accustomed to breathe pure air at all seasons here, and to look at the fields and the woods fills me with joy. I know there is health in every breath and happiness in every home. The mothers here are not black and soiled and full of the devil, ready to poison you if you accept their hospitalities 
as they are in the far-off country we are fighting. The girls here are white, and good and glorious, each one a queen, while out there the girls are like dirty bronze, smoking tobacco that is too vile to sell, with eyes that seem filled with love one moment, and weapons of hate and treachery the next. Here you can sleep in a bed, and sleep. There you lie in the mud, and don't sleep. Here you couldn't find a flea or a snake with a search warrant, and the mosquitoes are decent, and let you know by their song when they are due to bite. There the mosquitoes do not sing, but sneak on you, and bite, or hold on like bulldogs, and poison you for pure, unadulterated meanness when they do not want your blood in their business, while fleas form marching clubs and go up and down you just to keep you awake, and snakes lay for you, centipedes get into your blankets, scorpions crawl into your ears, and tarantulas get into your wet and mildewed shoes and poison you when you put them on. The food here is pure and makes you strong and manly and able to work. The food there is largely fruit that makes you sick and pale and bloodless, and the meat you get would cause a dog to have rabies. The diseases there are numerous and fatal, and a soldier looks like a corpse that has been buried long enough to become mildewed and grow two-inch-long whiskers and then come to life and try to make people believe it was a mistake about his being dead. The sun is so hot that it makes the brain boil and bubble like the paint pots in the Yellowstone Park, and the rain gets to falling and forgets to sop, and you may go six months without dry clothes. One cannot feel that he is a man under such circumstances, and he gets so he wants to kill off the whole population and come home and do nothing but breathe for a month and get the bad air and malaria out of his system. These are the things I have thought over, and they are my reasons for fighting shy of the present war. What was the reason you flunked on going to the Philippines, John? Jerusalem, Jim! but you have repeated exactly what I have thought over for a week, and which got me to decide that I would shoot rabbits here at home this season, instead of Filipinos on the gallop, said John. But what soured me the worst was something I read in a paper yesterday. Here it is, and John read the following. Assistant Secretary Michael John now has under consideration several devices for identifying soldiers who have been killed in battle. The most practicable scheme yet submitted is to furnish all regiments with medallions about the size of a half dollar, made of a combination of metals, of which a large part is aluminum. The regimental and company designation will be on one side, and the medals will be numbered consecutively, and each man's number placed opposite his name on the muster rolls. These tags will be suspended about the neck, with a ribbon or a strong piece of twine. The object in tagging the soldiers will be to afford easy means of identifying those wounded, killed in action, or who die in the hospitals. The inscription on the tag can be scratched upon a rude headboard when a soldier is buried on a field of battle and the device buried with him, making identification almost certain. The large number of unidentified dead in the Spanish War has caused the department some concern, and it is to prevent a recurrence of this in the Philippines with the new volunteer regiments that the subject is now taken up. There, said John, as he folded up the paper and put it in his vest pocket. That was the crusher that knocked all the patriotism out of me. I had never thought of being killed and having to be identified by a tag. My idea had been to kill up a lot of Filipinos, just enough for a mess. But when I came to realize the trouble our great and good government was having to identify the boys who got it in the neck, and the chances of being buried as the wrong fellow, and I read about this dog license tag business, and thought how the chances were that if I was killed, the little monkey who killed me would steal my tag and give it to his girl for a souvenir bangle to wear on her bare ankles. I just thought the government could worry along without me. 
My, but isn't that a cold-blooded proposition, that tag business? If a soldier had one on, worn around his neck, he wouldn't be able to think of anything else, and war would have terrors that are new. The soldier would feel as though he was wearing his coffin plate all the time, and it would take the tuck out of him. The unknown grave business is too much for John. End of section 12. Recording by Melora. Section 13 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sultan Drowns Wives A dispatch from Constantinople says the Sultan drowned four of his wives one day last week in the Bosphorus for intriguing with a young Turk party. We don't know exactly what intriguing with a young Turk party is, but probably it is a good deal like flirting here in the States. When an old man's wife here in this country gets to intriguing with some young American party, the old man does not have any such snap as the sultan does. He has to grin and bear it, and scold, and eventually get a gun and go gunning for the young American party, and as often as not the young party gets the drop on the old man, kills him, gets off on the ground of self-defense, and goes on intriguing as though nothing had happened. But the sultan does not have to worry about these little matters. He rounds up a few hundred wives and looks at them, and if one of them has her lips chapped as though she had been intriguing, he gives her a look that cuts a hole in her, and if she blushes, he has her stand aside, and when he gets enough for a fair-sized boatload, he orders a trusty eunuch to load them in a skiff coil some lead pipe around them, run the boat out of his private chapel into the stream, and throw them overboard, and all that there is to show for it is some bubbles on the water, which soon disappear, and then the eunuchs dive for the lead pipe and sell it for junk. Most people will complain and make sarcastic remarks about a sultan that has the power and takes pleasure in drowning his wives but they should remember that he has to maintain discipline in his domestic army, or he would not be the commander. How many men living in other states than Wisconsin have seen the time they would like to drown one wife because she intrigued, but it being unlawful to do so, he has had to live with her until some epidemic came. The sultan is probably a bad man. Nobody seems to doubt that, but who wouldn't be with a thousand or fifteen hundred wives with different dispositions and a thousand young Turks around the house making eyes at them and taking them out boat riding and playing lawn tennis? No husband can watch fifteen hundred wives the way they ought to be watched. No husband can have more than a calling acquaintance with so many wives, and when he is engaged in the affairs of state, it is not strange that these young devils get to flirting with them. Probably the only way to keep peace in the family is to drown a few wives every day, and it seems as though more charity should be shown to the sultan. He certainly has troubles of his own, and if drowning is the method of relieving him, it shows an advancement in the civilization of Turkey, as in former years they used to kill them with a scimitar and get blood on the carpet. There is nothing much better than water if used in moderation. How Uncle Charlie Made an Apple Pie A year or two ago at a shooting club in this state, there were half a dozen of the best fellows in the world putting in a week with the ducks, doing their own cooking and having more fun with each other than ever was enjoyed by a party anywhere else on earth. There was the professor, who is authority on everything that grows or swims or flies, the landlord, who knows how everything ought to be cooked, but couldn't boil water alone without scorching it, the veteran, who has a wooden leg that he can kick with or walk a match with and keep up with the boys in any sport there is going, the editor, 
who will praise anybody's cooking as long as he does not have to do anything but wipe the dishes, and who will sit up till after midnight drinking strong coffee and eating sinkers, and then tells in the morning about being broke of his rest by ducks quacking out in the lake all night. The doctor, who takes along no medicine except a pious example and a package of sedlitz powders, and the two uncles, Uncle John, who can make a johnny cake with his eyes shut that will make the consumer glad he is alive, and Uncle Charlie, who has traveled the world over and can tell about it when the boys get him started. The crowd were sitting around on the lawn one afternoon in early autumn, watching the apples fall off the trees in the orchard, and speculating on who should cook supper, and what it should be, when Uncle Charlie came along with a pan of apples and said, Boys, I am going to make an apple pie for supper. If lightning had struck the smokehouse, the consternation and astonishment could not have been greater. They had eaten everything that had been furnished them by the amateur cooks and had not kicked, but this seemed to be too much. Of course they wanted pie, but whether Uncle Charlie was equal to making an apple pie was unknown. But they knew that if he started out to make a pie, he would make one, and they would have to eat it, as he was a sensitive man who would not like to see his pie untouched. The professor was appointed to go in the kitchen and see if Uncle Charlie was really bent on committing apple pie, with instructions to reason with him and try to dissuade him from so hellish an act. The professor soon returned with the sad news that Uncle Charlie had got an apron on and was already butchering the apples and could not be reasoned with. Some thought they had arrived at a point in the history of the club where an amateur apple pie would shake the organization to its foundation, and it was decided that all should go in the kitchen and watch the proceedings and give Uncle Charlie the benefit of any advice they might think of and render him a helping hand. They found him with a pan of flour and a lot of butter, lard, baking powder, eggs, milk, and a rolling pin, and a board to roll the crust out on. Flour was scattered all over the table. He had dropped an egg on the floor and tried to sweep it out of the door with a broom, and he had baking powder in his hair. The watchers sat around the room as solemn as though they were bearers at a funeral, and one suggested that Uncle Charlie wash his hands before he went any further, which he finally consented to do in the interest of harmony. Then he mixed the dough in the pan and began to try to roll it out, but it seemed to bound like a rubber ball, and he had difficulty in flattening it out. The doctor said that if Uncle Charlie would sit on it a little while, it would take the wind out of it, and the landlord suggested that it be run through a clothes wringer. The dough stuck to the rolling pin and curled up like a sled runner, and Uncle John told him to grease the rolling pin, and he said maybe that would be a good idea, and he greased it. The professor said he liked a pie with a nice flaky crust, and the veteran said he would probably get it if Uncle Charlie ever got the wind pudding scraped off the rolling pin, and suggested pulling it off with a corkscrew. The boys finally all got up and stood around the table and gave advice. The veteran said he would grab hold of one end of the dough and stretch it out, and when it come off the rolling pin, all could take hold of an edge of it and stretch it out. And then Uncle Charlie could take a flat iron and maul it down flat, and they could get it into the bottom of the pie plate and hold it till the instigator of the pie got the apples on, and then it could not get away and he could take his time shingling the roof of it with another crust. Uncle Charlie finally got the dough rolled out so it wasn't more than a couple of inches thick, and he said it beat all how contrary that dough was. He said he never exactly made a pie himself, but he had seen it done so many times he knew he could make one, but he was sure the flour was bad. The doctor suggested that he bake the crust separate, and let each one put in the apples to his taste when it came to the table. But Uncle Charlie said that that would be a shortcake and not a pie. 
and when he started in to make a pie, he didn't make shortcake. The doctor suggested that he put some quinine pills in the apples, or something that would be a preventative against any epidemic. But Uncle Charlie kept on rolling, and said if anybody didn't like his pie, they could let it alone. Finally, he got the crust down to an inch thick and put it in the pie tin and ironed it down with a flat iron and put the apples in, and after a while he got an upper crust that looked like a section of bed quilt lined with cotton and plastered it on top of the apples, and it was ready for the oven. Uncle John wanted to know if he was not going to scallop the edge of the crust, but Uncle Charlie said this was only an everyday pie and he should not scallop the edges, but if they were having company, he would put on a little style with his pie. The fire had gone out, but the pie was got into the oven, and a roaring fire was built, and a sigh of relief was noticed when the pie was out of sight. Uncle Charlie had an air of a conqueror as he began to clean up the room, and he said, You fellows that cook meat and potatoes and eggs are just common dubs, and don't class with a pastry cook. The landlord got the boys out on the lawn, and told them that that was going to be the condemnest pie that ever was, and he would have to be excused from eating any of it, for his stomach was not as strong as it used to be. Besides, he had seen the ashes off Uncle Charlie's pipe sift into the apples. The other boy said the landlord would have to eat his share of the pie or leave camp, and that when men were out together, each should stand his share of suffering and hardships. It was then decided that all should drink a strong whiskey toddy to brace them up for the ordeal, and so they filled their glasses and drank to the toast, Here's to Uncle Charlie's pie, and may the Lord have mercy on us. The editor got on his wheel and said that he was going for a ride, but the boys could see that he had a scheme for being absent when the critical time came, and he was arrested and his wheel locked up until the ordeal was over. Each of the boys opened the oven occasionally to see how the pie was coming on. In one moment it would be swelled up to fill half the oven and seemed to be boiling and steaming and then again it would seem to be sinking down into the bottom of the tin. The dinner was cooked, and all sat down to the table, Uncle Charlie keeping watch of his pie, and when the proper time came he took it out of the oven with the tongs and dropped it on the table with a dull thud, and the boys looked at it. The pie had simmered down about even with a plate, and the top crust looked like building paper with great warts on. The professor said if Uncle Charlie would run a lawnmower over the top and cut off the warts, it would help the looks of the pie. But he said, you never mind the warts. It was decided that the doctor should perform the operation of cutting the pie. But he said he had no instruments with him. But the landlord handed him a butcher's knife, and he attempted to carve the crust. But the knife would make no impression on the roof of the pie. "'What's the matter with a hatchet?' said the editor, as he pounded on the crust with the head of a hatchet, which bounded off. And then he suggested that the pie would be a good backstop for a baseball field. The doctor, who had performed many an operation, said this was the toughest proposition he had ever gone up against, and he handed the pie to the man who made it and said he gave up. Uncle Charlie took it over to his place on the table, and said it was easy enough to cut a pie if he knew how. And he slipped a case knife under the upper crust and pried off a little piece, which broke with a snap, flew across the table, and struck the veteran under the eye. And he said, What are you throwing pieces of slate at me for? You will put a man's eye out if you are not careful. The editor said he had a suggestion to make, though he did not care to mix in anybody else's pie. He suggested that they turn the pie over on its face and take a can opener and cut through the plate and bottom crust and fish out some of the apples with a cleaning rod with a wormer on. Uncle Charlie said he knew what was the matter. It was because the pie was too hot. He said, you take that pie and let it get cold and you can do anything with it. But he said you would have to work it from the top and sink a shaft down the center 
as he now remembered that he had not greased the plate, and it would never come off the pie tin. So they set the pie away in the pantry, and it got cold and seemed harder each day, and the boys would go into the pantry occasionally all the fall and take off their hats and pay their respects to Uncle Charlie's pie. Occasionally they would bring it out when unexpected company arrived and ask them if they would try a piece of the apple pie, and when a guest tried to cut out a piece, the boys would all look out the window, and after the guest had dulled his knife and said he guessed he didn't care for any pie, someone would hand him a whetstone, but no one ever got a mouthful of the pie. It was left out where the dog could get it, but it was safe. As the snow began to fall and the season was closing, one night the boys solemnly took the pie out on to the Indian mound near the clubhouse and buried it with the pie tin for a hermetically sealed coffin and placed a board at the head of the grave on which was the inscription, Here lies buried Uncle Charlie's apple pie. We shall never see its like again. And now, when somebody at the club suggests that they have pie for dinner, all hold up their hands in horror and say, Never more! Never more! End of section 13 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 14 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Chaplain and the Bull An item in an Eau Claire paper speaks of the Rev. Joseph Moran, a preacher of that city, being out on a trout-fishing expedition, and the few words therein bring a train of thought in regard to the reverend gentleman that causes a smile to come and a tear to chase away the smile. Some years ago the writer was at Camp Douglas officially, at the time the 1st Wisconsin Regiment was in camp, and among the frequent visitors to headquarters was the chaplain, this Reverend Moran, a great big fellow, like John L. Sullivan, with a heart in him as tender as that of Helen Gould. On duty as chaplain, he was a meek and humble follower of the lowly Savior, preaching words that carried conviction to the hearts of the soldier boys, and made them love him like a brother. Off-duty he was a great, good-natured boy, with a laugh that would echo from rock to rock like a note from a bugle-horn. He would play any game with the boys, and when there was no preaching or playing to be done, he would go off fishing the brooks that run through the meadows and woods for trout. He went out one day to fish, and remained to pray, and never got back to camp until it was too dark for anybody to see the condition his clothes were in. The chaplain was quietly fishing in a field when suddenly he heard a noise that caused his hair to raise up his hat about eight inches, and being a farmer's boy, he would not mistake the voice of an infuriated bull that was coming towards him at a double quick. Moran took in the situation without difficulty and started for a tree. He would have preferred a nice smooth birch tree, but the only tree near was a shagbark hickory the roughest tree to climb, either up or down, that has ever been made. He got to the tree ahead of the bull, but not enough ahead to brag about, and he never did brag about it. The tree was small, and when he had got up above the bull, the tree would bend over, a mere sapling, in fact. The bull was angered at the escape of the chaplain, and pawed the turf and bellowed, but the bull was not as mad as the chaplain was. The whole front of the chaplain's clothes were torn from the loose bark of the tree, but he did not complain as long as the back part had not been torn by the bull. It was a trying situation for three hours. The bull would look up at him and bellow, and Moran would look down at the bull and talk Latin. The bull would rub against the tree, and it would seem as though it would go over, and then he would suddenly get away from it, and the tree would fly back and almost throw the pious rider off. The bull even laid down under the tree to chew his cud, and when he got asleep the chaplain would try to get down and make a run for it, but the noise the tearing clothes would make on the hickory bark 
would wake the bull, and he would snort and get up and paw the ground. It was after sundown when the bull started off, looking for the farmhouse, and after Moran had seen the animal disappear through the jack pines, he got down with what clothes he could save, and the way he pulled out for camp no bull on earth could have caught him, and he arrived safely among his boys in time for a late supper. The next morning he borrowed a Springfield musket and disappeared into the woods to the north of the camp, and those who saw him wondered what was the trouble. An hour later, when all was still, a shot was heard away off in the distance, a mile away, and a few, who knew of the chaplain's terrible experience, looked at each other and said, It is all over. An hour later the chaplain returned with his gun and hung it up on the tent pole, and no one who knew him would ask what had happened to the bull. But the next morning a farmer with a wide hat, whiskers like a bale of hay, and trousers that were uncreased, came to the colonel and complained that one of them dumbed recruits had shot one of his cows. A purse was quietly made up, and the farmer was paid, and to this day it is probable the chaplain thinks he killed that bull that held sweet converse with him all that hot afternoon that he was in the hickory tree. Abolishing the School Recess Sometimes it looks as though the school officials were overdoing the thing in trying to make the schools of the present day as different as possible from the old schools, where the fathers and the grandfathers got their education. The last improvement that is suggested by school boards in some places is to do away with the recess in the middle of the forenoon and the middle of the afternoon, thus compelling the scholars to stay in the heated schoolroom from nine o'clock in the morning until noon, and all the afternoon, without a minute of rest. If the abolition of the recess does not raise up a race of people with nervous headaches, it will be a miracle. The old recess. Good gracious, it was the recess that kept the boys and the girls from dying in their tracks. Did you ever sit in a country school and see the scholars studying and mumbling and reciting? with their foreheads wrinkled, their eyes strained, the perspiration in large drips on their foreheads, and an air of depression all over the room. Presently the eyes turn to the old clock on the wall back of the teacher, and there is a faint smile on every face, as it is noticed that in five minutes it will be half-past ten, but each face looks as though it would be a week at least before that minute hand would get around to the mark and as it moved along like a snail, it would be seen that all were holding their breath and watching the teacher. Would she see the clock, or would she be so busy she would forget the important event? It is half-past ten, and she makes no move, and seems to be deaf and dumb, or immersed in some problem in the book before her. It is a minute after the time, and all eyes are on the clock, Steady has ceased entirely, and each scholar acts as though he or she would live just one minute more, and if the bell did not ring, they would scream. The teacher seems dead to the world, until some boy, who will have cramps if this thing keeps up, jumps up and says, Please, teacher, may I go out? The teacher comes to life and says, Can't you wait till recess? and the boy says he didn't know as they were going to have any recess today, and then the teacher looks at the clock, says, Excuse me, rings the bell, and there is a rush for the door, and two minutes of the most valuable time has been wasted. There is no class of people on earth that can do more different kinds of things in fifteen minutes than scholars can during a recess. The first thing to do is to whoop and yell, to clear the lungs, and then some wrestle, others play marbles, climb trees, and walk in the shade, or run in the sun, and get over the ground, as though a new world has got to be made in that short fifteen minutes. And while they are playing, the teacher, who has stolen two minutes of the children's time, will come out and watch them, and be sure to let the recess last the full time. And when it is over, each scholar wants to be the last to come in, 
as he wanted to be the first to go out. Ah, how many friendships that last through life are made at the school recess! The pretty girl is surrounded by her admirers, as she will be in society years later, and the boy who can be her acknowledged lover is the happiest boy in school, while the girls who are not so pretty get as jealous of the favorite as they will when they grow up and are rivals for the hands of the grown-up boys. The bullies of the school will get together behind the schoolhouse and talk fight and plan campaigns of slaughter that are never carried out. And when they go back to the study room, it is easy to study, where it was so hard before the recess. What can be the matter of these school officials that would cut off the recess? Have they been disappointed in love? or were they never boys themselves? The recess in school is like the sherbet served in the middle of a banquet. It aids the digestion like the blanched almonds and the celery and the olives. If the banqueters sat and ate of the solids all an evening and never had the rest that comes with the etc., he would die of apoplexy before the speaking began. If the scholar studies all the time, until his head whirls, his brain will become clogged, and some day he will have one long recess at a lunatic asylum, where he will yell for all time, and the smart aleck who has cut off the recess will be to blame for the whole business. Don't try to put on any frills to the old schoolhouse system of education. As well try to run a steam engine without any safety valve as to run a school without a recess and have an explosion that will blow fool school commissioners and overworked children higher than a kite. When you stop the recess, you might as well seal up the brain and put it in a bottle of alcohol. The boy and the girl have got to have a time to cut the string that holds the cork down and let the wolf howl. The Turkish Bath at Home the sun desires, at all times, to do all in its power to foster and encourage new enterprises, but it can see many instances where a new invention, or a new style, or a new business is overdone, and in many new inventions it can see how people are taking too many chances before the new invention has been properly tested and its dangers understood. The sun is brought to these solemn reflections by noticing so many advertisements of these new rubber Turkish bath cabinets in the magazines, which is utilizing the old-fashioned whiskey sweat by which people were supposed to be cured of colds by putting whiskey in a suitable vessel under a cane seat chair, compelling the patient to sit on the chair with a blanket over him and touching a match to the whiskey. One of the most eminent men of our state almost became a burnt offering a quarter of a century ago by the conflagration of half a pint of whiskey, and it is said he has not entirely recovered his presence of mind yet. These pictures of the new rubber baths represent women in all stages of nakedness, sitting in the bath cabinets, perspiring beautifully, and an expression on their faces of a burning desire to get well. The sun is no alarmist, but it can see that a tragedy is liable to be enacted some day that will be a burning disgrace, and some good woman is going to discover that burning alcohol under a cane seat chair is unreliable and far-reaching in its intensity of heat. These baths are being introduced into many families, and they may be all right if they do not go off half-cocked when the sitter in the chair does not know they are loaded. Fire is a good servant, but a bad master, as is well known, and some day we expect to hear a still, small voice coming out of a second-story window, yelling murder and fire, and the policeman who answers the call, or the firemen who rush in with a babcock extinguisher and an axe, are going to be shocked and may be driven downstairs with the broom after the fire has been extinguished. No one need be astonished any day to see a frightened woman with few clothes rushing down the street, 
covered with one of these rubber bath cabinets, yelling all kinds of murder, and looking for an ice wagon, her white bare feet sticking out of the bottom of the black envelope about nine inches, including an ankle or two, and her face and neck sticking out of the top, the face looking like one of these agonized pictures of before taking, and a prolonged yell splitting the air, caused by the burning sensation that a newly launched vessel feels when, as the poet says, she lives, she moves, she seems to feel the thrill of life along her keel. Artists who have spent a lifetime painting pictures of women without wearing apparel, for galleries in which the visitor has to look through smoked glass at the pictures to keep from having nervous prostration, assert that woman is never so beautiful as when coming from her bath, with a flush upon her cheek, the mild light in her eye, and the elastic step of youth. But if she emerges from her bathroom with one of these rubber baths attached to her person, and a blue flame coming from the cabinet, and an odor of burning rubber and curled hair, trying to gallop fast, she is not going to appear beautiful. Ordinarily, a dog respects and loves a woman, but if a dog met her in that fix, he would be justified in barking, chasing her, and grabbing the rubber bath in his teeth, and then there would be more trouble. Woman is a trusting creature. She often believes what a man tells her in love affairs, and it would not be strange if she had believed what the man who sold her a rubber bath cabinet had said when she asked him if there was any danger of the lamp under the chair blazing up like a skyrocket at a critical time. But when men have anything to sell, they are often optimistic. A woman can have no redress if she goes down to a store where she has bought a bath cabinet, limping and sad. If she tells the man the thing blazed up and injured her reputation, he will tell her that there must be some mistake and that he does not believe her. In that case, how is she going to demonstrate that she is the injured party? The only redress is to have a husband or brother to commit assault and battery on the man who sold the hot proposition to his wife or sister, and then he may have to pay a fine that will cost more than the original investment. However, all the son desires to do is to prepare the people for the inevitable that they may not be scared if called to a neighbor's house at any time to put out a fire that will try all their nerve, and to show men that if such an apparition as described earlier in this article appears to them on the street, with a warm woman in it, they should not jump over a fence and run away, but throw their overcoat over her and the cabinet, sit down on both, put them out, and signal an ice wagon or a sprinkling cart. Women have troubles enough without deliberately dwelling over a lighted alcohol lamp with no fire insurance. End of section 14. Recording by Melora. Section 15 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. FREE POSTAL DELIVERY TO FARMERS The free rural delivery of mail by the government, by which a letter carrier in gray uniform, perhaps mounted on a wheel, visits all farmhouses in his district, and delivers circulars issued by business houses, the religious papers that all truly good farmers subscribe for, or sign for, and occasionally a letter to the girl of the household, or a letter from an old acquaintance back at the old home, containing a recipe to make currant jelly, so it would gel, is going to take away from the farmer of the extreme rural districts half the fun of life. The best excuse a farmer ever had to go to town will be gone, and the farmer's boy and girl, who have gone to the post office after the mail, ever since they were big enough, will have to stay at home and work and wait for the mail carrier. It is not probable that the farmers ever asked for this expensive service at the hands of a just government, 
but it is more probable that some congressman thought he would work the farmer vote by seeming to be looking out for the interest of the tiller of the soil. In one locality, where the free rural delivery was tried, the curiosity was so great that when the carrier arrived at a house, the farmer left his work in the field and went to the house to see what the carrier fetched. The hired man left his team hitched to a fence and went to the house, while the boys, who were haying, turned the horses loose and went to see about it, and a girl who was teaching school half a mile away dismissed her school and got to the house in time to meet the carrier coming up the lane. While the hired man held the dog that wanted to make a Thanksgiving dinner off the gray uniform, the carrier sat down on the porch, wiped the perspiration off his forehead, the old lady came out of the kitchen, the hired girl came around the side of the house, and after impatiently listening to the latest news of the war in the Philippines, as the carrier told it, he reached into his sack and drew out a copy of the Christian Advocate and a pamphlet giving some harrowing details of the cure of some persons who had liver complaint and who had at an opportune moment bought some liver pills. The farmer looked at the newspaper a moment, the good wife looked at the pictures of those cured of liver complaint to see if anyone she knew had their picture in the pamphlet. The hired girl threw a warm glance at the carrier, picked up an armful of wood and went into the kitchen to resume her rotary motion with the clothes wringer. And all went about their business as the carrier was rested and ready to move on, while the dog followed him down the road for a distance barking a warning against future official visits. The farmer, the boy, the hired man, and the girl were all disappointed, because each had decided to go to town after supper after the mail, and now there was no excuse. This rural delivery will be harder on the farmer than on anybody else, because going after the mail has been his outing, his opportunity to meet his friends at the post office and in the grocery, to talk over the affairs of the neighborhood and settle the affairs that worry the president. It was while getting the mail that the farmer learned of the sickness around about, as he would meet the doc at the post office, and be told who was going to die and who ought to pull through. He would learn, while after the mail, who was talked of for sheriff, and who had said he would run for the legislature if they wanted him. It was while after the mail that an occasional farmer would sit down to a few games of seven-up, while his horse that had worked all day was standing at a post, wondering if the old man would ever go home, and if he took the smallest glass of beer or a swallow of bitters, everybody at home knew it when he got out of the old rattling buggy and went in the house, because the odor of budge would fill the house and fight for mastery with the odor of fried pork in the kitchen. The farmer went to town before this rural delivery to learn what was going on from the other fellows that came from other farms, and all talked with the drummer who sat on the tavern porch or on a barrel in the grocery, and all were better for the information they got by rubbing up against the little world of the village. Now the carrier must combine all the gossiping qualities of all the people the farmer formerly met, and he must have time on his hands to tell it all at each house he visits, or he can never take the place of the trip to town after the mail. The government may have thought the farmer needed more time to work, and has thus stepped in to keep him on the farm, except on election day but unless some excuse just as good as going after the mail is discovered, the farmer will feel that he is swindled out of half the fun of farming. The hired man will strike, the hired girl will kick unless the letter carrier is susceptible, and everything will go wrong. The farmer could go to the lodge for an excuse only in summer when he wants to go to town. The lodges do not have sessions. The sun looks for the withdrawal of rural mail carriers before the next spring. The Barefooted Farmer Boy 
A farmer's boy writes the son from his home in the interior as follows. Is it any disgrace for a 14-year-old boy to go barefooted on the farm or when he rides a plow horse into town to have a plow point repaired? What makes me ask is that people at the summer resorts near our farm, when they drive along the road and see me barefooted, stop the horses and have fun with me and seem to enjoy looking at my tracks in the road. And when I go to the village where they spend the summer playing tennis and golf, they surround me on the main street and look at my bare feet and legs as though I were a freak from a sideshow. One young fellow with a girl said that if he was in my place, he would paint his legs a nice warm color and have a nice red dado where my trouser legs leave off. They make me more tired than hoeing corn. Well, don't let the chaffing you receive from the people who wear canvas shoes worry you. They don't mean any harm or disrespect. They are out for fun and can afford to have fun, and to them you are a part of the show. If their fathers were with them, the fathers would shut them up mighty quick. Very likely the fathers of every one of those young people who are so rich now never wore a shoe in summer before they were twenty years old. Nearly all of the rich men of the cities were brought up on farms, and they would like nothing better than to go to your farm, take off their shoes, and go around barefooted and help you hoe corn if they could do so without being caught at it by their society friends. The leading men of this country have large feet that they got by going barefooted. Lincoln's feet were so big that he was always joking about them, and he went barefooted and pawed up the soil of Illinois and Kentucky with his toenails. If anybody could find a petrified, barefooted track of old Abe down in Sangamon County nowadays, the person who found it would become rich, and the people of the whole country would worship that track, and it would be framed in gold and deposited in a safety deposit vault. Grant didn't have any shoes when he was a boy, and he has worked on a farm and rode a horse to plow corn, and his trousers were clear up to his knees, and yet if these boys that make fun of you could own those old trousers Grant wore when he was a boy, they would not part with them for a fortune. Garfield's barefooted tracks on the towpath of the canal where he led the mules to haul the boats, if they could be found now, would sell for more than the canal. Phil Armour used to go barefooted to school, and he has got one toenail that is a total wreck from the stroke of a hoe when he was digging potatoes barefooted on the old home farm and he is as proud of that demoralized toenail as he is of a packing house. Marshall Field can today go out on a farm barefooted and beat lots of you boys hoeing corn, and he could ride a horse to plow corn and never let the plow touch a hill or let the hungry horse bite a blade of the new corn because he would rest his toes on the tugs of the harness and keep his heels kicking the old horse all the time and he would be happier than he is in his big store, and hungrier when the horn blew for dinner than he is now when the lunch hour comes and he has to eat soup because solid food hurts him. McKinley could leave the White House and go out on a farm in haying time with a hickory shirt on and an old straw hat, and he could take a scythe and mow a swath and make any farmer hustle to keep up with him. Brian would like nothing better than to forget for a few days that there is any such thing as money, good, bad, or indifferent, and go to a farm where barefooted boys were plenty, take off his boots, throw the lines over his shoulder, and with a span of good horses plow a ten-acre lot, and every furrow would be as straight as the life he has led, and every inch of the soil would be plowed to the same depth, honestly, and the chances are more than sixteen to one that if there was a boiled dinner when the boys went to the house, he wouldn't do a thing to it, and he would enjoy it better than he does these banquets at ten dollars a plate. And before he went to dinner, he would haul up a bucket of water with the old windlass and tip it up on the well curb and drink half of it and let the water drip from his face down onto his flannel shirt 
open at the collar, down onto his bare feet, and his eyes would sparkle after the drink. And you boys would say he was one of the grandest partners boys ever had on a farm. Some day, when the sun gets rich, it will have a farm just to invite the distinguished men that were farmers' boys to come out and visit with each other and take off their boots and put on hickory shirts and run wild and have fun with each other and mingle with the barefooted boys of the present generation to show them that there is no disgrace in going barefooted on the farm if an occasional person who ought to know better does have fun with them. So, boys, you go right on, barefooted. Let the green grass color your legs and the tickle grass crawl up your trousers leg. Follow the woodchuck dog when you have time. Never mind the patches. And when these boys who make fun of you are dying from smoking cigarettes, you can go to the cities with strength, nerve, and good health and take their places in the business world and wear big shoes made of yellow leather. Don't you worry. THE DRUMMER AND THE FARMER Occasionally a few old drummers who have been on the road for a quarter of a century and have been laid off owing to the formation of trusts or some other epidemic get together and talk over the happy days when they were kings and some of the stories they tell are interesting. One good fellow whose hair has become as white as chalk was telling another of the good times he had enjoyed in the little towns that he had visited for many years, attending sociables and parties, and escorting the girls around, going riding and fishing, boating in the summer, and sleighing in the winter. And he said if he never had another bit of fun in his life, there was nothing coming to him, as he had enjoyed all the pleasures any one man ought to have in a lifetime. And he only regretted that it was over. Another told of meeting the girl that afterwards became his wife, away out in Iowa, when she came into a grocery one day with a sunbonnet on and bought some pancake flour while he was selling goods to the grocer. He said he bruised his thumb and was trying to wind a rag around it with the other hand when the girl looked on for a moment and he was so awkward that she came up and offered to help fix up the thumb. He said she was so nice that he accepted her offer, and then she tore a piece off her apron and made him go with her to an old tin wash basin where she washed the thumb and then wound the piece of apron around it and said, There, I guess you will do till you get home. And she took her pancake flour and went home. He said on his next trip, which was a long month after, he carried a new apron his sister had bought for him in a sample case to give her, and he got the grocer to wash his hands and put on a linen duster and go with him to the house of the country girl so he might thank her. She was making strawberry shortcake and came in with flour on her hands and strawberry juice on her lips and chin, and he said he died right there, and before a year he had married her, and they were living in a suburb terribly happy, and he never looked at his busted thumbnail without thanking the Lord for steering him to where he got it hurt. An old fellow, who was smoking a cigar in silence while listening to the boys, was asked where he had enjoyed himself most in his quarter of a century on the road. He flipped the ashes off the cigar with his little finger and said, Boys, I formed a habit about eighteen years ago that has given me more pleasure than anything I can think of. One day, the train was going slowly along out in southern Minnesota and finally came to a stop right in a hayfield where the farmers were leaning on their scythes and rakes looking us over. I had read all the morning papers and had them in my seat when an old farmer who stood near the track with his hat off, wiping his forehead with a red bandana handkerchief, said to me as I sat by the open window, Stranger! what is the news? You know, we don't see any papers out here except the Christian Advocate and the local paper over in town that never has any news. I thought at once how much he would value the papers I had read and was ready to throw away. I called him up and tossed them out the window to him. 
He gave a smile that wrinkled up his good old face, thanked me, and it being lunchtime, the dozen haymakers all gathered around him under a tree, and when the train had fixed up its hot box and moved away, the men were happy. The old man took a two-gallon jug and threw it on his shoulder to take a drink of water and said, Much obliged, friend. You have done us a great favor. And away he went. Well, I got to thinking it over, how much good a traveling man could do by giving the papers he had read to the farmers. And from that day to this, I have just planted newspapers over the farms of the far west. I take a paper and tie a string around it, and if the wind is blowing, I tie a piece of coal inside. And when I get far away from towns and see a farmer at work in a field, I attract his attention and throw the paper towards him. At first, they used to think it was some advertisement and wouldn't pay much attention until the train was nearly out of sight, and then they would go and get the paper. Now they seem to look for me, and when the window of the car goes up and I stick my head out, whoever is in sight starts for the track with a smile and a wave of their old hats, and they fairly devour the papers. I figure that I have planted about a million papers out west where they have done good, and I have got lots of other drummers to do the same. In winter, I throw them off at a road that crosses the track, and in some places they have got to know about what train I am on. Sometimes I take along a lot of picture books that my children have got through with, and when I see a forlorn-looking little child away out on the prairie with a little lunch basket, I throw a mess of the books toward the child and it makes my heart jump to see the child clutch them as though they were gold nuggets. All over the West there are thousands of people who I have become familiar with my hard old face, and if I should show up anywhere now, they would give me the freedom of the towns and farms. I figure that the good I have done that way will give me quite a send-off toward getting to heaven, and I would advise all the young traveling men to never destroy a paper, but throw it to a farmer and see him smile. End of section 15. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Section 16 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wants to be a hero. A boy who is a student in a ward school writes the son that he has read a good deal about heroes lately and is almost convinced that he will be a hero when he grows up. He says that he is retiring and modest, but with a good head of hair, like Hobson. He is a great joker, like Lincoln, and has the dyspepsia, like Dewey. He rides a wheel and wears a negligee shirt, like Tom Reed is short in the legs, like Phil Sheridan, and has a wart on the side of his face, like Grant, and a flow of language and an appetite, like Chauncey Depew, and wants to know if the son could give him any advice as to how to utilize these talents so he may be a world-beater when he grows up. Well, here is a poser. Somebody has been stringing you, boy, to make you believe you are cut out for a hero. You seem to be all right on short legs, warts, dyspepsia, and appetite, as well as a flow of language, but how are you on brain? You have got to get a mess of brain in that combination somewhere, or you never can come in under the wire at the head of the bunch. Your funny business will never make an Abe Lincoln of you if your brain fits in a thimble, your heart in a wine glass, and your soul in the cover of a mustard seed. Lincoln's fun was only an incident, though it did much to keep him and those around him from dying of overwork when trouble was on the country. Phil Sheridan's legs never were much of a factor in his greatness. He was great in spite of his little browny legs, and, being a cavalryman, he didn't need legs much anyway. If he had been in the infantry with those legs, at Bull Run, he would have closed his career right there while well, some duffer with legs like Lincoln's would have carried the news to Washington ahead of the bunch and become a hero. 
It was not Dewey's dyspepsia that kept him awake that night that he sailed into Manila Bay. It was his nerve. You haven't mentioned your nerve, my boy though you display some of it in writing for plans and specifications of making a hero of yourself. Grant never depended much on that wart to get up on the pedestal on a bronze horse, so you better leave the wart out of your repertoire and feel on top of your head to see if there is anything inside that sort of palpitates and bumps when you are running a foot race. If there is, it may be a brain, and you better nurse it and not let it escape through your ears when you go in swimming. Hobson's retiring disposition and good head of hair never made him a sinker or a raiser of vessels or a kisser of girls. It was bravery and nerve concealed about his person which came to the surface at a critical time and made him a hero. If he had gone into the hero business at your age and studied to be one and played to the grandstand, as you are inclined to do early in life, Hobson wouldn't have been selected to sink the ship in the channel. You can't go studying to be a hero and set a date on the calendar at which you are going to arrive at the heroic stage and make it work worth a cent. Heroes are born. You have not said anything about being born. The world is full of boys and men ready to be heroes, and they wonder why they are not realized on by the country. Heroes do not go around admitting that they are such, while people who have not got a heroic hair in their heads try to look like heroes, and they strut about and wonder why they are not found out. Your true hero has heroism thrust upon him when he is not looking, and when the secret that he has guarded so well is out, and he is acknowledged to be a hero, he blushes and perspires, and he may faint away if you do not throw water in his face. Heroes may be spoiled after they become so, but it is better so than to be spoiled trying to be a hero with none of the requisite qualifications. The son's advice to you would be to stop trying to be a hero at your age. Go to studying things that will help you in business, and whether you become a clerk, a merchant, a plumber, or a carpenter, if there is anything in you that sizes up with the stuff that heroes are made of, the world will tap your hero tank at the proper time, and you will get there just the same. Another Deer Murder Case There was a meeting of a woman's club recently to talk over some business matters, and among the members was one athletic young married woman who had made quite a reputation by taking part in all manly sports. She could row a boat, play golf or tennis, land a kicking black bass without any help, ride a century on a wheel, and had been out chicken shooting with her husband, and killed her birds as well as he could. The club was rather proud of her, and when it was announced a month ago that she had taken out a deer license and had gone up into the woods with her husband and a party of friends to shoot deer, the club had the news wired to eastern papers and when she returned and appeared at the club meeting, someone shouted, What's the matter with Mrs.? She's all right. And they gave her the club yell, and she blushed and started to cry. The president of the club said they were all glad to welcome the return of their distinguished member from her deer-shooting expedition, where she no doubt demonstrated to the men that she was their equal in the sports of the field, as well as their superior in the camp by the campfire. She hoped the distinguished member would favor them with a report of her experiences in the great dark woods in killing big game. While the president was talking, the distinguished member of the club was acting as little like an athletic young woman and an all-around sport as possible. She kept her handkerchief to her eyes, and when the president was done speaking, the distinguished member, the deer hunter, got up from her chair, and two big tears rolled down her pink cheeks, and she choked up, but finally she found words to express herself. She said, Ladies, I thank you for your kindly welcome, 
but hope you will never mention again, as long as you live, myself or any other woman in connection with deer shooting. When I think of my experience, I feel as though I had been to a funeral of a dear friend. I thought it would be a lark to go with my husband and shoot big game, and I did enjoy the tramping through the woods and the odor of the pine and the balsam. I enjoyed sleeping on the bed of pine boughs and the cooking over a fire out of doors, and I was benefited until this dreadful thing happened. But I came home with my heart broken. My husband and I were hunting together when we came upon a doe and a fawn about half grown. My husband shot the doe and told me to shoot the fawn, but a mist came into my eyes and I could not see. The fawn ran away, and we started on a run to where the deer had fallen. My husband was ahead of me, and cut the throat of the deer before I could get there, but when I came up the blood was spurting all over, and the deer was bleeding and dying, and when I saw the blood and the struggles of the beast, and my husband, bloody to his elbows, standing there like a murderous devil, laughing at the agony of that beautiful creature, all the love I ever had for him seemed to depart, and he looked to me like one who should be punished by the law, and when the deer breathed its last, I fainted away. I do not know how long I was unconscious, but when I came to my senses, my husband, the man I had loved so, turned away from his work with his knife and said, Ah, oh, you are all right. You will soon get over it. He had hung the deer up by the hind legs on a tree and was taking the skin off and chopping the bones with a hatchet. I turned away, sick at heart. Pretty soon I heard a trembling, bleeding voice in the woods near us, seeming to say, Mama, where are you? Oh, Mama, Mama. It was the little fawn looking for its dead mother that my husband had murdered, and the voice was so pitiful I cried. My husband heard it, and he stopped from his hideous work and said, Now, Nell, get your gun, and I will bleat like the doe, and when the fawn comes out of the woods looking for its mother, you plug it right through the fore shoulder. See? Oh, I could have scolded him. I heard the pitiful bleeding and just had strength enough to look around, when the fawn came out of the bushes, saying, Mama, Mama, wherever are you? And it started to come right to me, and it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw, with eyes like my little girl. My husband spoke cross and said, Why the deuce don't you shoot? And I cried and said I didn't want to, and then he took up his gun and said, Well, say you are the worst I ever did see and he was just taking aim at the fawn when I jumped up and screamed and shook my skirts, and the fawn started away. He was going to shoot it as it ran when I grabbed his gun, and looking him in the eye, and seeming to have the strength of a giant, I threw him back and said, George, if you shoot that baby, I will never live with you another day. And then I fainted again, but the fawn got away. Oh, I cannot say any more about it, but I feel as though I had been mixed up in the most diabolical murder of the century. When the distinguished athlete had ceased speaking, she cried like a baby, and the whole club joined in, and after their noses got over being red, they all felt better. Should Woman Be Eaten? There are several men in Chicago that have been convicted of murdering their wives, and it is proposed to hang them all at once and make a regular society event of it. The pastime of murdering wives has been considerably overdone in Chicago, and it is time an example was made of some of those husbands who have got in this bad habit and are letting the habit grow on them. For years it was considered that divorce was the only proper way to get separated from a wife in that city, but of late there seems to be too much expense attached to divorce and too much publicity, while a man could murder his wife and little would be said about it. 
just plain murder did not seem to attract so much attention, and many a man has borrowed a revolver and freed himself from matrimonial complications at little expense except for a couple of cartridges, more or less, but the sausage butchers spoiled the whole business. When Lutgert adopted the plan of murdering his wife and boiling her body, and possibly making it into summer sausage, there was a method that seemed to appeal to the man of blood, and several who erect sausages have followed his example, until the consumers of sausage have sworn off, and the sausage industry was struck a body blow equal to the embalmed beef trouble. It has been so the last year or two that a man orders sausage with fear and trembling, as no man likes to mix in the domestic affairs of his neighbor. No matter how much a citizen may admire another man's wife, and how much he may feel like eating her when she is alive, when she disappears and it is demonstrated that her husband is a sausage-maker, the admirer does not feel like eating sausage. It is not pleasant to find a hard substance in a piece of sausage, and on investigation find that it is a small piece of gold, the top of a ring, with the words, To Ella from Adolf, engraved on the surface. Most people like to find gold almost anywhere, but one had rather be always poor than to find gold of that kind in sausage. There is no certainty that Lutgert made his wife the basis of a mess of sausage, and if he did, probably not a hundred people all told got a piece of it. But there are at least a million people who firmly believe they helped eat that poor woman. They recall that at some period, about the time of the trouble, they noticed something peculiar about the sausage they ate at a picnic, or on a fishing trip, or at a lunch in a saloon. The truth probably is that if the lady was worked up, as many believe she was, the sausage was shipped to the pineries, where men lack female society, and only enjoy such society during the long winter months, when it is shipped in as food. But this thing has got to cease, this killing of wives in Chicago, whether for pleasure or in the interest of commerce, for the people of the whole country have become so discouraged over the sausage and beef scandals that it would not be surprising to see them boycott the goods, unless the certificate of a health officer accompanies each skinful of sausage and each can of the stuff that made Chicago famous. It should not be necessary to have a public roll call of wives every night and every morning in order that they may be accounted for, but such a method will have to be adopted to reassure the sausage-consuming public if these murders continue. It is best to hang these wife murderers at once, and advertise that such will be the fate of all sausage-makers in the future, and maybe the sausage will again take its place as a food to be relied on as pure. End of section 16. Recording by Melora. Section 17 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE CLERK WHO GETS DRUNK A young man in a country town writes for a list of stores in Milwaukee as he says he is going to apply for a situation as clerk. He says that he has been discharged from the place he has worked for two years because he got full one day and the old crank who employed him got mad, and he says he has got sick of working in a town where they look upon a little drunk as a crime, and he wants to get into Milwaukee, where he has been told they never ask any questions about a man's drinking habits as long as he can do his work. Well, young man, if you come here with any such idea, you will be standing on the corners before long asking passers-by for the price of a meal, and when you get it, you will buy a drink. There is no place where a man can drink if he wants to and not be interfered with as long as he behaves himself easier than in Milwaukee, but the merchants are not looking for men who smell like the front door of a wholesale liquor store, and such a man will be fired as quick in Milwaukee 
as he would be in a temperance town that did not have a saloon in it. Some men get an idea that they can drink a dozen times a day, and by chewing cloves or taking some sort of bromo, nobody will notice it. But the first time that, after the ball smell is detected on a man in a store, you will see the floor walker look wise, and that man is on the suspected list right away, and if he keeps it up, some Saturday night he will get his pay envelope and be told that business is not very rushing and he can lay off, or maybe he can find a better place at some other store, and he goes off indignant and gets his skin fuller than ever over Sunday, and on Monday morning he goes into the store with a soiled collar and cuffs on and has spilled something over his vest and he looks wilted. He just goes in the store to see how they are getting along without him, and he finds the store full of customers, and he goes to the counter where he used to sell goods, and there he finds a bright girl, clean and neat as a pin, cool as ice cream, with dainty hands and sweet face, with a fetching silk shirtwaist with no stale beer on it, buttoned up with gold buttons, with a blue stone in them hair daintily dressed and pushed back from the sweetest forehead that has no whiskey blotches on it, and eyes that twinkle with healthy happiness that does not depend on a morning cocktail, and she is smiling at customers that he used to get mad at when his hair pulled, and he watches her treat diplomatically all the people who are looking for bargains, and they all seem very happy, and the floor walker even has a smile on his face, as he bows to the old clerk, who has a bad taste in his mouth, and looks at the new clerk, who looks as though she had a sweet taste in her mouth, because her teeth are like pearls and her lips are red, while the old clerk's teeth look neglected, and he has a cold sore on his lips, and you can't stand very near him, while you couldn't get near enough to the girl who has taken his place. The old clerk takes his expiring jag out of the store, and buys another drink, and goes out to the bank of the lake, and thinks what a fool he is, and wonders whether he couldn't hire one of the tramps that are asleep down by the track to kick him. He walks about the street, and he is astonished to see the number of idle men who look as though they felt just as he does. He has never thought of it before, but he sees men everywhere that he has known used to hold a good position, but who drank too much, and lost their jobs, and they never do seem to catch on again, though they brace up and try to show that they have quit budging. Merchants have little confidence in their promises, after once they have got the big head, and wouldn't allow anybody to tell them they were injuring themselves by drinking too much. If the young man who has been discharged in the country knows what is good for him, he will not come here looking for a job over a tumbler of red liquor, nor go into a store searching employment smelling like rectified spirits, for even the man who runs a saloon wouldn't hire him. The bartenders who are always being sought by saloon keepers are the ones who never drink the stuff they sell. Business and a stomach that can be tapped and high wines drawn from it do not go together, even in a city. A businessman who has a clerk that drinks too much has a list in his pocket of a dozen young men and women who can take that clerk's place at a moment's notice, and the business will go right along, jagless and joyous. The girl that takes the place of a man who drinks keeps looking better all the time, and if she entered the store with a pale, thin face, she develops dimples and smiles each day, and customers and clerks alike fall in love with her, while the man who drinks too much keeps getting more frowsy and musty and moth-eaten. The Old Kicker Kicks What beats me, said the man with the spectacles, with a slit in the center of the glass, made to read through the bottom piece, or look at the scenery through the top, as he looked up from his paper on a suburban train and addressed a man with a sunburned nose and hands brown and hairy, is how those Filipinos can be licked every day and scattered to the four winds, and then come up smiling the next day to be whipped again. You would naturally think they would know when they are whipped, 
and would sue for peace. And he looked out the car window at a farmer leading a bull with a ring in its nose to water. They remind me of a boy I used to sit with in school, said the man with a sunburned nose. He had to be whipped every day or he couldn't learn anything. The rest of us were contented with a whipping once in a week or ten days. But this fellow got it every day and his father whipped him when he got home at night. Some people are built that way. But how these Filipinos have time to collect food enough to fight on beats me when they are chased around so and kept on the jump. Well, said the old kicker, who was sitting opposite these two citizens smoking a manila cigar that smelled like a burning brush pile and caused the conductor to turn pale while punching a ride out of the commutation ticket. Let me tell you something about these little people who fight day and night and laugh when they are dying. They don't need food as we look at food. Our great big soldiers have to have embalmed beef and beans and salt meat and coffee and bread and all that, and they can't carry food enough to last them more than a day or two. But these little Filipinos can live a week on a piece of sugar cane just chewing the pulp. They can sleep leaning against a fence and can go through a swamp on all fours like an alligator and get out and shake themselves like a dog and are ready for business. I tell you that is an awful enemy to handle. Why, sometimes for three days you don't hear anything about them. That is the time they are drunk on some kind of liquor they make out of rice and that such stuff. It is deadly, and after drinking a few swallows of it they are dead to the world for two or three days, and they don't eat. Then, when they come out of the drunk, they can't eat anything for three days. So there are six days' food saved to the commissary. Then they find a rotten banana and eat it and brace up and take a stick of sugar cane and a handful of rice. The jag they have had makes them spoil for a fight. The bugle sounds, and away they go for a fight for your life. And the old kicker settled back in his seat and looked out the window at a farmer with a wagon load of milk on the way to a creamery. But don't you think when Otis gets the new regiments that are on the way that he can wind up the war before Congress meets in December? Asked the man with the split glasses, glancing through the lower part of them at a heading in the morning paper. Well, that will depend, said the old kicker, as he picked up the lemon drop the news agent had dropped in the seat as a sample. They can't go to fighting as soon as they get there, no more than you could use green lumber in making furniture. It will take three-fourths of the new soldiers at least one season to get acclimated, and they ought to lay around there breathing the malaria and eating quinine for at least six months. In fact, they ought to have been there last fall. If Otis sends these boys that are being rounded up in the States, these slick, fat, rosy-cheeked fellows, out to the firing line at once when they get there, they will raise the deuce with the Filipinos the first few days, and they will march in the sun, wade swamps and swim rivers, and bury niggers and burn towns, and the enemy will scatter and disappear, and the dispatches will say, Lawton has whipped them, and this general and that general has wiped them off the face of the earth, and Otis will order a celebration and a peace jubilee, and just as Congress is about to pass resolutions of thanks to the brave generals, the new recruits will be filling hospitals. And the first thing you know, Mr. Filipino will show up with his sugarcane commissary outfit, and he will say, You can't lose me, Sevy, and he will begin to shoot right where he left off and burn your hospitals and raise merry Hades. But the dispatches will only say, the enemy shows some activity, but the transports that come back will be loaded with cripples on crutches, and there will not be a rosy cheek in all Luzon. And the old kicker got up to stretch his legs as the train was getting pretty near to town. Cheerful idiot, isn't he? said the man with the skin peeling off his nose. Well, I wouldn't pick him out for a successful recruiting officer, said the man with the split glasses, but honestly, 
Don't you think we will conquer those insignificant people before the next election? In the dispatches, yes. In Luzon, Nixie, you might as well try to exterminate rats. You can catch some rats, but the majority keep on doing business, as they have since Noah got up the animal excursion. Well, here we are, and the passengers got off to resume the conduct of the war on their trip out in the afternoon. THE VACATION SEASON This is the season when the businessman sits in his office and okays the applications of clerks for vacations, and watches the things they take with them on their trips, and he comments on the changes that have come since he was the boy. He sees a clerk go out of the door with a smile and a split bamboo rod, a reel of the latest device, and a flask that will hold a pint, and he smiles at the outfit. Another goes off with a breech-loading gun, cartridges loaded to the queen's taste, new hunting clothes of yellow canvas that would scare a duck off the marsh, shoes of yellow leather that lace up so far it will take him half a day to lace them up and the other half day to unlace them, and he smiles at that outfit. Another clerk has a canvas canoe that he carries in a bag that can be put together when he gets to the lake he is going to visit, and which will rear up and tip over and dump him in the drink the first time it is wet. Another clerk has a lawn tennis racket and knee breeches, and another has golf sticks and plaid stockings with a scotch cap that would frighten the natives. A girl clerk bids him goodbye with a pale smile under the wide white hat with a feather, and he knows the smile she will bring back to him will be sunburned and sweeter. And when they are all gone, he sits at his desk and thinks of his boyhood days, and wonders if the boys will have any more fun on their vacation than he did as a boy, when every summer was a vacation. He wonders if his clerk with a split bamboo rod and the canvas boat will have as much fun catching muscalange as he used to have when a boy sitting on the bank of a sluggish stream catching bullheads with a piece of liver for bait, when every bullhead swallowed the bait clear down to his tail and had to be cut open with a butcher knife to get the hook. He can see himself in the dark night, throwing the bullheads over his head into the dusty road and later stepping on one of them with his bare foot and getting a horn run into that foot that caused him to walk on his toes for a month. He wonders if the bullheads lay in the dust hours at a time nowadays and continue to live just to get a chance to run a horn in a boy's foot. He hears bullheads have gone out of style and is sorry he didn't tell the clerk to bring him a nice mess of bullheads so he could go out into the kitchen of his palatial home and tell the cook how to roll them in cornmeal and fry them in salt pork fat. He thinks, as he sits there, of the old scow his father made for him and caught with rags, with tar on the cracks, and put it in the mill pond, and how he sailed away barefooted with one suspender of bed-ticking holding up trousers not very strong, and how he went out into the world with a shirt for a sail more than twenty rods before the boat filled with water and he had to paddle it back to shore with his bare feet for a screw propeller. He remembers getting some oakum and a chisel and sitting up half the night to drive it into the cracks and how proud he was when it was dry all the next day and he filled one end of it with perch and sunfish. He has owned yachts and steamboats since but he never has had so much fun as he did that day with the scow his father made, and while he has since that time caught fish in all waters, salmon, tarpon, and muscalunge, he has never felt so good as he did when catching bullheads, sunfish, and perch in the old mill pond at home. He wonders if that clerk who went off with a gun knows how to surround a squirrel on a limb of a tall tree and regrets that he did not give the clerk a few pointers about squirrels, as he remembers how tight they will lay to the top of a limb when you are trying to get a shot at them, and look over at you with one eye not bigger than the head of a black pin, with not a hair showing over the limb. He wishes he had told the clerk to take off his coat and hang it on a bush, 
and then sneak around the tree and shoot the squirrel on the other side while he is watching the coat. But he thinks maybe the clerk is not a squirrel hunter, and he gives up the idea of helping him. And then the old businessman looks at his watch, and he finds it is time to go home, and he gets up with a pain in his back and wonders if his time will ever come again to take a vacation. End of section 17 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 18 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Surgical Operations in Public A traveling doctor who makes a specialty of affections of the eye, gave an entertainment to the good people who were invited to his soiree that was an innovation for a certainty. He issued invitations to friends and acquaintances to view an operation which he performed to straighten a pair of cross eyes. There is a technical name for the disease, but it was plain cross eyes. The patient was a young lady, and the place where the operation was performed was the parlor of the hotel, and the audience which attended the entertainment was composed of newspaper reporters and others. The reports give a full description of the operation, describe the girl and how she stood it, the nervousness of the spectators, and the coolness of the doctor, who handled his instruments with delicacy, drew little blood, and in a few minutes the girl got up from the operating table, with her eyes as straight as a gun barrel, and tickled to death to feel that she could look square at anybody, and not around a corner. This is all right as an advertisement for the eye doctor, and shows that there are new things under the sun. But will it not be apt to stimulate other doctors to want to show off in public, and give exhibitions of their skill? If this thing is going to be catching, we shall find doctors advertising public exhibitions of amputations and all other operations, the same as a show. People are getting so they like to attend shows that have blood in them. Those who visit theaters that serve up Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or who love the plays where so many actors are killed that the play has to be finished by the stage hands would hail a surgical operation as a form of amusement that they could hie to. All things are changing, and the time may come when doctors will advertise an operation such as the removal of a tumor at the markdown price of ten, twenty, and thirty, while an operation for the removal of man's liver would come higher. The amputation of a leg ought to appeal to all who love tragedy, well, the cutting off of a finger or two, without administering chloroform, would give the audience an exhibition of nerve that they do not often see on the stage. The time may come when the operating room of the hospital will be fitted up with proscenium boxes, and people will dress for an important operation, as they do now for an opera, and after it is over, all go to a late supper at the café, and talk over the interesting points of the entertainment. These performances will be more interesting and less bloody than prize fights, and those who watch the knocked out prize fighter gradually regain consciousness or die inside the ropes will see much to enjoy in the appearance of the patient under the influence of an anesthetic, as the brave doctors are carving him from Genesis to Revelation in search of something they do not know the name of in places they have never visited before. The time may come, in the advancement of surgical skill, when a person about to be operated on for appendicitis will issue invitations to friends and neighbors to visit the hospital at a certain hour and witness what, to the patient, is the most interesting period of his life, and the guests may make bets of cigars and gloves whether the doctors will find it or not or, if they do find it, whether the patient will recover. There is a chance for spectacular effect in these possibilities, and if it becomes fashionable to have audiences to witness the performances of doctors, it will be found that they will pose as actors 
and watch the audience when not actually engaged in carving the patients. Let the good work go on. Terrible Encounter, Single-Handed, Against a Biscuit There is no man in this country who has done more to help the men who invent new kinds of food than I have. Let a firm advertise a new breakfast food, or a new kind of biscuit, or condensed soup, or tinned beans, or pancake flour, or flaked anything, and I never let the family have any peace until they have got a sample and fed it to me. I anticipate much pleasure when I know the new food is in the house at night and is to be tried on me at breakfast the next morning, and sometimes I wake up in the night and get to thinking about it and am unable to sleep, and then I get up and wake everybody about daylight and get them going on the new dish. After I have eaten it, usually I kick, and send for the can to read the directions, and put the cook on the witness stand under the discovery statute to see if she has carried out the instructions, and then tell how I would cook it. Oh, but my stomach has had a hard time trying to keep up with these inventors of new combinations in food. I got some soup tablets once, at the exposition, from a charming girl, who told me just how to prepare them and I was going to give everybody a treat, but when I got the tablets, which were made of gutta percha and printer's roller composition, whittled down so they would dissolve, and seasoned the stuff, nobody would eat it, and I had to. That night my stomach had such a time that I had to get up and take some brandy, and I rolled around all night trying to get my stomach in a place where it would lie quiet. The next morning I gave the balance of the soup tablets to a dog, and to this day the owner of the dog accuses me of trying to poison his pet. I have tried everything advertised, from tinned Mexican tamales to dog biscuit, but the worst time I ever had with a new food was in St. Louis. I arrived one evening at the terminal station, direct from a Chautauqua at Excelsior Springs, Missouri where the minister in charge of the pious exercises had bilked me out of a hundred dollars, and having half an hour for luncheon, I went into the restaurant to find something under the fifteen-cent list that I could fill up on. The first thing that struck my eye was shredded wheat biscuit with milk, fifteen cents. I bit like a bass. For quite a while I had been reading of shredded wheat biscuit and had tried to introduce it into the family at home, but had been vetoed after the soup tablet episode. So I decided to revel in shredded biscuit and milk, and have the laugh on the folks at home. I had never seen a shredded wheat biscuit, but when the girl brought it, and the bowl of milk, I tried to act as though I had been brought up on that kind of food, but I was glad when the girl laid a check down on the table and went away to wait on somebody else so I could look over the biscuit alone. It was about as big as a fifty-cent sponge, and looked as though it might be a baked bird's nest, or a handful of Excelsior mattress stuff that a man had used to wipe his hands on and wad it up and thrown in the oven. But it was up to me to eat it, and I tried to pull off some of the strands that seemed to have been braided like a whiplash. The strands stretched out, but would not come off and when I let go they flew back, and the shredded biscuit escaped from my hands and fell on the marble floor, but it bounded up about two feet, and I caught it in both hands. I squeezed it, and it felt like a pincushion made of porcupine quills, and reminded me some of a cud such as cows chew. For some time I studied the shredded biscuit, and finally thought of the milk, and decided to drown it. So I put it in the bowl, and held it down with a spoon, until I was sure life must have been extinct, when I released the biscuit, and it raised up, and filled the bowl, and had soaked up all the milk, and it seemed to look at me like a section of baled hay, as much as to say, you can't lose me. It was apparent that I was short on milk, but long on biscuit. But I took a spoon and a fork, and tried to pry off enough of the damp thing, to see how it tasted, but it rolled itself up, like one of those round fish you see stuffed in the stores, with spikes on, and I couldn't get any of it off. 
It began to look like bunches of weeds you see floating in the lakes in the spring, when the ice goes out, and I couldn't help thinking how that biscuit could be used as a duck blind, if one was short on hay and willows. But my time was limited, and it was necessary to eat before taking my train, so I decided to twist one end of the shredded biscuit and milk it, and get my milk back anyway, and drink it. But the confounded thing would not give down, but held up its milk the worst way. Then I decided to wring it out, and took it in both hands and wrung it, but I couldn't get any milk. So I rolled it up in a napkin and put it in my pocket, and ordered coffee and sinkers, and went to my train. My idea in carrying the shredded biscuit away was that I wanted the girl to think I had eaten it all right, and another idea was to study it at my leisure. I looked it over some during the evening on the car, and finally, just as I was going to throw the shredded biscuit out the window, a bridal couple got on the car and were shown the berth opposite mine, and they went right to bed. I do not know what prompted me to do so, no doubt one of those waves of wickedness that comes, at times, over the best of us, but it suddenly occurred to me to wait until all were asleep in the car, and then throw that shredded biscuit into the berth with that young couple, and I opened the curtain about four inches, dropped it in, and heard it fall with a dull thud amongst that wedding, and then I went to sleep like a wicked thing. I shall never do such a thing again. No man who commits such a crime should escape just punishment. Along about an hour after daylight the next morning, I heard a squirming in the berth opposite, as of two people trying to dress who never dressed in each other's presence before. They had their window shade drawn down, so it was quite dark, and I heard the young man whisper to the young woman and say, This must be something of yours, dear. Then there was a moment of silence, as though she had taken it in her hand and dropped it with a little shudder, and she said, It is nothing of mine. It must belong to you. Then I could hear the first quarrel in that family. He sang, It's yours, and she sang, It ain't, etc., until finally I heard a satchel snap, and then his stocking feet protruded from the berth, followed later by himself, half-dressed, and he went to the washroom and by and by she came out with a handkerchief over her head, and a wrapper on, and a bundle of clothes, and she went to the ladies' toilet room. The porter made up the berth, and when they both came back to the seat, they looked mad. Soon we came to a junction where we all got off to wait a couple of hours for the Louisville train and get breakfast. The porter picked up the shredded biscuit in the seat, which was dry now, and flattened out some, and asked the man if it was his and he said it was not, and she said it was not hers. They went out first, and I took the shredded biscuit from the porter and put it in my pocket. At breakfast in the Junction Hotel the young couple did not talk to each other much, and in the parlor car all the way to Louisville they did not act like lovers, and when they went to their room in the gatehouse in the evening they acted like old married people, cross and disagreeable. When a man begins a life of crime, he seldom reforms. When I found that their room was in the same hall with mine, and I knew they were down to supper, the devil took possession of me, and I walked by their room, and threw the shredded biscuit over the transom, and heard it drop on the bed, and when they returned to their room I made it a point to pass their room. They went in, and in about two minutes I heard a scream, heard a woman in a falsetto voice say, Look, look, there it is again. Oh, it is a hoodoo. Then I went down to the office of the hotel, like a wicked thing, and talked with the clerk. Pretty soon he went to the telephone that connects with the rooms, and I heard him say, Yes, yes, certainly, right away. And then he yelled, Front! And when a bellboy came, he handed him a card and said, Go to the bar and get a bottle of bromo seltzer and take it to room 201. In the morning I took breakfast at the same table with a young married couple, and when I looked over the bill of fare and ordered shredded wheat biscuit with cream, she blushed, he began to perspire around the neck, 
and I thought they would sink through the floor as they looked at each other in painful silence. But I never turned a hair and looked as innocent as possible. Over a year has passed, and I presume they have learned to tell a shredded biscuit now when they see one. End of section 18. Recording by Melora. Section 19 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How the Fireman Fell Over a Cow The city of Prairie de Chaine has a common council that is causing a good deal of talk all over the country, and if they are not careful, they will make the city as notorious as Oshkosh, which is known the world over as the place where you can have fun with the boys as well as the girls. Prairie de Chaine has, by vote of its common council, decided that curfew shall ring every night at nine o'clock, at which time boys have got to be in the house, or the policeman will know the reason why. The council is no doubt composed of bachelors who do not know what fun there is in being out after nine o'clock. The son does not desire to mix up in a fight between a common council and the boys, but when dark does not come till nearly ten o'clock, it does seem as though they might ring that bell an hour later and give the boys a chance. There are so many games that you can't play half so well in daylight, games that you have to slip off into the darkest place to be found to enjoy, that it would seem as though the city fathers if they ever played these games, would not be so cruel. But to add insult to injury, the same council, the same evening, refused to pass a law to restrain cows from running at large, so the cows may ring the cowbell curfew, and the boys will have to go in with spirits and commandments broken, and cows may do as they please. All cities have had to contend with a cow ordinance, and it takes years to get sense and shut up cows nights, because there is politics in letting the poor man's cow stay out and make herself a nuisance. Boston used to allow cows a pass in the streets, and New York was a free-for-all for cows until she got a quarter of a million people. The Philadelphia cows run at large if they are blue-blooded and belong to the old families, La Crosse, the second city in Wisconsin, was broken of the cow habit in a peculiar manner. Years ago La Crosse allowed cows to go where they listeth, and being a sandy city, like Prairie de Chaine, the cows slept in the sand in the middle of the road. They were regular middle-of-the-roaders. At that time the fire department was volunteer, and the young citizens turned out when the fire bell rang at midnight, grabbed their red shirts, and started for the fire on a gallop. Always some firemen ran over a sleeping cow on the way to a fire at night, and after the fire was over there would be an hour devoted to doctoring the skin shins and swearing at the cows. Petitions were sent to the council to at least compel the cows to all sleep in one street to give the firemen a chance, but it was no use and probably cows would be sleeping in the sandy streets of La Crosse now if it hadn't been for the fire at Zeisler's Brewery one hot night in August. When the bell rung, young Mr. Cook, a society leader who was a member of Rescue Hose Company, grabbed his trousers in one hand and his red shirt in the other, rushed out the door, giving a whoop to wake up another fireman living near, and started down the middle of the street, the eastern sky was red with flame, and from the smell of burning hops and malt, it was certain to be an interesting fire, both before and after. Mr. Cook's idea was to run until out of breath, and then stop and put on his trousers, make another run of a few blocks, and stop and put on his shirt, and by that time he would have his second wind, and he could easily make the brewery by the time they began to roll out the beer. He had made about one block when he ran over something that seemed to be an elephant, and he fell head first into the sand and plowed a furrow with his nose, and as he was getting up, 
a cow with the bell on raised up and bellowed and started for the red flannel shirt that he held aloft mr cook dodged like a spaniard but the cow got his shirt on one horn and his trousers on the other and went off bellowing toward the fire mr cook thought he could overtake the cow and get his clothing and he ran after her as they neared the fire it became lighter and he found the cow could never be caught and still he could not miss a fire in a brewery which was at that time the most popular kind of a fire the whole city turned out when zeisler gave a fire at his brewery when mr cook got within a block of the fire there were ten thousand people present and it was light as day and he felt then and does to this day that an abbreviated balbriggan undershirt was not what might be considered an up-to-date fireman's uniform but he took his place at the hose reel and finally got the nozzle inside the building amid the cheers of an admiring multitude and the boys worked as men never worked before when the fire was out and the good beer began to flow it was noticed that mr cook's shirt had shrunk from the steam or the burned beer or the hops until it was around his neck like an ascot tie and a slicker was loaned to him to wear out into the cold world and help reel up the hose and he made a fair appearance in society at daylight that morning though the buttons were not all intact on the slicker the next day the owner of the cow found her out in the country patiently grazing with the shirt and trousers on her horn and he returned the clothing to the owner and when the hose company appealed to the council with an ultimatum plenty cows no firemen no cows plenty firemen the cows were shut up by ordinance until prairie de chaine has had some prominent citizen fall over a damp steaming cow on a foggy night the town will never outgrow the cow habit learning an easy trade a boy writer from a country town in the interior of the state asks some advice as to what is the best trade to learn an extract from his letter is as follows i have had to quit school in order to earn something to help support our family as my father is not very well and does not earn enough to live on i have tried three different places but they put me at the hardest most menial work and i have been accustomed to doing the easy work around the house and it hurts me to have to do dirty work what would you suggest for a boy to do who wants to earn money but wants to dress well and go in good company well boy you have got a good deal to learn there is nothing that would be better for you than to get a place in a milliner's shop where you could wear a shirt waist and ribbons in your hair and go to picnics if you are going to learn a trade you have got to begin at the bottom and do the dirty work you cannot go to work in a bank and sit in the president's office and cut off coupons the first week but you will have to sweep out the bank and pick up the cigar stubs the clerk sleeve and work up from the cuspidor to the bank vault and all this will take time you seem the kind of a boy who if you took a position in a grocery store would want to put up nothing but granulated sugar and raisins and candy and trade with pretty girls but you would have to shag firkins of butter around and knock the top off and dig into the butter with a wooden spud and get out some for a customer and probably get frowy butter on your sleeves and you would have to dig pickles out of a sour barrel and get vinegar on you and if any customer asked for molasses you would want the proprietor to go and draw it for the customer but you would have to do it and be mighty careful and get the dead flies out of the quart measure before you opened up or you might lose a good customer for the old man if you thought you were going to have an easy time in the grocery you would make the mistake of your life for you would have to roll barrels of sugar in the basement and cut cheese and sort out rotten cabbage and sprout potatoes in the cellar and grind coffee you act as though if you went to work in a livery stable you would want to sit in the office or drive for the crowned heads but you would have to clean off horses and wash and grease buggies and maybe drive the hearse to cheap funerals you could not drive the omnibus the first day and that is the ambition of all boys 
If you went to work in a meat market, you would want to do nothing but weigh out sirloin steaks that the boss had cut off, and you would probably handle them with gloves or a fork, but you would find that you would have to turn the sausage machine and try out the scraps and make yourself useful and greasy. If you were in a meat market and a poor woman came in to buy a pound of pork, you would take the first piece on top of the brine and insist that she should take it. But she would insist that you roll up your sleeve and dig away down to the bottom of the barrel of brine, into the rock salt on the bottom, to find the piece she wanted. And if you had a raw place on your hand, it would smart so you would want to be mustered out of the meat market and draw a pension. Oh, you will never find an easy place to work, where you can keep well dressed and clean until you learn your trade. Many boys see the typesetters in a country printing office sitting on stools doing nice clean work, and they want to learn the printing trade right off. The first day they put you to distributing pie, and you think you have struck a snap, but the next day you get the second degree and have to wash the rollers and wash the forms, carry dirty water down three flights of stairs, and carry clean water up, and you do the rolling, and when you are ready to go home the second night, there is ink on your white shirt and all over your face clean up to your hair, and when you get home, your mother will not own you. You want to quit the printing business right off. You supposed it was all setting type and editing the paper, but you find you have got an apprenticeship of years of dirty work before you, and to be a success you have got to enjoy it and forget that sometime another boy will take the ink degree and you will be advanced. If you have it in you and take the various degrees in the employment you seek, you will some day become the grand master and you can have your hands clean. The son's advice to you, boy, would be to pick out some trade that you think you are fitted for Put on some old clothes and tell them you want to begin right at the bottom and learn it clear to the top, and then don't you ever miss a note or shirk anything, and when you graduate you are in position to teach others. You might as well expect to go to college and be a senior all the time as to expect to learn a trade by beginning at the top and working down. The college boy has to be thing one the first year for everybody above him to have fun with, and if he gets mad and backs out, he never learns anything, but if he takes his medicine with a smile and says that it is good, by and by he is on the roof looking down at the new things, or at fixing the furnace and sawing wood. There is no trade you can learn that will let you remain at the top and clean and make you easy, except that of inheriting a fortune. But that trade is already overrun, and there are few openings. Learn something and learn it well, and when you are at the head of the business with some gray in your hair, you can enjoy thinking of the days you were dirty and disgusted. A Bear with a Jag Chicago is having trouble with a bear at the Lincoln Park Zoo, which gets drunk whenever it has a chance and becomes a terror. The bear is a sort of cinnamon-colored Russian bear, which was bought from a man who used to go around the country making the bear dance for the rustics. The man who owned the bear was a drunkard, and one time he gave the bear some whiskey just for fun, and the bear was quite funny with its newly acquired jag until the Italian tried to boss him around, when the animal everlastingly wore out the ground with him, chewed off some fingers, and nearly disemboweled the man and then climbed a telegraph pole and would not come down. The man got cured of the bear habit and sold him, just as he was, on the pole to the park commissioners, and they have been having a terrible time with the animal ever since. It got noised around that the new bear was addicted to drink, and everybody that visited the park wanted to see him. Wicked people would smuggle a flask of whiskey to the bear when the keepers were not looking, he would drink the stuff, and then there was a riot. It got so men, who were familiar with the effects of whiskey on human beings, would visit the park, temperance workers, and worldly drinkers, and the cage of the Russian bear was the most popular place in the park. The other day a party of scientists from downtown were looking at Bruin when a man who should have been lynched 
gave the bear a quart bottle of Jersey Applejack, a drink that will drive a man to murder and suicide. The bear didn't like it, at first, as he stuck up his nose and shivered all over when the cork was removed, and he took a swallow. But after looking at the crowd to see if anything better was coming, and not seeing another flask, he drank the Applejack. He stood and meditated for a moment and seemed to feel the thrill of life along his keel. And then, as the fiery liquid got down among his vitals, he suddenly yelled, Whoop! as near as a bear could speak English, jumped into the air, cracking his claws together, and came down on his head and rolled over and laughed as near as a bear can laugh. The keeper came along and found that some fiend had loaded the bear, and he was mad. He spoke to the bear, but the animal staggered to the front of the cage and howled a dismal howl as to the song of an inebriate who sings in a cracked and weeping voice, We won't go home until morning. The keeper thought it would be best to let the bear out with the other bears, which he did, and that was where the trouble began. The bear with the applejack jag went up to a female grizzly and began to act familiar, when the husband of the bear lady gave him a cuff that sent him across the bear pit, rolling over, and he stopped and backed up against a tree and seemed to say, Tell them to come on. A small black bear was up in the tree, and he came down and clawed the Russian bear, and they mixed up and snarled till the black bear couldn't stand the applejack breath, and he got behind a polar bear, who bristled up to the jag bear as much as to say, Maybe you are out on a voyage of discovery. If so, I am the North Pole. The Russian evidently didn't want to fight a white flag of truce, so he went to a tank and tried to drink it all dry, to put out the Applejack fire, after which he got mad and started in to clean out the place, when all the bears jumped on him and chewed him until he was almost sober. The keeper got into the pit with a handspike and drove the bears to their corners. When the bear with the jag got a towel, wet it in the tank, and bound it around his head, and looked as though he wanted to say, Oh, what a night! He was put back in his cage, and those who had watched the progress of the jag said they never saw anything more natural in all their experience. The bear did nothing but drink water the next day and snarl, and acted so near like a man who has been drinking applejack that it was touching to see. There is talk of sending the bear to Dwight. End of section 19. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Section 20 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 20. The Terrible Root Beer Jag. The trouble with the temperance advocates is that they are not willing to let well enough alone. They have got demons enough to fight, including rum, gin, brandy, whiskey, and all of the combinations that can be made by bartenders with these things for a basis. Then they can attack wine and beer, and it would seem as though they could have their hands full without seeking new worlds to conquer. For more years than most men have lived, the truly good temperance people have walked on the necks of the demon of strong drink, until it has got so that many believe the demon actually enjoys it, for he keeps on doing business at the old stand, and opens new stands if the brewers will pay the license, while the temperance people go on thriving as well as the demon does. But they do not seem content with the enemy they have, and are constantly looking for a new one. Mrs. Bullock, of Evanston, a member of the WCTU, has started a crusade against root beer, claiming that it contains alcohol, and that Evanston is in danger of a drunkard's grave from drinking root beer to excess. The sun has always made it a point to protect the innocent against the strong, and, considering root beer, about as innocent as anything of a fluid nature, that boiling beverage of the children and the aged must be protected. 
Why, good woman, you might drink root beer until you would have to wear a choker collar to keep your back teeth from floating out of your sweet mouth, and you couldn't get jag enough to strike an attitude. There is alcohol and potatoes, but if one wanted to go off on a bat and be devilish, he wouldn't expect to hold potatoes enough to make him dangerous. Poor root beer! It is a maxim of brave fighters to take some one of your own size. Even prize fighters are seeking to get into a class above them, instead of being promoted backwards to the kindergarten class. And so, the fighters of the rum power should stand up bravely before the strong drink that makes people crazy, and not fight the weak beverage that goes into the stomach, surging like a freshet, goes up the nose like a sedlet's powder, and disappears like the wind from the toy balloon, and only leaves a taste in the mouth as though you had eaten green watermelon, and a feeling below the stomach as though some amateur had tried to tie an innocent intestine into a four-in-hand tie, and drawn the knot up too tight. Don't be afraid of root beer. Nobody will ever drink more than one glass of the brown beverage that boils and bubbles and slops over and does no good. Root beer is big bluff. To see the cork removed from a bottle of root beer and see it struggle to get out and hear it fizz and sputter and see it color the glass like an autumn sunset, you would think it greater than champagne. And the first time you drink it, you can't get it inside of you quick enough. But it is all water and wind and drugs. And, but for the yeast that causes the soap steady appearance, you wouldn't swallow it any quicker than you would so much rinsing water. Did you ever watch the varying expressions on the face of a man of the world who is thirsty and can't get anything but root beer to drink? He is so thirsty. He could almost drink water, but he wants the beer that Milwaukee made famous. It is not the kind of a picnic that everyday beer goes with, and he is dying of thirst, and the managing woman of the picnic tells him root beer is the strongest beverage on the grounds, and with a gasp he says, Bring me a bottle. When it is brought to him, with a cold perspiration on its brow, he grasps the bottle as a drowning man would grasp a straw stack. He gets the cork out with a pair of shears, the only thing hard at the picnic except the boiled eggs, and sees the precious stuff boil over outside the bottle before he can get a glass to catch it. He catches a glass half full, and his shirt and trousers get the rest, and finally, with a smile, he puts the glass to his face, and as he drinks there is an angelic expression comes over him, as though he would say, The nectar of the gods. That is, before he has had a chance to breathe. The beauty of root beer is that as long as you hold your breath, it fills the bill. But when you have swallowed it and gulped and had it go up your nose, you want to take an axe and go and find the man who prescribed it for you. After the first swallow, the man of the world begins to look as you can imagine a man looks who has paid the market price for a gold brick. He tries to think he has quenched his thirst, but there is a look about his face as though he would give anything if he had not been thirsty, and he looks around for something to take the taste out of his mouth. He drinks water, but that seems to make it worse, and all the day long he thinks that about day after tomorrow his appetite will come back to him, and his taste will reappear. About four o'clock p.m., the man who drank the root beer feels a pain down amongst himself, in his midst, not bigger than a man's hand at first, but gradually it enlarges, until he begins to wonder what the doctors charge for cutting into a man and removing a vermiform appendix, or any kind of hardware he may find in there, and he wants to lay down on his stomach under a tree and let bugs crawl up his trousers. Before it is time to pack the dishes in the baskets and take the trolley car for home, the worst is over, and a weak man, instead of a strong one, goes loaded and listless back to the place of embarking, 
with a look on his face that bodes no good to the next person that asks him to drink root beer. He doesn't know what kind of roots it is they make the beer of, but nothing with any kind of a root in it ever goes in his stomach again, if he knows it. Do not worry, good woman, about root beer causing drunkenness. Give it freely to all, and it will be its own cure. While other drinks may create an appetite for more, root beer creates an appetite for swearing off, and it will never get a second shot at a man who is caught once. A man with a root beer jag would not walk down the street with his hat on the side of his head, looking for trouble. He would have his hand on a vital part, and with all the trouble he could handle, he would be looking for a doctor's shingle. Queer Case in New York How a Divorced Man Takes Care of His Former Wife and Makes Things Pleasant A gentleman from the West visited New York recently, who had not been there for many years, and in looking up old acquaintances, he found in one of the hotels an old friend who seemed to be taking things very easy. When the Western man first knew the New Yorker, he was poor but jolly, with a wife he loved and a good position, the salary of which kept him well enough. He had been a guest at the friend's home and knew the wife well. The New York man had become rich in speculations and was living at a hotel, alone, trying to spend his money. A dozen years before, the wife had secured a divorce with alimony before the husband had got rich. He had had trouble to pay the alimony, and the wife had married again, and the alimony had ceased by law. The divorce had been secured on the ground of incompatibility of temper, and so forth. When the western man found his old friend, they had dinner together, a bottle of wine, and finally the visitor, who was dying to know about the man's wife, said, "'Excuse me, Jim, if I speak of something that may be painful to you, but I swear I do not desire to intrude upon your private affairs. Tell me, what has become of Mary?' "'Oh, my wife,' said Jim, as he poured out a fresh glass of wine. "'My wife married a bow-legged floor-walker in a department store, and they are living in a flat in Harlem.' poor girl she has been sick a heap and i have worried about her all the time since she left worried about her said the visitor with eyes wide open i thought when people were divorced that settled it and they went out of one's mind do you mean to tell me you ever see her see her why of course if i hadn't seen her since she left me i guess we would both have been dead why, George, I have doubled her alimony since she married that shrimp, and I keep her measure for dresses and underwear, and when I get lonesome and feel as though the world was all a farce, I go around to the stores and buy Mary a lot of stuff and send it up to their flat. Well, I'll be blessed, said the western man, but that beats me. They don't do it that way in Chicago. But how does her present husband take it? Doesn't it make him jealous? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I think he is a little sensitive about it, but if he seems to be getting mad any time, I take him across my knee, or get some tickets to the theater and take them out, and send them home in my carriage, full of a good supper. You see, I can't get it out of my head that she is still my wife, the poor thing, and I look after her. He resents that, though, particularly if I ask him before anybody about any of Mary's diseases. I went into the store, where he floor walks, the other day, and gave him a bottle of spring medicine, and asked him if Mary's hives had broke out yet. You see, the hives used to break out on Mary's legs regularly, the first day of March, and she was a sight, and suffered terribly. About the 20th of February, I begin to worry about Mary's hives, and I stand it as long as I can, and then go and get the medicine. Say, you ought to have seen how mad he was when I asked about the hives on my wife's legs, there in the store. But I told him if he didn't shut up and take that medicine home and make Mary take it, 
I would have him fired out of the store. And he took it, and today I got a note from my wife that she was much better and was able to go to the opera, and I am going to get some tickets for tonight. Well, you're a wonder, said the western man. Do you think Mary still loves you? Sure, said the ex-husband. How can she help it? She got her divorce because she was hot under the collar, and I laughed at her. Then she married this little autocrat of cash girls, because she seemed to need a home. I wasn't rich then, and she couldn't live high on the alimony. But when she married, and my lawyer told me I needn't send her any more money, I had a friend go and look them over, in their flat. And when he told me how forlorn it was, I paid the back alimony that had accumulated during their honeymoon, and doubled it and have been sending it ever since. At first her assistant husband, the bow-legged shrimp, kicked and said he would get out an injunction against me to prevent my insulting him by paying alimony. But he was taken with typhoid fever and was sick three months, and she broke down from the strain, and I sent my doctor and a trained nurse for him and one for her, and had all the bills sent to me, and since then he has not peeped. I suppose I take a malicious pleasure in making him mad, sometimes, but I have to have some fun out of the affair. One day he and I were lunching together, and I asked him, before a table full of strangers, if our wife ever had that corn removed from the third toe of her left foot, and added that, when I was living with her, that corn made her more trouble than anything. Say, he was as mad as a hornet. You know how confounded mad one of these little fellows with a big wife can get? I guess, if it hadn't been the last day of the month, and my check was due the next day, he would have strangled me. Sometimes, when we are all three at the theater, and Mary, the great big beauty, is on one side of me, her eyes sparkling with pleasure, and her small second husband on the other side of me, people take him for my younger brother and they seem to think Mary and I are the only two in the box. One night at the opera, Mary had a rather low-necked dress on, and I noticed a great change in her, and I turned to him and said that I noticed that Mary had had that wart she used to have on her shoulder-blade removed, and asked him if he could give me the address of the doctor who removed it, as I had one on my arm that I wanted taken off. He was mad in a minute, and went out of the box, and Mary asked me what was the matter, and I told her, and she said I had, in the years that had passed since we were living together, forgotten the location of the mole, not a wart, and that it was a couple of inches below the dress. Well, when he came back I apologized, and told him I had discovered that the wart was lower down than I had thought, and then he was mad again. I have never seen a man so unreasonable. It was the same way when I told him he and Mary would hitch up together splendidly, as he was about as bow-legged as she was. Dear, dear, but he was mad, and so was she, but it was the truth, because her bow-legs was all that kept her from going on the stage once. Well, this is a queer world, isn't it? And the New Yorker poured out another glass of wine. I should say it was, said the western visitor. Don't you ever feel as though, if he should happen to die, that you and Mary would marry again and live happily? Oh, I don't know, said the first husband. It wouldn't be particularly necessary for him to die. I could tell him to keep away from her, and she could get a divorce on the ground of desertion or something, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. I think I am happier in doing things for her as it is now, because I was never able to do her much good in a financial way when we lived together. But I tell you, when I am sick and she hears of it, and comes down here and takes charge of me and pulls me through, I am tempted to raise the devil in that family when I get well. He is colder than a frog. One day I asked him at lunch if Mary's feet were as cold as they used to be, and how she got them warm. I said he was so cold she certainly could not get them warm by putting them against his frosty back. Well, he wanted to kill me. 
poor girl. She is as warm as any woman in the world, except her feet, and what she needs is a good warm back to put them against. Well, the next day I sent her a hot water bag. The last time I was sick I was threatened with pneumonia, and do you know, Mary heard of it by reading an evening paper. At 9 p.m. she came down to the hotel with her satchel and drove the attendants away, and in five minutes she had my feet soaking in mustard water, a mustard poultice on my chest, such as mother used to make, blankets over me, and I was soon in a perspiration, and she sat there by the bed rubbing my forehead when he came down to see what was the matter. He wanted her to go home and let a nigger take care of me, but she gave him a look that cut a gash in him and said she would never leave me until I was well, and she didn't. She was there two weeks, and nobody ever gave me medicine or food except Mary, and God bless her, I do not know how this thing is going to turn out. I guess I will have to send her to Europe to get her legs straightened and have her voice cultivated, and I will set that shrimp up in business, and when she comes back I will buy a home on the avenue and tell him to keep away from my Mary. And the New Yorker wiped his eyes, and the Western man wiped his, and it was time to retire. End of section 20. Recording by Melora. End of Sunbeams by George W. Peck.